Derita, derita, derita. Stop, stop, stop. Okay, okay. Pop, 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 pop. No le muevas. Hey guys, what's up? This is Stephanie and welcome back to my channel. So in the video today, I'm going to be doing an end of rotation exam review, specifically for your surgery rotation. So hopefully this video is helpful for you guys. For those of you who are new to my channel, welcome. I'm currently a second year PA student. I finished all of my exams for my end of rotation, so I'm done with all of them. I would say that I did very well in all of them except for my first one, my ER, my ER one was my worst one. I didn't know how to study for end of rotation exams. I had just been inside back year and I quickly learned that I needed to change my studying habits. And after that, I was able to do really well on the rest of my end of rotation exams. So I will be reviewing basically high yield stuff in this video, remembering questions that were asked, whether it was on the EOR that I took or whether it was on question banks that I took or practice questions that I had, and just information that I kept seeing over and over again. Also be providing you guys with some clinical pearls in clinic and how to succeed in clinic also. So hopefully this video is helpful for you guys. The reason why I'm making this is that I know when I started studying for the EORs, I didn't know how to study for them. I try to look on YouTube, whether there was any YouTube videos that were specific for a review for certain rotations or wasn't any. So this is why I'm doing this. Hopefully this will help you guys out. For those of you who are about to start clinical rotations or are currently in your clinical rotation, hopefully this video can help you guys out, whether you're listening to them while you're running, while you're driving, um, while you're cleaning, which is what I used to do, or when you're cooking. So hopefully this video is helpful. Okay guys, so let's get into it. Today I'm going to be reviewing your surgery EOR. So surgery from my classmates, it was actually one of the feared ones exams. It was definitely a feared one for me, especially after the disaster I had for my ER rotation. ER, EOR, since I, I did horrible in that one, I was really scared for this one, so I made sure I studied a lot for it. I know sometimes it's really hard to study specifically for your surgery rotation, for me, I was in clinic sometimes on certain days from 6 a.m. to 12 a.m. So I was, I didn't have time in, to study. And the days that I did get up early, like at 6 or 7, I would come home and I would just sleep because I was so exhausted and I wanted to catch up on sleep from the previous day. And then usually in surgery, you're standing most of the time. And if you're like myself, you're like sweating in clinic or sweating during the surgery because you feel like you're going to pass out <laughs> because you have to go to the restroom or you've been standing for so long. Uh, my doctor specialized in mastectomies, and he did a lot of bilateral mastectomies, and those took a while, specifically when it was also with replacement, so you would have the plastic surgeon come in there and also replace them. So those were like four-hour surgeries, and can you imagine standing in there for four hours during the surgery? It was a headache, and I don't know how I made it through. But yes, I made sure that on weekends, which were usually my free days, I studied, and I studied a lot, and it all paid out. So I'll be going over some of the notes I made, uh, like I said, um, also some of the high yield stuff that I remember on my exams or questions that I saw. So let's get into it. Let's start with your gastrointestinal. So let's start with your GI system. So I want to start off by saying that GI is one of my favorite topics. During my didactic year, it was one of the uh, ones that I did better on, one of the systems that I did better on. So I love it, so I feel like this is one of my strong ones. And I have to say that it was definitely one of my strong ones also on the exam. So GI, let's go into esophageal strictures. So what are esophageal strictures? Basically it's a narrowing, whether it's due to thickening, scarring of the esophagus wall. Usually the patient will start with uh, dysphagia, so they'll have trouble swallowing. Solids only though, so this is what's key for this one is that it's only solids only. Um, and it's usually due to chronic inflammation. So there's different types of esophageal structures. You have your Plummer Vinton syndrome, which is basically webs, upper esophageal webs. And this is why they're having trouble swallowing. Symptoms for this is gonna be your dysphagia, um, iron deficiency anemia. You'll have your coelonychia, I always have trouble pronouncing that, which is your spoon-shaped nails, your atrophic oral mucosa, they'll have heartburn. And how do you diagnose this? You diagnose it with an endoscopy, right? You put a tube down and you look and see, make sure that there's not, not a mass growing there or anything like that. Treatment is uh, esophageal balloon dilation and uh, PPI. And you also want to make sure that you correct their nutritional deficiency. So Schatzky rings. Schatzky rings is a distal esophageal web or tissue in the lower 
esophagus. Okay? Sometimes it's accompanied by a sliding uh, hernia, a hiatal hernia. So what is the etiology or the cause for Schatzky rings? It's usually due to ingestion of acids, alkali acids, bleach or detergent, so patients that attempted suicide. So make sure that when you're reading the question, you see that in the stem, whether it was a patient that uh, chugged chloride or anything like that, then it's gonna be a Schatzky ring. So the symptoms that the patients are gonna be is having is that they can be asymptomatic, but sometimes the most common symptom that they'll have is that they'll have intermittent solid food dysphagia and then food impaction also. You're gonna diagnose this also with an endoscopy and the treatment's gonna be also with an esophageal balloon dilation and also a PPI. You can also do an uh, esophagectomy, which is surgery, remove the area if it is uh, if there's necrosis in any area in the esophagus. So now we're gonna go move on to esophageal neoplasms. So this is more common in males than females. I remember that during my didactic year in my anatomy class, we actually had uh, cadavers, and one of our cadavers had, I'm assuming, had passed away from esophageal cancer. Uh, they had a huge mass in their esophagus, and you can see that it was compressing like even their laryngeal nerves and everything. So I can see how that patient was probably having hoarseness whenever, whenever they were talking. So like I said, this is more common in males, uh, ages 50 to 70. The most common causes, you have to make sure that you know this, is smoking and alcohol. So smoking and alcohol are huge causes of esophageal cancer. Also, it's very common in African Americans. It's usually due to uh, mucosal insult sometimes to so esophagus, whether it's ingestion of hot liquids, burns, uh, radiation, reflux, so there's two types. You have your squamous cell and you have your adenocarcinoma. Your squamous cell is more common in African Americans, okay, versus your adenocarcinoma is more common in Caucasians. So make sure that you know that squamous cell is more common in African Americans. And continuing on with squamous cell, it's located in the upper mid esophagus. So make sure that you know the locations also. So upper mid esophagus is going to be your squamous cell. And the most common cause for this is alcohol and tobacco use and also the diet. So if a patient is smoking and drinking in the question stem and it, you kind of know that they, they're having maybe a cancer because they're having trouble swallowing, painful swallowing to both solids and liquids, and the patient's also losing a lot of weight, and you know that they're an alcohol or they smoke, then I would consider squamous cell carcinoma. And also they find a mass that is in the upper two thirds, then it would be um, squamous cell. And then we have your adenocarcinoma. Like I said, this is more common in Caucasians and it's located in the distal one third of the esophagus. And also the most common cause for this one is gonna be GERD. So if a patient has a history of heartburn or a complicated gastritis or complicated uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, I would consider adenocarcinoma. So the most common cause is GERD and Barrett's esophagus. So Barrett's esophagus is a precursor to adenocarcinoma in the esophagus. Also alcohol and tobacco, but it's not as common as squamous cell carcinoma. So what is Barrett's esophagus? So we discussed that Barrett's esophagus is associated with your adenocarcinoma. It's usually a complication of long-standing GERD. So basically you have your stomach acid that is spilling back into the esophagus and it's causing a change in the type of tissue that is in the esophagus. So it's causing columnar metaplasia to squamous epithelium. So it's changing those cells and changing that cell can cause a neoplasm. This is why Barrett's esophagus is very highly related to your adenocarcinoma. And that's why it's really important that patients that have chronic GERD, if they've been having GERD for more than two years, more than five years, you go and you, and you scope them and make sure that there is not a growth there or look for any red flags in a patient that comes in and they have chronic GERD, if they're complaining of weight loss, trouble swallowing, painful swallowing, then that would raise a red flag that maybe there's something else going on. So you wanna make sure that you scope them. Signs and symptoms are dysphagia, trouble swallowing, painful swallowing, weight loss, anorexia, odinophagia, which is a painful swallowing, uh, hematemesis, what is hematemesis? They're throwing up blood, vomiting blood. They have that hoarse voice, like I said, yeah, this is usually due to compression of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And like I said, in my uh, patient during my 
my anatomy rotation during my didactic year, he had a huge uh, neoplasm, a huge mess in his his esophagus, and you could see that it was compressing the nerves that were next to it. So this is why these patients can can be complaining of a hoarse voice if it is uh, compressing against that laryngeal nerve. They can also have chest pain, which is very common symptom in patients that have gastritis or gastroesophageal reflux. So diagnosis, you're gonna start initially with a barium swallow. You're gonna do an x-ray for dysphagia. Uh, you'll sometimes see on the x-ray an apple cord lesion. This is a pathognomonic for esophageal neoplasms, but your definitive diagnosis is gonna be what? You're gonna do an endoscopy with a biopsy, right? You see a mass, you wanna biopsy and make sure that it's nothing bad. You can also do a CT scan for sizing and staging, just to make sure that it hasn't metastasized to any other part of the body, whether it's the chest or the liver. And treatment for this is going to be usually when you do diagnosis, it's really sad, it's usually advanced. So you want to make sure that you do a TMN staging, but usually the treatment is going to be surgery. You're going to do an esoph esophagotomy, so you're going to resect the tumor and the lymph nodes. Uh, that are associated with it, and chemo with radiation also. So chemo with radiation before, and then you can do the surgery. And the prognosis is really poor. This is a really sad cancer. Um, it has a five-year survival rate of 30 to 40%, and if it's expanded to other areas of the body, it's 5%. And it tends to metastasize most commonly to the liver, lungs, and bones. So once again, your esophageal cancers, you have two different types. You have your adenocarcinoma and your squamous cell carcinoma. Make sure that adenocarcinoma is more commonly known to be associated with patients that have chronic GERD, right? As a reflex, it's associated with Barrett's esophagus because you're changing the type of tissue. Make sure that Barrett's esophagus is due to columnar metaplasia to squamous epithelium. So make sure you know that. That's high yield. Your squamous cell, it's going to be more common in African Americans and patients that smoke or drink, and it's in the upper two-thirds of the esophagus. What is your diagnosis? Is first you're going to start with a barium swallow, okay? Because that patient is having trouble swallowing. You want to make sure that there's nothing else in, in there. And then your definitive is going to be an endoscopy with biopsy. So you want to biopsy that mass. Treatment is surgery, uh, usually with uh, chemo or radiation. Okay, guys, so let's go into gastroesophageal reflux disease. I suffer the, from this. I, it's horrible. I hate it. Um, so it's usually that heartburn, right? I have to say, and I'm not going to blame PA school, but after I started PA school is when I started having the symptoms of uh, GERD of that heartburn. So usually it's due to an inappropriate relaxation of the lower esophageal. So you have your esophagus, right? And then you have it connected to your stomach. And usually how one of my doctors described it is that you have like a little door there that just kind of helps the acid from the stomach not go up into the esophagus. And usually with your gastroesophageal reflux disease, as it says, gastroesophageal reflux, that acid is refluxing back into the esophagus. And this is why this, if this is chronic or the patient doesn't get it under control, they can develop Barrett's esophagus, which in turn can lead to cancer. So that's why it's really important that you make sure that you treat this. So prevalence increases with age, Patients will usually complain of cough, which I have to say I do have. I have like this chronic cough. Um, sometimes when I don't take my PPI, so my proton pump inhibitors. And risk factors usually is due to gastric outlet obstruction. You have your hiatal hernias, whether it's a sliding or parasophageal. Uh, make sure that you know that. So one of the risk factors can be a hiatal hernia. So you want to be on, make sure that you're looking out for that if the patient is not getting better with any of the PPIs or the medications that you're giving them. <clears throat> also the diet. Um, that's a huge thing that we usually tell patients is that they have to change their diet uh, whenever they're complaining of GERD. And that's actually the initial treatment for gastroesophageal reflux disease is that they have to avoid caffeine. I feel like I cannot survive without caffeine. I need caffeine for PA school. And also stay away from chocolate. I love chocolate. Stay away from spicy foods, from fatty foods. Um, smoking definitely, alcohol, so all the good things you have to avoid, even tomato. I even read that tomato, you want to stay away from tomato. And I use tomato in everything. I'm Mexican, I love spicy food, and spicy food is like, I, I need to have spice in my food, and it's been really hard to stay away from that.
So what are some of the signs and symptoms? The patient's gonna be complaining of retrosternal pain. So that's another differential diagnosis that you wanna have is a patient that is complaining of chest pain. Just make sure it's not nothing related with your stomach or GERD. The pain is usually gonna be uh, radiating upwards. It's worse after eating and especially with lying down. That's why they tell you that whenever you eat, you wanna make sure that you wait at least 30 minutes before lying down. Uh, regurgitation, definitely, you feel like the food is coming back out, or like my husband says, baby vomit. <laughs> uh, water brush, cough, sore throat, dyspepsia. So the diagnosis is usually clinical, um, and you can do a trial of PPIs, but the test of choice is an endoscopy with biopsy. But of course, we don't do that in clinic, definitely. So this is where, like I said, textbook medicine differs from clinical medicine or medicine that you do in clinic. But endoscopy with biopsy is a test of choice, but the gold standard is a 24-hour pH monitoring because you want to make sure that there's nothing else going on, like they have maybe a gastro gastronoma, like a Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, or anything else like that. Treatment is that initially, like I said, you want to avoid anything that can cause it, like fatty foods, coffee, alcohol, anything that's acidic, like orange juice. I love orange juice. Chocolate, large meals before bed, definitely. They say that you want to try to prevent eating after seven and also sleeping with the trunk elevated. I had a lot of questions with this, so make sure that you know that is sleeping with the trunk elevated, stop smoking, losing weight, avoid alcohol. If you do need to prescribe some medications, then you can start with antiacids or H2 blockers. So if you have a question, Sam, and it asks you, what is, what do you want to start? What is your next best treatment? then you can say antacids or H2 blockers. Even though in clinic, we probably don't do that. We go straight to the PPIs like uromeprazole. But if the patient is, comes back and they're like, you know what, I'm not getting better, textbook medicine, then you can give them something stronger like uh, proton pump inhibitors, right? So what are your H2 blockers? You have like your uh, ranitidine, right? And any, anything that cimetidine that ends in idine. So you usually start with those for GERD. So make sure that you know that. Do not confuse that with clinical medicine, okay? So for GERD, first line is going to be you want to tell a patient that they want to change their diet, they have to lose weight, and if they're not getting better after that, then you want to start with your antacids or H2 blockers, and if they're not getting better after that, then that's when you do their PPIs. And so you've done all that, the medications, the uh, lifestyle changes, and they still haven't gotten better, you want to do surgery. So you want to do a, a lap, Nissen, Laparotomy, Nissen fundoplication. Uh, this is the big ones that are used for GERD. So once again, make sure that you know that if you do need to go into surgery, it's a Nissen fundoplication. So what are some of the complications of GERD? Uh, erosive esophagitis, strictures, esophageal ulcers, Barrett's esophagus, like I said, pitting of dental enamel, right? Because you're having that acid back into your regurgitating, so it can actually ruin your teeth. Gingivitis, laryngitis, and pharyngitis. And I did an ENT, so I did an ENT rotation, and we had a lot of patients that would come in um, saying that they had like this chronic sore throat. And one of the first questions that my provider always asked him was, do you suffer from GERD? Do you suffer from heartburn? Because you wanna make sure that it's nothing related with the stomach. Okay, so now we're gonna go into the hernias. So we have the hiatal hernias, which is a protrusion of the upper portion of the stomach into the, to the thoracic cavity due to diaphragm tear or weakness. So you have two types. We actually have several types, but the, you need to know two types. The first type is a sliding one, and then the second type is a paraesophageal. Uh, these hernias can cause gastroesophageal reflux disease. But the most common one is gonna be the sliding one. It's about 90% of them are sliding. And it happens at the gastroesophageal junction where the stomach actually herniates into um, the stomach herniates. And then you have your paraesophageal, which is 5%. The fundus herniates through the hole in the diaphragm. So make sure that you know the difference between both of them. Signs and symptoms is that the patient will usually be asymptomatic. If they do complain of symptoms, there'll be something related to GERD. So they'll have the dysphagia, the heartburn, the chest pain, early satiety. satiety. So basically they get full sooner. Diagnosis with a barium swallow. You can also do an upper GI series, uh, x-rays, 
you know, see stomach contents into the thoracic cavity on an x-ray. And you can also do an upper endoscopy. Treatment is going to be anti-acid, small meals. You basically tell them to elevate their head once again after meals, uh, weight loss. If they do need surgery, which is usually like last line, you usually try to avoid surgery, then you can do something like a Neeson fundoplication, like I stated, for type 1. And then for type 2, uh, usually surgical repair is indicated because there's a higher risk of strangulation and incarceration, which is life-threatening. So like I said, most of these hernias don't really need uh, surgery, usually it is just uh, treatment with uh, lifestyle changes, and then if they do need treatment, like you can give them something like antiacids, and then if they do need surgery, like later, if it's their heartburn is not getting better with all these medications and it's chronic, then you can do a surgery, an Eastern fund application, and the most common one is going to be type 1, which is sliding, and type 2 is the periesophageal, it's not as common. But the second one, type 2, has a higher risk of strangulation and incarceration, so it may require surgical repair. All right, guys, so let's go into peptic ulcer disease. So peptic ulcer disease is the most common cause of upper GI bleeding. Uh, it's usually due to impaired mucosa defense and acidic gastric context, contents. So basically, it's acid hypersecretion. It's usually associated with, uh, it can be associated with GERD. But the most common cause is... Helobacter pylori, so H. pylori, make sure that you know that H. pylori is usually the culprit for peptic ulcer disease, it's the most common cause of it. Also NSAIDs, um, you can have a gastronoma like I said, so Zollinger, Ellison syndrome, corticosteroids, smoking, alcohol abuse, coffee, emotional stress, diet, so a lot of things can cause it, but H. pylori is usually the culprit for um, both GERD and peptic ulcer disease. So you have two types, you have your gastric ulcers and then you have your duodenal ulcers. So the way I remembered these, because you'll have a patient and you're reading the question and then you're like, you know what, I think this is an ulcer. And then at the end, you have to make sure whether is it in the gastric or duodenal ulcer. So a duodenal ulcer, pain is relieved by eating. So how I memorize it is, dude, give me food. So dude, give me food, dude, give me food. They eat and they feel better with the pain. And these patients with duodenal ulcers are more likely to have pain at night. They're usually younger and they smoke. And they tend to be also type O, which is really, really interesting. So once again, duodenal ulcer, dude, give me food, pain is better with eating. So make sure that you know that. In regards to gastric ulcer, this one's worse with food. So the opposite. They're more likely to be malignant. They're found in older patients. Uh, Patients that use NSAIDs and type A blood. The most common one, though, are duodenal ulcers. Okay, so duodenal ulcer is found in younger individuals. Okay, now we're going to go to signs and symptoms. So how is a patient with peptic ulcer disease going to present? That they'll have some epigastric pain. It's going to be aching and gnawing. They'll have symptoms at night. They'll have nausea and vomiting. Sometimes they can have weight loss, early satiety. And... If it's perforated, then they'll have right shoulder pain and rebound tenderness, okay? So if it's perforated, they'll have right shoulder pain. What's the reason because of that? It's because of the nerves that usually run in that area tend to go to the, to the shoulder. So this is why this patient will be complaining of right shoulder pain and rebound uh, tenderness. Perforated is usually an emergency, so it's really important that you make sure that you treat them quickly. Endoscopy with biopsy is a gold standard for peptic ulcer disease because you want to make sure that you're ruling out malignancy because these patients are also losing weight. Also, you can do a urea breath test or a fecal antigen test or serology, um, which is easiest for H. pylori because H. pylori is usually the culprit, right, for peptic ulcer disease. Interestingly, though, from all these three, urea breath tests is actually the best ones to do. Uh, I was listening to a podcast the other day and they recommended that the breath test is um, cheaper and it's easiest, it's not as invasive, and it's a lot better for patients to diagnose uh, H. pylori. So how do you treat this? So you discontinue any NSAIDs, and this is why I'm really, really careful with NSAIDs, whether it's uh, um, ibuprofen or anything like that, I'm really careful with that because I know I do suffer from 
uh, heartburn because they are known for causing ulcers and sets or even gastric bleeding. So that's why you want to be really careful in patients that are have some type of stomach disorder, gastritis, or heartburn with NSAIDs because it can cause gastric bleeding and ulcers. So if the patient is on NSAIDs, you want to discontinue them okay, as soon as possible. You also want to make sure that they're not drinking alcohol, so restrict their alcohol intake. You tell them to decrease their stress, do not smoke, don't eat before bed. That's a huge one because when you're, when you're recumbent, right, that food, that acid is just going back and that's what can cause the ulcers. Um, and also you want to give them something like an acid suppression. So once again, start with your H2 blockers. You can also give them something like a proton pump inhibitors, like your omeprazole, SO omeprazole. You can also do antiacids. And the treatment is for H. pylori, since you want to treat H. pylori usually because it's a culprit once again, is that there's a triple and quadruple therapy. You have to know this, make sure you know this. I've seen this so many times, not only in my surgery rotation exam, just in everywhere I've seen it. I've been studying for the pants, so I've seen this question over and over again. So make sure that you know this. The treatment for H. pylori, the triple, is going to be a proton pump inhibitor. So the question stem will definitely not have PPI, I mean the answer. It'll have literally like omeprazole or esomeprazole, so make sure that you're familiar with your PPIs. So it'll be something like omeprazole, amoxicillin, and clarithromycin, okay? So this is going to be your triple therapy for H. pylori. If you need to do a quadruple therapy, then you can do something like uh, omeprazole, bismuth, salicylate, right? uh, metronidazole, and a tetracycline, whether it's doxycycline, for example. So make sure that you know that. And usually the treatment for the triple, which is the most common one, is for 14 days, so it's for two weeks. So make sure that you know that also. You can also give them a cytoprotectant, so it's going to protect the ulcer, basically like a coating, something like a sucrophate or misoprostol. And if the peptic ulcer has ruptured, this is an emergency. So you want to give them quickly IV antibiotics and PPIs before their surgical repair. So let's go into pyloric stenosis. So pyloric stenosis, it's more common in children and babies. It's basically a hypertrophy or the muscular layer of pylorus that results in a gastric outlet syndrome. It's very common in babies, like I said, two weeks to two months, more common in males to females, most common in firstborns. So usually I'll have a question that will ask you on the etiology. So just make sure that it's common in newborns and babies, two weeks to two months, more common in males, and more common in firstborns. And it's increased if the parent has a history of polyxenosis. It's congenital. And also another thing that you have to know about this is that macrolides can cause it also. Whether the mother was pregnant and was taking macrolides or the baby for some reason was taking macrolides. Uh, so the most common one is going to be erythromycin. I was actually reading a paper the other day about this, and people are still debating on whether if a mother is taking a macrolide, they can actually transmit it through their milk when they're breastfeeding the baby, so they're not sure about that, and whether they can, this can cause pyloric stenosis. There's still not, not enough data on this, but definitely for babies or newborns that are taking macrolides, erythromycin is one of the big ones for causing pyloric stenosis. So this is high yield. Make sure you know that. I had a question that asked me, I don't know if, I don't remember if it was for my pediatric rotation, but it asked me which one of these medications may have caused pyloric stenosis. And it gave you a bunch of antibiotics and gave you two macrolides. Make sure that you know it's erythromycin. Erythromycin, so many papers have been known as a culprit for causing pyloric stenosis. Okay, so another thing, symptoms that this patient will be presenting with is a projectile vomiting, right? They have that vomiting that basically goes to the wall, like projectile vomiting, not little like baby vomiting, like projectile vomiting, the ones that you see in uh, the movies, um, like exorcist movies, just like projectile. And this is usually after feeding, and then they want to eat, right? Because they, they're not eating. They're, it's going down and it's coming back up because that's, it's the nose. They can't get food in through there. The patient will also be very hungry, so they're very, they want to eat, they're very, they have a high desire to feed. They can also be dehydrated, so make sure that you also look at their mucosal membranes, right, their mouth, armpits, etc. They'll be very dehydrated, sunken fontanelle, etc. And they can also be constipated, and this is pathognomonic for pyloric stenosis, is that they'll have a palpable 
olive like mass. So if it says anywhere on the question stem and you see olive like mass, then it's going to be pyloric stenosis. Diagnosis is going to be cl clinical. Uh, you can do specifically, you start out with an abdominal ultrasound. You can also do an upper GI contrast study if you need to. You'll see a mushroom or a target lesion that's also pathognomonic for pyloric stenosis. If it's a baby and they do a X-ray, they see a target lesion, then it is pyloric stenosis. For labs, this is something you need to know. So how is this baby going to be presenting, right? They're going to be throwing up. Anything that is throwing up, it's going to be metabolic alkalosis. If it's diarrhea, it's going to be metabolic acidosis. So this patient is going to be throwing up. They're going to be hypokalemic, hypochloremic, and metabolic alkalosis. So make sure that you know these labs. It's really vital. Once again, hypokalemic, hypochloremic, and metabolic acidosis. Treatment is usually your pediatric surgical consult. They need to have surgery, right? You want to also correct the dehydration, the electrolytes, your metabolic abnormalities, right? Because hypokalemia can lead to what? Arrhythmias. And these arrhythmias can be sometimes very deadly. So you want to uh, make sure that you're, you're correcting their dehydration, giving them some IV fluids or potassium replacement. You want to monitor their urinary output, right? Because this patient is very dehydrated. And surgery is going to be the pyloromyotomy. And then after that, they can actually start liquids about four to six hours post-op. Some of the complications of pyloric stenosis is apnea. So all patients have to be monitored for their apnea and duodenal perforation. If this happens, we can repair it and IV antibiotics can be given. And that's basically what you need to know about pyloric stenosis. Make sure that it is due to microlide use. Erythromycin is the most common cause. The patient's going to have projectile vomiting. On physical examination, you're going to palpate an olive-shaped mass. You start with an ultrasound, so it's going to be the first one that you start with. If it asks you what is the next, next best initial diagnostic tool, you're going to start with an ultrasound. You can do an x-ray also, but usually ultrasound is the best one. Labs, hypokalemic, hypochloremic, metabolic alkalosis once again. Treatment is, of course, you want to do surgery, pyloro pyloromyotomy. And you also want to correct their dehydration, their electrolytes, and their metabolic abnormalities. So let's go into gastric cancer. So basically a cancer or neoplasm of the stomach, right? The most common one is going to be adenocarcinoma. Make sure that you know this. You have to know the types of cancers. The most common one is going to be adenocarcinoma. Age is usually greater than 70. It's more commonly found in elderly. Males, once again, it's most commonly. And Interestingly, Chinese and Japanese also. So gastric cancer is actually one of the leading causes of death or one of the most common cancers in um, Asia, specifically Japan. Risk factors are usually smoking, high intake of preserved foods, whether it's dried, smoked, or salted, gastritis, H. pylori infections, gastric polyps, pernicious anemia. Signs and symptoms, the patient's going to be complaining of abdominal pain and weight loss. Whenever you read a question and it says that they're having weight loss, you want to make sure that you have a red flag of cancer, especially if the patient looks cachectic, okay? If they look very, very sick, very ill, they're pale. Also, the patient will be having a low appetite, anorexia, dyspepsia, early satiety, so they get full very quickly. Postprandial fullness, nausea, vomiting, anemia, melina. So what is melina? That's when you have the dark blood um, in your, when the patient goes to the restroom. If it's been metastasized, this is huge, guys. Make sure that you know this. I had questions on this. You'll have a palpable seft left supraclavicular node, lymph node. Okay, so you'll have a left supraclavicular virtual virtual node and an umbilical lymph node, also known as Sister Mary Joseph. So sometimes you'll have a question and it'll give you you'll reading it and you're like, you know what, this is gastric cancer, and then it'll ask you what other sign is found in this patient that indicates metastasis. So make sure that you know the umbilical, right? The umbilical lymph nodes. It's a sister, also known as Sister Mary Joseph. And then the palpable left supraclavicular lymph nodes. So how do you diagnose this? You're gonna do an endoscopy with biopsy. Usually with most cancers, you always do a biopsy because you wanna see what type it is because there's several types. So in this case, it's the same thing. You're gonna do an endoscopy with biopsy. It's the most accurate one. You can also do a barium upper GI series, an abdominal CT, a uh, for fecal occult blood test. Um, CEA is usually the tumor marker for gastric cancer, but endoscopy with biopsy is the most accurate one. 
you for treatment you're going to do surgical resection with wide margins and with extended lymph node dissection uh, total or subtotal gastrectomy and then chemo and radiation so once again adenocarcinoma most common cause of gastric cancer uh, very common in um, Asians, spe specifically Japanese and Chinese. So next one's going to be diverticulosis. So diverticulosis is more commonly found in the elderly population. It's basically a patient that has a, a large diverticula in the colon. They're more common in the colon. Uh, Sac-like protrusions of the colon wall because due to increased intraluminal pressure, the patient will usually have a family history. And the difference between diverticulosis diverticulosis and diverticulitis is that in diverticulosis it's not inflamed. So what is diverticula? We had a patient also or a cadaver, we call them patients because they are patients, in my anatomy class. So anatomy class we had cadavers and one of the patients, it was a female, she had diverticulosis and you could see literally like the little, they look like little balls to me in the colon and you can actually put your fingers through them. And so diverticulosis, diverticulosis is basically due to this pressure that is causing this pressure in the colon wall. And as you get older, of course, right, your tissues aren't as strong as they used to be when you were younger. Uh, this is why patients that have hypertension sometimes, if they're older, they're more prone to getting strokes, etc., because those vessel walls will rupture. The same thing with the diverticula. So in the colon, this increased pressure will cause this, like these little balls, they're like this, in the colon. And so this is what diverticulosis is. Diverticulitis is when these little balls become infected, or when these little protrusions of the intestinal wall become infected. But in diverticulosis, is that basically they're just there, they're sac-like protrusions of the colon wall, they're not infected at all. So the area that's most common, make sure that you know this, is going to be the sigmoid colon. It's more common in males because it is more common in elderly, ages 50 to 80. Uh, some of the causes, this is another one you have to know, it's uh, due to low fiber. So these patients aren't getting enough fiber in their diet. They're eating a lot of fat in their diet. They're obese, they're inactive. And signs and symptoms is that usually they're asymptomatic. Sometimes they might have that left lower quadrant pain um, and painless rectal bleeding cramping, bloating, they might have constipation or diarrhea, irregular bowel movements, and uh, tenderness to palpation also. So if the patient comes in and they're complaining of left lower quadrant pain, they're an elderly patient, I would have diverticulosis in my uh, differential diagnosis for sure. Also make sure that you know guys uh, basically your abdominal area very well and where certain organs will present so, for example, if a patient complains of right upper quadrant pain, make sure that you know, well, what's located in the right upper quadrant pain? You have your gallbladder, right? What can cause right upper quadrant pain? What can cause left lower quadrant pain? What can cause left upper quadrant pain? What can cause uh, right lower quadrant pain? Make sure that you know also, for example, in females, what can cause left or lower quadrant pain? You have your ovaries there. Same for males, testicles, testicular torsion, etc. So make sure that you know the areas in your abdominal area, and in this case, diverticulosis, left lower quadrant pain. So diagnosis, it's usually find, found incidentally, like I said, these patients can be asymptomatic, uh, usually through CT or colonoscopies. Um, you can do a barium anima, abdominal x-ray, but the gold standard is going to be a colonoscopy, but of course this isn't done. It's not common, but this is textbook medicine, so colonoscopy, gold standard. You want to also make sure that you're looking at their uh, complete blood cell count for anemia. How do you treat this? You tell them to increase their fiber, right? So this is, is going to decrease the straining when they're going to the restroom. It's going to allow food to pass more easily through the GI. You can give them something like uh, pycelium, uh, surgery if needed, only for massive hemorrhages. So you can do a colonoscopy. Colonoscopy, you can also do a colonoscopy to make sure that you're ruling out any type of cancer or treat complications. So diverticulitis. Diverticulitis is basically inflammation of those diverticula that we discussed earlier. Uh, usually due to feces, right? Because in the colon you have feces, so feces impacts there. It can cause erosion. It can perforate sometimes. 
and the most common site is left lower quadrant pain, same as diverticulosis. So a patient will be complaining of pain in the left lower quadrant area. So what is the cause? It's usually uncomplicated um, in most cases, but if it is complicated, it's due to uh, axis of fistula, obstruction, perforation. Patient will be complaining with fever, right, because it can be infected. Left lower quadrant pain, leukocytosis, so increased leukocytes in their complete in their CBC. They will have no bleeding though. Uh, the patient will have constipation more than diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, painful mass, scarring, rigidity, rebound tenderness. So these are the most common ones you might see in the ER. Older patient complaining of left lower quadrant pain. They're having fever. They have a history of diverticulosis, and you want to make sure diverticulosis is in your differential diagnosis. Diagnosis, you're going to do a CT scan with oral and IV contrast. You'll see a swollen edematous bowel or abscess. You can also do an abdominal x-ray. Um, contraindicated, you definitely do not want to do a barium enema, right? Or colonoscopy because these can perforate. So you want to make sure that you do avoid these at all costs. But diagnosis, CT scan with oral and IV contacts, contrast. In treatment, you want to give them IV antibiotics because these patients can become septic, especially if these have perforated, they can cause peritonitis, right? You can also make sure that they take nothing by mouth. You put them on NPO, you give them some IV fluids, high fiber, and then uh, colectomy is usually needed in the future if they keep having recurrences of diverticulitis or complications. So let's go into irritable bowel disease. So you have different flavors. You have your ulcerative colitis and your Crohn's disease. So let's start with ulcerative colitis. This is a chronic inflammation and in ulcers of the colon and rectal mucosa. Mucosa and submucosa and it's continuous inflammation. So that's how you differentiate between both of them. You have to make sure that with ulcerative colitis, it's only located to the colon and the rectum area. And it is also continuous. Versus Crohn's disease, it's basically anywhere in the GI tract, right? It can be from the mouth to anywhere in the GI tract. And basically with this one also with Crohn's is that it's not continuous, it's random. Versus ulcerative colitis, it's continuous inflammation. So etiology, I said it involves rectum in all cases. Uh, they can have periodic exacerbations or remissions, so they'll be fine, and they'll have the, the exacerbation again, and they'll be fine, they'll be back and forth like that. For this one though, interestingly, smoking is a protective factor. If you guys are fans of house, there's an episode where there's a patient that presents and they have ulcerative colitis, and he tells them, he writes a prescription for them and it's cigarettes. Because cigarettes are, for some reason, uh, have helped in ulcerative colitis. So that was interesting. I don't think I've had a question on that, but I just thought it was interesting. Uh, ulcerative colitis is also most common in young adults, so if the patient's in their early 20s. Signs and symptoms, the patient will be complaining of abdominal pain. Once again, you have that left lower quadrant pain, right? Because the colon is more commonly involved, and you also have the rectum that's most commonly involved. Diarrhea, hematochoesia, which is basically that gross blood. This is also something that differentiates it between Crohn's disease, is that in ulcerative colitis, you'll have blood in the stool. So also known as hematochoesia. Make sure that you're familiar with those terms because it will not say bloody diarrhea. It'll say hematochoesia in your answer choice. Uh, they'll have small frequent bowel movements, fever, anorexia, weight loss, tenesmus, which is a feeling or urge that they have to go to the restroom. Extraintestinal symptoms like jaundice, also uveitis, pyodermia uh, granginosum, which is a type of rash. Erythematodosum, which is a type of rash also, and I'm sorry, pyoderma uh, granginosum is not a rash. It's a, basically, it's this rare condition that causes like painful sores to develop on your skin. And also, another thing that you will see in these patients is that they'll have ankylosing spondylitis, uh, renal stones, liver disease. So the definitive treatment for this is going to be a sigmoidoscopy and colonoscopy, okay? which makes sense, right? Because it's only located to the rectum and the colon versus Crohn's disease. You really can't do surgery because it's located all over. There's not a specific area where it's only located to. Another thing that you have to know about ulcerative colitis is that it's only located to the mucosa and submucosa. It's not uh, transmural, where Crohn's disease is transmural, okay? So with uh, ulcerative colitis, so like I said, surgery you can do. 
Um, but if it's a perforation, you, it's contraindicated because you can risk of sepsis, right? Um, labs, you usually find is anemia. You'll have an increased ESR inflammation, right? Abdominal x-ray, uh, you'll see a colonic dilation and distension. And this will be positive ASCA, A-S-C-A. -A. Make sure that you know that, positive ASCA. Versus Crohn's disease is positive ANCA. So sometimes you'll get a, a question that I will ask you, like, what labs? And it'll describe a patient that has ulcerative colitis. Make sure it's positive ASCA, ASCA, for labs. Surgery, once again, like I uh, said, is a curative treatment, so a total colectomy if it's severe enough. But if they have acute exacerbations, you can do systemic steroids plus uh, mesalamine enema. And then maintenance, it's going to be mesalamine and sofalazine. So make sure that you know that, okay? So for maintenance, it's going to be either uh, mesal mesalamine or sofalazine. Complications is going to be anemia, hemorrhage. You can have electrolyte disturbance, dehydration, strictures. Toxic megacolon is a huge one for ulcerative colitis. So sometimes they'll give you an x-ray of a huge toxic megacolon, and they'll ask you who is a culprit, and just make sure that you are aware that ulcerative colitis can cause that. And also they have an increased risk for colon cancer also. So let's go into Crohn's disease. This is inflammation of tissue destruction anywhere in the tract, like I said. Uh, it's destruction through the entire depth of the intestinal wall, so it's transmural, versus, like we mentioned, ulcerative colitis is mucosa and submucosa only. The etiology, it's most commonly found in the terminal ileum, okay? So make sure that you know that. It's rarely in the stomach, mouth, or esophagus, even though it can be found anywhere. It's tend to be found more in young women versus ulcerative colitis, right, is more commonly found in young men. This one's young woman for Crohn's disease specifically Caucasians and Jewish. And basically they'll have the same thing, flares and remissions. And for this one, it's gonna be the right lower quadrant because of course, where is it most commonly found? In the terminal ileum versus your ulcerative colitis, which is the left lower quadrant pain, right? And they will also be found in young women, like I said, um, this patient will also have nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, but no gross blood versus a patient that has ulcerative colitis, so have hematopoiesa, right? They have that bloody diarrhea. This patient will just have a regular diarrhea. They can also have a fever, malaise, malabsorption, weight loss. Uh, extra intestinal symptoms are very similar to the ones in ulcerative colitis for Crohn's disease, jaundice, uveitis, pyoderma granulosum, erythema nodosum, ankylosing spondylitis, renal stones, and liver disease. How do you diagnose this? You're gonna do an endoscopy with a biopsy because it's found anywhere. Uh, you'll find at this ulcers, the cobblestone appearance is pathognomonic for Crohn's disease. So make sure that you know that cap cobblestone appearance for your endoscopy with biopsy. You'll find also skipped lesions, okay? Uh, anal fissures. You can also do a barium enema, a CT scan if you need to. But the labs that you do, once again, it's gonna be positive ANCA for this one, okay? You'll also find fat creeping. That was another term that I saw also. Treatment is, uh, you can do surgery, but it's not curative, right? Because it's found all over, it can reoccur in any part of the GI tract. Versus ulcerative colitis, treatment is curative. But usually the maintenance is uh, sofazalazine, um, mesalamine, metronidazole. Metronidazole is a huge um, medication that is used for infections or for like anything in the GI. So if there's anything GI, just make sure you choose metronidazole. And if, these, if the patient does not respond for like to the 5 ASA, um, then you can do metronidazole. So if the patient is not responding to the mesalamine or sulfazalazine, then you can do metronidazole. If it's acute flare, then you can do systemic corticosteroids like prednisone. Uh, you can also give bile acid sequestrants, col cholestyramine and uh, cholestipol, and nutritional supplementation support. And most of these patients are anemic, right? Because they can't absorb nutrients in their stomach or in their intestines and support. So let's go into the bowel obstructions. So let's go into small bowel obstructions. This you have to know for sure, the most common cause of a small bowel obstruction is what? Surgical adhesions. So that is the most common cause. You have a question on this, I can guarantee this, whether it's in your surgery or whether you're in didactic gear or your pants, you're gonna have this question for sure. Um, also incarcerated hernias, malignancies, interception, dehydration, Crohn's disease, foreign bodies. So what are the symptoms that the patient is going to be presenting with? 
They'll have uh, colicky abdominal pain, cramping pain, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, obstipation. This one's huge, guys, obstipation. Basically, what does that mean? No passage of gas or feces. Distension, normal or increased bowel sounds. If it's strangulated, they'll have fever, severe pain. They can go into shock, hematemesis, which is vomiting blood. They can also have gas in the bowel wall, abdominal free air, peritoneal signs, and also they can be acidotic. Diagnosis. So you can do an x-ray. You'll see that ladder pattern. You'll see dilated loops and, and gas. You can also do a barium enema, but of course the one most commonly I would see would be an x-ray. Uh, usually the barium enema will show you the site of the obstruction. You can also do uh, upper GI series. You'll see the string of pearls. That is pathognomonic for a small bowel obstruction. And the treatment is usually not, not uh, if it's non-operative, you can give IV fluids with electrolytes. You can do an NG tube to empty the stomach and put them on nothing by mouth and antibiotics. But if surgery is indicated because you suspect something like a strangulation, you can do a laparotomy with a lysis of adhesions and resection of necrotic bowel. So if you have a, a question and it's telling you that a patient just had surgery, then and they're having the symptoms like of abdominal distension, that's usually pathognomonic for some type of bowel obstruction, then I would go with small bowel obstruction. So let's go into large bowel obstruction. So once again, what is the most common cause of bowel obstructions? Adhesions, right? Also, colon cancer is a common cause in elderly. So any type of neoplasm that is blocking, that's large enough to be blocking the abdominal contents or the, in the stomach or the abdominal area, uh, you want to make sure that you are aware that um, it can be some type of cancer or colon cancer. Hernia is also, but the most common cause is going to be adhesions. Uh, symptoms, it's going to be similar to small bowel obstruction. They'll have the abdominal pain, the distension. So anything that you see usually with the abdominal pain and the distension, and you want to make sure that it is uh, some type of bowel obstruction. They can have colicky, colicky pain, constipation, nausea and vomiting, surgical scars, uh, high-pitched bowel signs. I was reading a book the other day, and it was saying that usually uh, the patient will usually begin with bowel signs, right? Large bowel signs. And then once it progresses, the abdominal area can be very, very quiet. So in clinical medicine, usually it'll, don't always think that they're going to ha have a hyperactive bowel or your hear bowel sounds. Um, sometimes they can be really quiet. But for clinical, for uh, textbook medicine, they'll have the hyperactive bowel sounds on physical exam. Diagnosis, you can start with an abdominal x-ray. You'll see a distended proximal colon. Loss of hostra, this is really, really, really big for uh, bowel obstruction. Um, loss of hostra basically is, hostra is found in the colon. So you'll see it when you do x-rays. When you lose it, that's when you're like, hmm, you know what, there's something going on here. So they'll usually give you an x-ray and you look at it and you're like, boom, I know what it is, it's a bowel obstruction. And then they'll ask you, hey, what, what was missing or how did you know? And you're like, okay, because of loss of hostra, that's why. So this is a high yield loss of hostra. Make sure that you know that on an abdominal x-ray for a large bowel obstruction. You'll see no gas in the rectum, uh, air fluid levels. You can consider a rectal barium enema if needed, but usually you, abdominal x-ray you can use to diagnosis. Treatment is that you're gonna ad admit this patient. You're gonna do an NG decompression, nothing by mouth. You're gonna give them IV fluids. Uh, you can do a rectal tube and then a surgery if it's an emergency, emergency um, lab. Okay, guys, so let's go now into volvulus. So what is volvulus? Volvulus is malrotation of the bowel uh, during fetal development. Although volvulus, volvulus can also be found in elderly, uh, most of the questions that you'll get will be found in children. So it's very common in newborns. 60% of the patients will be less than one month. So it's due to a malrotation, whether it was an error during development. Um, most common is a midgut, which is due to adhesions. It twists around the uh, SMA. So the blood flow is, so the superior mesenteric artery, so the blood flow is compromised. And you can also found it, find it in the ileum. So it's most commonly found in the ileum. The patient will be complaining of bilious vomiting. Okay, This is how sometimes you can tell between different things in a baby whether it's bilious or non-bilious, and bilious is going to be for volvulus. Bilious vomiting, bloating, distension, fever, 
they'll have blood streaked stools or melina. Their baby's going to be dehydrated. They're going to be in shock. Diagnosis is uh, you can do an abdominal x-ray. You'll see the double bubble sign. So the double bubble sign is pathognomonic for a volvulus and distal air fluid levels. You can do an upper GI contrast also or contrast enema. This is uh, actually what you use for uh, diagnosis. So malrotation, uh, dilated bowel on right side, malrotation in volvulus, you'll see a corkscrew or a beaked appearance with dilated bowel loops. And treatment is an emergency surgical consult. Uh, you use decompression, uh, or you can sometimes do the LADS procedure, which is resection of the dead bowel. And this patient is usually admitted to NICU or um, PICU. So with this one, make sure that you know that the patient's gonna be a newborn. They're gonna have bilious vomiting, bloating, distension, fever. You'll see the double bubble sign on the abdominal x-ray and these patients usually need surgery. So let's go into small bowel carcinoma. This is very rare. Uh, most of these cancers tend to be benign and they're often discovered accidentally. So it's not something that you're looking for. Uh, and it usually has a poor prognosis. So if it's found very, very late. The most common etiology is gonna be adenocarcinoma and it's most commonly found in the duodenum, duodenum or the proximal jejunum. Uh, carcinoid is uh, most commonly found in the appendix or ileum. Uh, carcinoid syndrome is it secretes uh, serotonin. So basically with patients that have uh, carcinoid, everything will be increased. So they'll have diarrhea, they can even have some tachycardia. So they'll have all these symptoms. We'll discuss it, discuss it later. Um, they can also have a lymphoma, which is found more, more commonly in immunocompromised patients. So patients have Crohn's or celiac disorder. So signs and symptoms for small bowel carcinoma is going to be GI bleed. They'll have a melina, hematochoresia, weight loss, fatigue, weakness, um, abdominal pain. They can even have a small bowel obstruction. Diagnosis, you're going to do a CT scan. Of course, how are you going to confirm with any type of cancer? With the biopsy. Uh, you're going to stage it using the TNM. And you're going to do a surgical resection, something known as a Whipple's procedure, uh, chemotherapy, and usually palliative care if it's found later. Okay, guys, let's go into acute appendicitis. This is huge. I get so many questions on it. I feel like I know appendicitis so well because I've had so many questions on it, whether it's been my pediatrics rotation, surgery rotation, for sure. You're going to see so many questions on your EOR because it's so common. And we saw a lot of that, especially in my surgery rotation. So what is acute appendicitis? It's inflammation of the appendix. It's obstruction of the lumen leading to stasis and bacterial growth. And it's more commonly found in males and females. Uh, peak of age is 10 to 30. It's either found in children. It's very commonly found in children also. Uh, usually in children, it's due to um, an overgrowth. And um, usually if it's the patient's older, it's usually due to a fecalis. So basically um, poop gets stuck there. Also undigested seeds. That's interesting, right? Pinworm infections, so make sure that you also have that. I had a question and you had to know that pinworms caused it. Lymphoid hyperplasia, that's the one that's most commonly found in children. So usually if the patient's older, it's going to be due to a fecalith. And if the patient's younger, it's due to lymphoid hyperplasia. So make sure that you know the differences between these. Patient's going to be complaining of right lower quadrant pain. So make sure that you know this. This is really important, right lower quadrant pain. They're gonna start with uh, epigastrin pain that moves towards the umbilicus, and then they'll have that right lower quadrant pain and that distension. So they'll have this sharp, severe, constant pain. They can be anorexia, they'll have a, a anorexic, they'll be uh, eat, having a lot of nausea and vomiting. So if you're reading a question stem and the patient is not eating, right lower quadrant pain, their child definitely have appendicitis on your differential diagnosis. So on your physical exam, make sure that you know these signs. So they'll have a positive Rothstein sign. So what is a Rothstein sign? Is Rothstein is that you'll palpate or you'll put pressure on the left lower quadrant pane, and they'll have pain in the right lower quadrant pane. Also, they'll have a positive psoas sign. So what is a positive psoas sign? So you have a psoas muscle, right, that runs in the abdominal area. If you raise your leg up, uh, the patient, and you put resistance on the leg, the patient will extend that psoas muscle, and they will have pain. Usually if there's any inflammation in that area, it can be, um, it can cause pain to the psoas muscle, which will have a positive psoas uh, sign. Uh, you will also have a positive obturator sign, which is basically where you bend the knee, you put it in and put it out, and then 
that will also cause pain in the abdominal area. Um, but the one that is pathognomonic for acute appendicitis is McBurney's sign. So McBurney's sign is basically they have pain in the right lower quadrant pain. Do not confuse this with Murphy's sign, which is for uh, cholecystitis. That is right upper quadrant pain. This is the McBurney's point. A lot of my classmates confuse this all the time. McBurney's point is right lower quadrant pain. It's associated with acute appendicitis. And the patient will also have rebound tenderness, guarding, uh, diminished bowel sounds. It can present with a fever. But make sure that you know the signs because it will give you a description of the sign. You need to know what sign it is, whether it's Robstein's, whether it's obturator, whether it's a McBurney's point, whether they're nice enough and they'll be, it'll be that easy. But make sure you know how the signs present. Okay. Also, this is just for like clinical medicine, probably not textbook medicine, but not all appendicitis can have right lower quadrant pain, right? Because some patients can have their append appendix in a different area. I mean, they can have a retrocecal appendix. The appendix doesn't always have to be located in the right lower quadrant pain. So if you are in clinic and you're suspecting maybe acute appendicitis, but they don't have all the signs, I would still treat them for appendicitis because sometimes a patient can present with different signs. Maybe they have, may have some back pain. Maybe they might have some um, kidney pain, etc. cetera, uh, blood in their urine because this inflamed appendix is so inflamed that it's pressing against the ureters or it's causing obstruction. So you always want to make sure that you also ensure that there's also the appendix is not only located in the right lower quadrant pain, it can be located in different areas. You can have your retrocecal appendix. But for textbook medicine and for the EOR, right lower quadrant pain, right? And also diagnosis, what are you going to do? Clinical, CBC, leukocytosis, clinical medicine, and once again, you do not always find leukocytosis on a CBC. So it's not pathognomonic for appendicitis, but for textbook medicine for your exam, uh, CBC, you'll find leukocytosis. CT scan, but the best test is ultrasound, especially for children, because you want to make sure that you're limiting the radiation, right? Best test is ultrasound. Now, if the child is a little bit heavier, Obviously, you probably can't use an ultrasound, then you would do a CT scan. Treatment is going to be an appendectomy, always. Number one treatment, you can also give them some analgesics and IV antibiotics, especially if it's ruptured, right? Because if it's ruptured, it can, they can become septics, it can cause some peritonitis. So you want to make sure that you give them some IV antibiotics, but the treatment for sure, it's going to be an appendectomy. Okay, guys, so now we're going to go into toxic megacolon. We kind of discussed this a little bit when we were discussing uh, some of the, uh, when we were discussing irritable, irritable bowel disease. So toxic megacolon is basically a dilation and widening of the colon. Makes sense, right? Megacolon, toxic. Uh, there's swelling and inflammation to the deep layers of the colon. It's very severe, but it's rare. And if it does happen, it's life-threatening. So this is an emergency. Some of the causes are Hirschsprung's, Hirschsprung's disease. So Hirschsprung's disease, what is that? It's usually when um, the nerves in the abdominal area are not working. So instead of helping you move food, they just stay there. And um, this can definitely cause a toxic megacolon, right? Because bacteria can accumulate. Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, like we discussed earlier. C. difficile colitis, colon cancer, and even diabetes mellitus. Signs and symptoms, the patient's going to be complaining of abdominal pain, bloating, distension, fever, and tachycardia, leukocytosis, abnormal, abdo, abnormal um, bowel sounds, diarrhea. Uh, they'll have signs and symptoms of septic shock. And the diagnosis is that you're going to do an abdominal x-ray. They'll have significant colon air and dilation, loss of hostra markings. And treatment for this is going to be bowel decompression with an NG tube. You also want to make sure that you're repleting their fluids and their electrolytes, uh, corticosteroids. You want to give them broad-spectrum antibiotics. And if they're not improving in 24 hours, then you want to make sure you do surgery like a colectomy. Some of the complications is that they can have a perforation, blood loss, sepsis, and shock. So let's go into colorectal cancer. Um, this is actually the third most common cancer in the U.S. And it's a very preventable cancer. Uh, patients follow up with their providers and they're getting their um, colonoscopies done every 10 years and it's very very preventable cancer but not a lot of patients do that and so with colorectal cancer 
it's basically a progression of an adenum mattis polyp, so a polyp in the colon that turns malignant. And the most common one is going to be um, type adenocarcinoma for colorectal cancer. So etiology, like we discussed, most of these tumors tend to arise from adenomas. Um, and the most common one is adenocarcinomas. They have about 20% of distant metastatic spread at presentation, with liver being the most common site for spread of colon cancer. Risk factors, if a patient's greater than age of 50, if they have uh, polyps, adenom adenomatous polyps, family history, definitely, irritable bowel disease, high fat, they have low fiber diet, they smoke, they're obese, lack of physical activity. Some of the signs and symptoms, if it's early, they, they tend to be asymptomatic, but they can present with uh, melina, right, which is that dark blood in the stool, uh, hematopoiesia, which is a bright red blood, uh, blood in the stool, abdominal pain, rectal bleeding, weight loss, change in bowel habits, so it'll go from being constipated to having diarrhea, iron deficiency anemia. That's one of the huge ones, guys. If you have an older patient and they have iron deficiency anemia, you want to suspect that maybe it might be uh, some type of neoplasm like colon cancer. And also, you want to make sure that whether it's right-sided or left-sided, they're going to present differently. So if it's a right-sided tumor, the patient's going to have blood, iron deficiency anemia, molina, change in bowel movements is not very common, uh, weakness, right lower quadrant mass, versus a left-sided tumor, the patient's going to have obstruction, and change in bowel movements is more common in left-sided tumors and right-sided tumors. Constipation, diarrhea, they'll have those pencil stools. This is pathognomonic for left-sided tumors and hematopoiesia. Okay. Rectal cancer is about 20 to 30% of all colorectal cancer. The patient will be complaining of hematopoiesia. So once again, that's bright red blood in their stool. Tenesmus, the feeling that they have to go to the restroom, but they can't. Or rectal mass, feeling of incomplete evacuation of stool. Diagnosis is definitely a colonoscopy, right? It's the most sensitive and the most specific one. You also want to do a positive fecal occult blood test, although this wasn't, sometimes it's not very reliable. A colonoscopy is a lot better. Also, you can do an x-ray. An apple core lesion is pathognomonic for colon cancer. So if you have a patient, they're losing weight, they're having blood in their stool, they're older, they smoke, they have a history of irritable bowel disease, whether it's Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, and then you do an x-ray and you see an apple core lesion, mm, might be colon cancer. CBC, iron deficiency anemia, they have increased CEA. CEA is usually pathognomonic for colorectal cancer, so make sure that you know that. They'll ask you a question, it'll have CAA19 and all these other tumor markers, CEA, okay? Colon cancer. Treatment is surgical management. Uh, this is the only treat way you can treat it, right? Removing that area that has a mass. Chemo, you can also do um, CEA level also before surgery. This will tell you whether it's metastasized or not, etc. Chemo and radiation uh, tends to depend on the stage of the tumor, whether it's metastasized to any part of the body. Like we said, liver is the most common site of metastasis for this colorectal cancer. And also, you want to make sure that you're monitoring the CEA with treatment probably like every three to six months. Um, this helps you see whether there is a reoccurrence or not once the patient has had surgery. You wanna also follow up with a stool, guaiat test, annual CT scan, and a chest x-ray for five years. And colonoscopy at one year and then every th three years after they've been successfully had a mass removed through a colonoscopy. Like I said, metastasis, liver is the most common site for spread and lung is the most common site for rectum. So colon cancer, liver, rectum, it's gonna be the lungs. Okay guys, so let's go into hemorrhoids. So you have your internal or external. So basically it's varicose veins of the anus and rectum that become inflamed. And you wanna make sure that you know the difference between external and internal, because they will ask you. So which one's painful, which one's not painful? Patient that's complaining of uh, not painful hemorrhoids, it's gonna be internal, right? External are the ones that are painful. So external are dilated veins arising from where? The inferior hemorrhoidal plexus. So make sure that you know that. External, 
inferior hemorrhoidal plexus, and these are distal to the dentate light. This is why these are sensitive, because they are found in the sensate area and they are painful. Versus internal, they are dilated submucosa veins of the superior rectal plexus, and these are above the dental, dentate lens. This is why these are not painful. So what are some of the risk factors? Definitely expect a question on these. I had a lot of questions on hemorrhoids, so make sure that you know them very well. Constipation. So the patient is const constantly constipated. They're straining to go to the restroom if they're pregnant, right? Uh, portal hypertension, obesity, prolonged sitting or standing, and anal intercourse is one of the big ones also. Symptoms is that they'll have bleeding. Uh, they can have rectal prolapse, bright red blood in the toilet, paper on the toilet bowl, coating, stool. So sometimes you'll have a patient that will be complaining of bleeding, and if it's not painful, then you're going to maybe say, hey, you know what, this might be a... Um, a hemorrhoid, but it might be internal, right, because it's not painful. But external is that they have painful bleeding, they also have a diet that they don't eat a lot, it'll tell you, like, they have a low fiber diet, then you would expect something like external, right, if it's painful. And external, like I said, it's suddenly painful perianal swelling, it's worse with defecation. Sometimes these patients will not go to the restroom because of the same reason, because it's so painful to go to the restroom. They'll have a tender palpable mass versus internal. It'll be asymptomatic and it'll be painless bleeding. Diagnosis is usually just visual inspection. You can do an anoscopy if you needed to, but uh, usually just visual inspection. You can see the hemorrhoid. You can also do a D DRE if needed or a fecal cold blood test. Treatment. If it's non-thrombosed, it's going to be always just a sit spas, stool softeners, high fiber, diet high fluids, you can also give them maybe a topical hydrocortisone, and if needed, a hemor hemorrhoidectomy if they're reoccurring, for example. But always start with your cyst baths, okay? So it's always going to be conservative, conservative treatment first, so I always have these questions, cyst baths. Uh, internal, you can do rubber, rubber band ligation if needed. If it's thrombosed, then you would do an elliptical excision. But usually what I saw was a rubber band ligation if needed, if the patient was not responding to the sitz baths and the stool softeners and the high fiber diets, but it's usually conservative, conservative treatment first. Okay guys, so let's go on to anal fissures. So anal fissures, it's going to be a tear of the anal canal below the dentate line. It's the most common anal rectal disease and most common cause of anal pain and bleeding. Uh, it's, most, it's commonly found in infants, middle-aged adults, uh, with the most common location found in the posterior midline of the anal canal, usually due to local trauma, so large stools, childbirth, anal sex, use of cathartics, and secondary causes can be something like Crohn's disease, um, tuberculosis, sarcoidosis, leukemia, HIV, syphilis, chlamydia. Signs and symptoms, patient will have rectal pain at rest. Um, they can have severe pain, which can be exacerbated with going to the restroom. Once again, these patients will avoid going to the restroom because it's really painful to go to the restroom. They can have some anal bleeding, hematocoesia, constipation. And basically what you'll see on physical examination is that you'll see a longitudinal tear in the anal dorm. If it's acute, it'll be a fresh superficial laceration. If it's chronic, it'll have raised edges with exposed white fibers. Diagnosis, uh, visualing is usually not required um, for the diagnosis. You can do a DRE, but you don't need to. An anoscopy is never performed because this is really painful. You don't want to hurt the patient. And usually the treatment is that most of these resolve spontaneously, so you really don't give, have to give any treatment for them. You want to do the same thing as the hemorrhoids, is sits bath, make sure that they're eating a lot of fiber in their diet so they don't become constipated or they're not straining when they go to the restroom. Analgesics like lidocaine, stool softeners. Second line, you can do topical nitroglycerin if needed. And then alternative if needed, you can do something like a Botox surgery, like a sphincterotomy. Chronic, uh, you want to make sure that you further evaluate them to exclude any secondary causes of the fissures. So let's go on to anal rectal abscess and fistula, which is an infection of the spaces. And a fistula is a connection between two epithelial surfaces, with the most common site being the posterior rectal wall. So what are some causes of 
fistulas and abscesses. So it's going to be a bacterial infection of a blocked anal gland, with the most common bacterial infections being E. coli, proteus, strep, staph, bacteroides, and aerobes. Um, anal fissures and Crohn's disease also, right? Because Crohn's disease is transmural, so the inflammation is through the entire intestinal wall or colon, depending on where it is. So this is why these patients can be more prone to fistulas, right? Because a fistula is a connection between two surfaces of epithelium or skin, uh, skin tissue or tissue. And with a huge pro, guys, with E. coli, E. coli is found all over the abdominal area. So usually it's the culprit of any type of infection is going to be E. coli. So just make sure that you know that. So a fistula, it's associated with an abscess. Um, and signs and symptoms is that the patient can have rectal pain worse with sitting, coughing, defecation, throbbing pain, erythema, so redness, swelling. This is for an anal abscess. For a fistula, they'll have that purulent drainage, itching, and tender. So make sure that you know that you have a patient with a history of aerial bowel disease, and then they have some purulent drainage. It's foul smelling, it's itching, and it's tender. Then I would have a fistula in my differential diagnosis. Diagnosis is that you're going to do a perianal exam. You can also do a DRE if needed. So for an abscess, of course, you're going to do an IND, right? Usually for an abscess in the question, it'll say it's a fluctuant, right? Any type of abscess is fluctuant. And fistulas, an idiopathic fistula, usually it's a surgical incision and excision under anesthesia. Um, my doctor did a lot of these in surgery, during my surgery rotation. It was really interesting to see. Uh, fistulotomy also, which is a com complex uh, bryoprosthetic plug. You basically plug it if needed. And pilonidal disease is basically an acute abscess or draining sinus in the sacral coccygeal area, secondary to an obstruction of a hair follicle. So make sure you also know about pilonidal disease. So it's an obstruction of a hair follicle somewhere in the sacral coccygeal area. They're usually asymptomatic until it becomes infected. And treatment for this is also an incision of drainage. If needed, you can do a pilonidal cyst uh, cystotomy or excision of the sinus tract and also a cyst marsipulization. So once again, fistulas, usually surgical incision and excision under anesthesia. It's going to be usually presenting with a patient that has a purulent drainage, itching, and tender. It's usually uh, due to a connection between two epithelial surfaces versus a, uh, an abscess. It's going to be a fluctuant mass, right? These are usually just IND. The patient will have rectal pain. It's something really embarrassing for the patient also. And these, these smell. These smell a lot, guys. These smell so bad. Okay, so let's go on to hepatocellular carcinoma. So this is a malignant cancer of the liver, right? And it is 80% cause of primary liver cancers. Most common cause is a viral hepatitis, B and C. And it's very rare in the U.S. So there's two types. You have your non-fibrolamellar, which is the most common. And then you have your fibrolamellar. Uh, High-risk areas are usually Africa and Asia, since, like I said, it's very rarely found in the U.S., the non fibrolamellar is most commonly associated with uh, hepatitis B and C and cirrhosis. It's unresectable and they have a very short survival time. A fibrolamellar, on the other side, is uh, most often resectable. That's, they have a longer survival rate and it's most commonly found in adolescents and young adults. So what you have to know about this is that basically viral hepatitis B and C have a high occurrence of causing hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, I didn't have too many questions on this one, but just make sure you know it just in case. Risk factors are cirrhosis, also hemochromatosis. Make sure that you know that hemochromatosis can cause liver cancer. Uh, Wilson's disease also, cigarette smoking, diabetes mellitus type 2. Size and symptoms, the patient will be complaining of abdominal pain, hepatomegaly, weight loss, anorexia, fatigue, portal hypertension, ascites, jaundice, splenomegaly. Diagnosis is that you're going to start with an abdominal CT scan with uh, triple face scanning, but the definitive, of course, what is it going to be? A biopsy. So you're going to do a liver biopsy. You can do an ultrasound to make sure you're monitoring those high-risk patients that, for example, have hep uh, hepatitis B or C. This one was another one I had a question on, high yield, is that they'll have elevation of alpha fetoprotein. So make sure that you know that. Make sure you, that you know the tumor markers that are associated with the cancers, like we described earlier. CEA is for colon cancer. And for um, hepatocellular carcinoma, it's going to be your AFP or your alpha fetoprotein. So that's why you're monitoring these Make sure, ensuring that they're not elevating.
Treatment is gonna be, of course, what liver resection, resecting the area, or if needed, even a liver transplant, and chemo and radiation if it's metastasized to any other area. Jaundice. So what is jaundice? Jaundice is that yellowing, right, of the body, of certain areas of the skin. It's typically more common in the upper body than in the lower body, which I found really interesting. It can be due to several causes, whether it's uh, cancer, whether it's uh, hepatitis, um, whether it's any of the viral causes like um, uh, <clears throat> hepatitis B and C, hepatitis, even hepatitis A. Also, it can be due to some type of uh, hemolytic anemia, right? So those blood cells that are just bursting in, in your body can uh, release <clears throat> and can cause you to become uh, jaundiced. Also, they can have some type of uh, biliary obstruction, right? That can be causing that. So bilirubin, uh, unconjugated and indirect, is insoluble and cannot be excreted. <clears throat> so make sure that you know that you have your bilirubin, right? Your unconjugated is indirect and cannot be excreted. Uh, these are the ones that usually can go up and actually cause the yellowing of the eyes, the jaunt of the eyes. And you have to be careful because these can, these can actually cross the... Um, brain barrier and can cause even uh, encephalopathy. You also have your conjugated and direct bilirubin, which is soluble, and this one can be extruded. And this one, basically, you'll see this more in your pediatric rotation, but it's good to review it right now. Uh, physiological jaundice is usually days two to seven in newborns, and it peaks on day five because the newborn is still, they're still growing, right? They're still uh, developing um, certain organs, as, and so this is why sometimes they become jaundiced, which is usually normal. But after day seven, then that's when you're kind of like, okay, you know what? There's something more serious going on if a newborn is still presenting with jaundice. Sometimes if the patient has uh, too many red blood cells in the circulation, like I said, these can lice and this can release bilirubin and they can cause jaundice. So that your hemolytic anemias also in newborns. So make sure that you also take this into consideration if their jaundice has not gone away after seven days. So hemolytic disease of the newborn, for example, production and placental transfer of maternal anti-RH antibodies from the RH negative mom to the RH positive body uh, baby. So of course, this is causing the blood cells to rupture. Pernicterous unconjugated bilirubin collects in the basal ganglia. That's what I was discussing earlier. Uh, it can cause brain damage and death. Uh, treatment for this is usually phototherapy. That's interesting, right? They'll usually put a baby and it's basically like a uh, sun sunscreening or tanning right for the baby and they just have that phototherapy which will help them um, make sure that they move their unconjugated blue uh, blue into conjugating that will decrease all that uh, cirrhosis i mean cirrhosis sorry jaundice and some of the genetic causes of jaundice uh, you have uh, gilbert and Krig krigler najar syndrome which basically is an increase in unconjugated bilirubin. Uh, usually these are benign, so they, ne they don't need to be treated. And then you have Dubin-Johnson syndrome, which is increased in conjugated bilirubin. So make sure that you know the difference between both of these because you'll definitely have a question. How I memorize them is that Gilbert and krigler najar are uncool, right, unconjugated, but Dubin is very cool or contently cool, uh, which is conjugated bilirubin. So how do you diagnose this? You want to make sure that you're looking at their LFTs, make sure that they don't have any type of um, maybe cancer, cirrhosis. You want to do a liver ultrasound, looking for any masses. You want to check both their total direct and indirect bilirubin to see whether it's they're having unconjugated levels of bilirubin increased or conjugated levels of bilirubin increased. And treatment is usually watchful waiting. Sometimes, like I said, in newborns, it tends to resolve spontaneously. If it's due to hepatitis, like A, which is... Uh, the viral hepatitis that is very curable, then um, it can resolve once the virus has gone away. Okay, guys, so let's go into cholelithiasis. This is my favorite. I love cholelithiasis. I love cholecystitis. So cholelithiasis are just gallstones in the gallbladder. So there were some residents that I work with that they still kept getting cholelithiasis and cholelithiasis confused. So just make sure that you know the difference between these. So cholelithiasis is just basically gallstones in the gallbladder. The patient can be symptomatic or asymptomatic, but they basically don't cause anything until they start moving down 
into the bile duct, but cholelithiasis, just gallstones in the gallbladder. The causes, you're going to have your five Fs, so fat, 40, female, fertile, and fair. So these are most commonly found in women. Uh, like I said, your patient described is going to be a female that is uh, usually obese, older than 40, your Fs, right? Female, fertile, and fair. So usually like complex uh, Caucasians. And also patients that are on estrogen or oral contraceptive use also. So there's different types of gallstones. You have your cholesterol, you have your pigment, and then you have your mixed. So for your cholesterol, you'll have yellow to green. That's the color that's going to be of the stones. It's going to be more commonly found in patients that are, are obese, that are diabetic, they're on uh, oral contraceptives, if they've had multiple pregnancies, if they have Crohn's, old age, and Native Americans. This is really huge. I had a question on this asking you on the etiology. It's very common in Native Americans. So cholelithiasis and cholecystitis is very common in Native Americans. Also, if a patient has cirrhosis, uh, cystic fibrosis, pigmented, on the other hand, stones, they're black stones, and it's usually due to hemolysis. So whenever there's a lot of blood that is just blood cells that are just breaking down. Um, also, alcoholic cirrhosis, and then brown stones are usually due to biliary tract infections. And then you have your mix, which is usually the most common ones. Um, that basically you have both cholesterol and pigment, and it's like it's the majority of the stones. So signs and symptoms, most of these patients, like I said, are asymptomatic. They tend to have that biliary colic, which is temporary obstruction of the duct, right upper quadrant or epigastric pain, pain after meals at night, which is one of the pepinomonic for cholelithiasis is that they have pain after they eat like a fatty food. They'll also have the positive Boa sign, right, which is a uh, pain to the shoulder, <clears throat> which is basically the right scapula. So this is a symptom of cholelithiasis. And how you diagnose this is which, with an abdominal ultrasound. So if it asks you what is the next best step in diagnosis, it would be an ultrasound, right upper quadrant ultrasound. Um, you can also do a CT or MRI if needed, but it's usually an ultrasound. And for asymptomatic, like I said, no treatment is usually needed. But if they do have recurrent bouts of pain, then you can do surgery. But usually there's no treatment needed for um, cholelithiasis. So now we move on to cholelithiasis. So cholelithiasis is gallstones in the common bile duct. Uh, causes are primary origin in, these tend to origin in the common bile duct. They're pigmented versus secondary, which is the most common cause, which is 95% of all cases which originate in the gallbladder, and they're mixed, or they're cholesterol stones. So signs and symptoms, patients can be uh, asymptomatic for years. They can have right upper quadrant pain, epigastric pain. They can become jaundiced, right, because those stones are in the bile duct, which is causing um, bilirubin to become, to increase. It's not being excreted, so that's why it's going to cause jaundice. The patient can also present <clears throat> with uh, life-threatening complications sometimes if it causes like an infection. Diagnosis, you're going to do labs. You'll see an elevated total and direct bilirubin, right? Because anything that is prehepatic is going to be unconjugated or even in the liver is going to be unconjugated. But once it passes the liver and, it's art, and the liver has done its job and it's conjugated and now it's going through the ducts, then it's going to become conjugated, okay? So like I said, anything that is before the liver, it's going to be usually unconjugated or prehepatic. And then you have your intrahepatic, which is within the liver. And then you have your posthepatic, which is once it's gone through the liver, it's become conjugated. And now it just needs to go and get into the ileum or to the intestine. And if there's any blockage in those ducts, then that's when you have unconjugated, I mean, I'm sorry, conjugated bilirubin, which is the case in cholelithiasis, is that you'll have elevated total direct bilirubin, which is also known as uh, co conjugated bilirubin, your alkaline phosphatase will be increased. So one of the key things for alkaline phosphatase is that whenever there's some type of obstruction going on, you'll have alkaline phosphatase, which is increased. So if you do labs and you see alkaline phosphatase, you know, hmm, there's some type of obstruction going somewhere. Something's going on, some type of obstruction in the ducts or somewhere. And you can also do a right upper quadrant ultrasound, but the gold standard for cholelithiasis is an ERCP. It's a gold standard for diagnosis and treatment because when you do this, you can see 
where the obstruction is occurring and what duct, and you can actually even remove the stone also. So treatment, like I said, it's going to be ERCP with sphincterotomy and stone extraction with stent placement. Uh, you can even do a lap coli if needed, but usually your ERCP is going to be your gold standard for diagnosis and also for treatment. Some of the complications of common bile duct stones are cholangitis, right? So we'll discuss that. That's something that's severe. The patient can become septic with cholangitis. Obstructive jaundice, because that conjugated blue rumen is not becoming excreted. It's stuck there in the bile ducts. Acute pancreatitis. Sometimes that stone will be stuck where the pancreas is, and it can cause also a pancre pancreatitis, right? Inflammation of the pancreas due to an infection. And also biliary cirrhosis or even biliary colic. So once again, cholidocolithiasis are gallstones in the common bile duct, okay? So you have the liver, you have the gallbladder, the gallbladder has a cystic duct, right? And then you have the, the liver here, the cystic duct, and then the ducts from the liver come, and then they join together to form a common bile duct. The common bile duct keeps going down, it goes into the ileum. If there's any obstruction in the common bile duct, this is what it is. Cholidocolithiasis is gallstones in there. So let's go on to acute cholecystitis. So acute cholecystitis is inflammation of the gallbladder. That's when you have a gallstone that has been that has left the gallbladder and has gotten stuck in the um, cystic duct. Okay. So like I said, you have the gallbladder, you have the cystic duct, and then you have the hepatic ducts that come and they join, and then you have the common bile duct that keeps going down, and then you have the pancreas over here, and then it will empty out into the ileum, and so. If you have an obstruction here where the cystic duct, which is way above before where the common bile duct, this is where you have acute cholecystitis. And any type of obstruction causes stasis. What does stasis cause? Stasis causes infection. So acute cholecystitis is inflammation of the gallbladder. It's a gallstone lodged in the cystic duct. Um, and it causes inflammation. So what is the etiology? Once again, it's going to be your female, your, your uh, Fs, right? Your fat female, fertile, and 40, okay? And it's very common, once again, also in Native Americans also. Uh, the patient will be complaining of right upper quadrant pain. So what sign did we say that was? That was a Murphy sign, right? Right upper quadrant pain is Murphy sign. McBurney's point is right lower quadrant pain. Do not get those confused. The patient can also have the BOA sign, which is the scapular pain, right? And the patient will be having uh, epigastric pain, fever, leukocytosis, uh, nausea, vomiting, anorexia, right up with quadrant tenderness. Most of these patients will see them in the ER, they're in a lot of pain. Tenderness, rebound tenderness, um, positive morphine side, like I said, which is basically an inspiratory arrest during uh, depalpation. So it's going to be right up with quadrant pain. You tell the patient to inhale, and then you uh, you place pressure under the scap the the rib area, and then they'll be like, oh, it's painful, and that's going to be a positive uh, Murphy sign. The patient will also have hypoactive bowel sounds. They'll have a positive BOA sign, which is a pain that radiates to the right shoulder, to the right scapula. So your initial diagnosis for this patient is going to be a right upper quadrant ultrasound. Okay? You'll see a thickened uh, wall. Uh, this, it's going to be distended. You'll see stones. You'll see some fluid in there. But the gold standard is going to be a HIDA scan or a CT scan. So gold standard, HIDA or CT scan. Make sure that you are reading the question correctly and it's asking you what it's asking you if it asks you what is the next best step in diagnosis and you're going to choose ultrasound if it's asking you what is the best or gold standard then it's going to be high to scan right and treatment's going to be you're going to admit the patient at supportive care uh, you're going to give them iv fluids nothing by mouth iv antibiotics analgesics and of course cholecystectomy you're going to have the gallbladder removed we had so many of these my surgeon my surgeon did so many of these and they take they don't even take that long. I think they take like 15 minutes. He just goes in there. It's a laparotomy. Basically, they just uh, put these tubes in your abdominal area and th th these scopes. And he just goes in there and he basically cuts it and he takes it out in a little bag and it's done. It's super quick. It's not very invasive. So now we're going to go on to chronic cholecystitis. So we have acute and chronic so chronic is due to inflammation of the gallbladder. It's damage to the gallbladder walls due to repeat attacks. So it's uh, that repeat stone that's getting stuck there and it's causing that attacks and those inflammations. Um, and these walls become so thick and scarred 
and the patient will basically present the same as acute. Um, so basically they'll have that right upper quadrant pain, epigastric pain, fever, leukocytosis, nausea and vomiting. Uh, they'll have that positive uh, Murphy sign. Diagnosis, it's difficult because patients can be severe. They can be very ill or they can have other medical problems. And treatment, of course, is going to be the same thing. They're going to have a cholecystectomy. If they're too old for the surgery, then you can do a percutaneous drain of drainage of the gallbladder. So cholangitis. Make sure that you know this. I had a lot of questions on cholangitis. It's basically infection of the biliary tract, uh, usually due to secondary to obstruction. So acute cholecystitis can turn into cholangitis. A uh, patient will have usually biliary stasis and it's due to bacterial overgrowth and this is life-threatening. This is an emergency, okay, because the patient can become septic. What is the most common cause is uh, cholecystitis. Okay? What is the most common bacteria? Remember I told you it's E. coli, since E. coli is found in the abdominal area. So the patient's going to present with Charcot's triad. Make sure that you know this. I had so many questions on this, guys. Uh, they're going to have that triad of fever, right upper quadrant pain, and jaundice, okay? So if you're reading a question, right, and you see that the patient has jaundice, it sounds like mm, maybe this might be cholecystitis, and then you see jaundice. Jaundice is not associated with cholecystitis. Then that's going to tell you, you know what, this is maybe cholangitis. Fever, right upper quadrant pain, and jaundice, Charcot's triad. Now, they can also present with Raynaud's pentad, okay? This is more severe. It's basically the same thing. It'll have fever, right upper quadrant pain, jaundice, but they'll have septic shock and an altermental status. So make sure that you know the difference between both of them because they might, they might ask you like Reynolds or which one's Charcot's. Charcot's fever, right upper quadrant pain, right? Jaundice, Reynolds is Charcot's plus altermental status and septic shock. So it's more severe. So diagnosis, it's gonna be an ultrasound. It's gonna be initial once again. But the gold standard is going to be an ERCP because you can go in there and you can remove the stone if needed. It's both therapeutic and diagnostic. Treatment is going to be an emergency treatment. You want to do blood cultures in case the patient becomes septic. IV broad spectrum antibiotics like ampicillin and sulpobactam. Fluids, you want to monitor, their, monitor them, monitor their urine output also. And you want to decompress the common bile duct whenever the patient is stable. Uh, you can do, do it either through catheter drainage or an ERCP or a laparotomy. And complications of this, if it's not treated, is a hepatic abscess. This is the most serious and it has a high mortality rate. So next we're going to go on to acute pancreatitis, which is a sudden inflammation of the pancreas. Basically, the pancreas is eating itself. Uh, there's a cool picture I found online where it's literally like a pancreas. He's crying. He's just like eating. And the gallbladder is asking him, like, why are you, why are you doing this? And he's like, I just can't help it. So uh, it's, it's something that I just memorized. Um, basically, auto-digestion happens. It's, the pancreas starts to destroy itself by digesting its own enzymes. So etiology, uh, make sure you know this also. Most common causes are gallstones and alcohol abuse. Okay, these are the most common causes of acute pancreatitis. Gallstones and alcohol abuse. Other causes, this can be idiopathic, uh, interesting scorpion stings, which is found was just really interesting, autoimmune, mumps, steroids, trauma, and even medications like a tenofovir. So the patient's going to be presenting with epigastric pain. So whenever you read a question and it says epigastric pain that's radiating to the back, make sure that you have acute pancreatitis on your differential diagnosis. It's going to be worse supine after meals. They'll have nausea and vomiting, anorexia, fever, leukocytosis, tachycardia, hypotension, abdominal tenderness, distension, decreased bowel sounds like ileus. Sometimes you'll also find your, your signs if it's hemorrhagic. You'll find your colon sign, right? Colon sign is usually ecchymosis over the umbilical area. So you'll have like purple around the umbilicus. And then you'll have your gray Turner sign, which is your flank ecchymosis. So on the flanks, on the sides right here, it'll be purple or red. You have your fox sign, which is your groin area. It'll be red also, so make sure you're very familiar with these. Diagnosis is usually a clinical diagnosis, but you're going to confirm with the CT scan. You can do an abdominal x-ray or an ultrasound. On your labs, you'll see elevated serum amylase, which is the most common one, okay? So make sure you're reading the question correctly. Elevated serum amylase is the most common, but the most specific is light-based, right? Because you can find amylase in everything. You can find amylase also in mumps. 
So amylase can be elevated in, in mumps also. So elevated serum amylase, so you're like, okay, you know what? This might be pancreatitis. And then you see increased lipase. Okay, it is pancreatitis. So pancreas, uh, for pancreatitis, lipase is more specific. So if you have a question and asks you which one of these is most specific, don't do the error that I did and choose amylase because it's not because it's not amylase. And I'm like, okay, it's amylase. No, it's going to be lipase. So ERCP indication, you can use it if it's due to a gallstone, right? Because the most common causes are gallstones. If it's, there's a gallstone that's lodged there and it's causing inflammation of the pancreas. And treatment is usually, though, supportive. Uh, you want to make sure that you're, getting, you're giving them pain management. You're giving them a lot of IV fluids, electrolytes. You want to monitor their calcium. And if it's severe, you want to give them crystalloid infusion. And you want to admit them to the ICU, give them enteral nutrition, give them prophylactic antibiotics because you want to prevent infection because this has a high mortality rate. Also, prognosis, Ransom criteria, make sure that you know this. If it's more than three or four, you monitor them in, in ICU because they can have a necrosis risk. And what is your Ransom criteria? If their age is greater than 55, if their white blood cell count is more than 16,000, if their glucose is more than 200, if their lactate dehydrogenous or LDH is more than 350, and their AST levels are more than 250. So chronic pancreatitis. This is persistent inflammation, patients having persistent bouts of pancreatitis over and over again. Same thing as we had talked about in chronic cholecystitis, the pancreas becomes fibrotic and there's alteration of the ducts. So there's stricture dilation, and this is usually irreversible, right? Because it's scarring. Usually the most common causes for this are due to chronic alcoholism, sometimes a hereditary or uh, tropical or idiopathic pancreatitis also. Signs and symptoms, it's gonna be chronic unrelenting pain with flare-ups, uh, epigastric pain, once again, right? That radiates to the back. They'll have the nausea and vomiting that's worse by drinking or eating, weight loss, steatorrhea. CT scan is usually the treatment of choice, or I'm sorry, the testing of choice. You can do an abdominal x-ray that will show you calcifications. And ERCP is the gold standard once again, but it's very invasive, so we rarely do these. And labs aren't very helpful in diagnosis versus they were helpful in acute pancreatitis. Treatment is usually um, analgesics, bowel rest, so very similar to acute pancreatitis. Uh, pancreatic enzymes, you can give them some H2 blockers, insulin. You want to make sure that they stop alcohol and they have frequent small low-fat meals. Surgery is usually done to relieve abdominal pain, so you can do a pancreato uh, jejunosomy, which is the most common one, or pancreatic resection if needed. So pancreatic cancer. This cancer is a really sad cancer. It has a really high morbidity rate, mortality rate, and it's quick to um, kill the patient. So pancreatic cancer, you have the head of the pancreas, right? You have the body, and then you have the tail. It's more commonly found in the head. And that's why it has a really high rate of mortality. Because in the head, what is the head of the pancreas connected to? You have the ducts there, you have the ileum, you have the liver here. I mean, there's a lot of organs that are there. So it's easier if it metastasizes there to go to other areas. Versus if the cancer is in the tail of the pancreas, then it has a higher rate of maybe for the patient surviving because you can easily resect them or you can resect the towel or even the body. But if it's a head, it's a lot harder. And then on top of that, if you resect the towel, you still have part of the pancreas that is still functioning versus if it's at the head, then you have to resect the entire thing and you don't have the pancreas. And so body, like the head's more common, 75%, body, 20%, tail, 5 to 10%. It's more commonly found in patients that are older. If they're older than 60 years old, it's very rare if they're younger than 40. And it's more commonly found in African-Americans. Risks, this is huge. Make sure that you know this. Smoking is a huge risk for pancreatic cancer. Diabetes mellitus is a huge risk also. Chronic pancreatitis, heavy alcohol use, chemical exposure, but for sure smoking. Um, is a huge risk factor for pancreatic cancer. Patient will be complaining of vague abdominal pain. They'll be complaining of jaundice, weight loss, anorexia, weakness, fatigue. This one's big for pancreatic cancer, and it's usually unique, is that they'll have migratory thrombophlebitis. So make sure that you know this, migratory thrombophlebitis. And I'll be honest with you, I'm going to look this up because <clears throat> I keep forgetting what it is. 
So it's also known as Trousseau syndrome. It's basically a clot that moves around the body. It's from one leg to the other. And like I said, this is most commonly found and it's pathognomonic for pac pancreatic cancer. So if you read that in the question stem, then make sure that you're thinking about pancreatic cancer. Also, um, another thing that the patient presents with is that they'll have the curvosier sign. This is big. Uh, they'll have that palpable gallbladder. So it's like an inflamed palpable gallbladder that you're able to palpate on physical examination. So make sure you know that it's also pathognomonic for pancreatic cancer. Diagnosis ERCP is the most sensitive, but CT scan is usually preferred because you wanna see if it's spread anywhere else. Now two more markers, make sure you know this, CA199, right? So we said for liver cancer, it was what? It was the alpha fetoprotein. And then we said for colon cancer, it was CA. For pancreatic cancer, it is CA19, hyphen nine. So make sure that you know that. Usually treatment, if it's resectable, you can do the Whipple procedure. Um, but usually if it's unresectable and it's obstructed the biliary, then you can do a uh, ERCP with scent. Uh, poor prognosis, it's advanced and incurable at time of the diagnosis. Um, most patients tend to die within months of the diagnosis since they tend to be resectable, since most of them are commonly found in the head of the pancreas. If they are resected, they still have about a five-year survival rate. So let's go on to pancreatic pseudocyst. So pancreatic pseudocyst is a collection of fluid containing pancreatic enzymes, blood, and tissue outside of the pancreas. These are usually benign. Uh, most, the most common cause for these is acute pancreatitis, so make sure you know that. Most common cause of a pancreatic pseudocyst is acute pancreatitis. Uh, if they have gallstones, abdominal trauma, alcohol abuse, it's more commonly found in mouse. And usually, once they had an acute pancreati uh, pancreatitis attack, uh, you'll see a pancreatic pseudocyst several weeks later. If they do have symptoms, they can complain of dual abdominal pain. Uh, epigastric abdominal mass, anorexia, nausea, and digestion. They might have some scleral icterus. Peritoneal symptoms if it's ruptured, fever. Usually the diagnosis is uh, CT with contrast. It will show a well-circumscribed fluid collection. They'll have an increased amylase and lipase, bilirubin and LFTs. And usually a cystic fluid analysis will show low levels of CEA, low fluid viscosity, and high amylase. Treatment, they're benign, so they tend to resolve by themselves. If you need to, you can do NG feeding, PPIs, octreotride. This will help decrease the pancreatic secretions. Uh, second line, it's going to be a pseudocyst, uh, endoscopic drainage, or percutaneous catheter drainage. And then third line is going to be surgery if it's become necrotic. But usually they tend to resolve by themselves. I don't think I've had a question that's asked me for the treatment. Um, I usually just put that they resolve by themselves, but they're benign. So let's go into hernias. I had a lot of questions on this on both my pediatric and surgery rotations, so make sure that you know them well and make sure that you know the pathophysiology and the anatomy of them. So a hernia is usually a def defect or weakness in the muscular or facial layer of the abdomen. It allows tissue to exit a space um, it is normally contained in. So you have several types. You have your direct inguinal, your indirect inguinal, your femoral, your incisional or ventral, and your umbilical. So let's start with direct inguinal. The way I memorize this is that direct D is found in old dudes. <laughs> so direct inguinal hernias are more commonly found in older people. So D, direct, old dudes, D, dude. That's how I memorize it, might help you out. So direct inguinal is usually due to a defect in the transversalis fascia and Hesselbach's triangle. So Hesselbach's triangle, if there's a weakness there, it's due to a direct inguinal hernia. It's medial to the inferior epigastric vessels. Make sure you know that. How I memorize that is that MDs don't lie. So M, medial to the inferior epigastric for MD, medial, direct, don't lie. So lateral, indirect, that's how I memorize. MDs don't lie. So medial to the inferior epigastric vessels, it's going to be direct. Okay. If it's lateral, lie lateral to inferior epigastric vessels, don't lie, it's gonna be <coughs> indirect. So with indirect, with direct inguinal hernia, uh, the Hesselbeck's triangle, make sure that you also know what it consists of. So you have the rectus sheath, which is going to be medially, 
you'll have the inferior inferior epiaster vessel, which is going to be laterally, so it's going to be laterally over here. And then inferiorly, you're going to have the inguinal ligament. So inguinal ligament, you'll have the rectus sheath edge medially, and then the inferior epiastric vessel laterally. So for indirect inguinal hernia, this is a deep inguinal ring. Uh, usually goes into the process vaginalis. So with this hernia, you'll see it going into the scrotum, okay, for indirect. Versus direct, it will not go in the scrotum. So if you're reading a question sum and it says that on physical examination, you see that uh, the hernia went into the scrotum, then it, it's going to be indirect, not direct, because direct does not go into the scrotum. So this can be due to congenital trauma. It descends into the scrotum, like I said and it's lateral to the inferior epigastric vessel. So MDs don't lie, that's how I memorize it, direct, medial, um, indirect, lateral. Femoral, uh, this is actually the, so the most common hernia is femoral hernias. And these are most commonly found in women. And it's usually through the femoral canal. These have a higher risk of incarceration. So if they ask you which one of these hernias have the highest risk of incarceration, it's gonna be femoral. They have the highest risk of incarceration and strangulation, and they're located in the upper thigh, medial to the femoral vein. And then you have the incisional and ventral. Uh, this is usually due to after a surgery, so wherever the surgery is, right, the skin becomes very weak, and then it's possible to have herniation from there. They're usually asymptomatic, and sometimes they increase in size with straining. And then you have umbilical. These tend to be very common in little babies and they tend to go away with time. So these are usually through the fibromuscular umbilical ring location is the umbilicus and they repair um, by themselves usually before two years old but if they if they persist after five years old then you have to have surgery for these. So treatment. If it's a reducible or asymptomatic hernia you can just monitor them. If it's an irreducible hernia then you do something like broad IV antibiotics, fluids, and an emergent uh, surgery, so uh, herniography. Strangulated, you're going to do severe pain. So the patient's going to have be complaining if it's strangulated with severe pain, nausea and vomiting. It's going to be painful because it's impairing blood flow, right? It can, it can become ischemic, the bowel, necrotic. Uh, you'll see some skin changes overlying. And then if it becomes incarcerated, right, uh, this is more severe than strangulated. They'll have pain, nausea, vomiting. So if it is strangulated, the patient will have severe pain, nausea, and vomiting. Uh, this is going to be painful because it's impairing blood flow, right? Uh, so the bowel can become ischemic, necrotic. You'll see some skin changes overlying, some ecchymosis. And then you have your incarcerated. The patient will have pain, nausea, and vomiting, adhesions from between hernia and intestinal wall, they'll have a firm, painful, non-reducible uh, by direct manual pressure. So once again, if it's irreducible, you're gonna give them antibiotics and emergent hernia herniography, but if it's reducible or if they're asymptomatic, just make sure you monitor them. So now we're gonna go into an acute GI bleed. So this can be either visible or occult. Um, usually it's not detected by a fecal occult blood test. So there's different types. There's your upper GI bleed and then there's your lower GI bleed. Upper GI bleed is bleeding above the ligament of trites. So this is going to be your landmark to distinguish between upper and lower is going to be the ligament of trites. So make sure that you're very familiar. You might have a question about this. So upper GI bleed is going to be bleeding that is above the ligament of trites. The causes of this is going to be peptic ulcer disease, right? You can have ulceration that will cause a tear entire tear through the mucosal tissue. You can have erosive esophagitis, your Mallory Weiss tear, which is that vomiting of blood or repeated vomiting that can cause a tear in the esophagus. Um, esophagus, you can have esophageal var varices, um, chronic use of NSAIDs like ibuprofen, because what did we discuss earlier? NSAIDs are related to having and side effects of causing uh, ulcers and also um, GI bleeds. So aspirin, for example, also medications like clopidogrel, anticoagulants. Symptoms of upper GI bleed, it's going to be hematemesis, right? Uh, this makes sense because usually in the esophagus, you're going to be vomiting blood because it's closer to the oral cavity. So 
<clears throat> you can also have Molina, which is black tarry stools. So this is how I differentiate upper and lower GI pleat. Anything that's closer to the oral cavity, right, it's going to be bright red blood. Now, by the time that blood gets down to the rectum and you defecate, it's going to be a darker blood. So that's why you'll see Molina, which is black tarry stools. Tarry stools, it's older blood. So once you see that, you're going to be like, you know what, it's an upper GI bleed. How are you going to diagnose this? You're going to do an upper endoscopy. You're going to see where the terrace, any GI bleed is an emergency, okay? And treatment for this is going to be, you can do a coagulate the blood vessel, and if the bleeding still continues, then you're going to repeat an endoscopy treatment, or you're going to do a surgical innovation like ligation, okay? Lower GI bleed. So what is it? Once again, we said the ligament of trites is your anatomy point. If it's below the ligament of trites, it's the lower GI bleed. Uh, the causes is colorectal cancer until proven otherwise. So the most common cause of lower GI bleeds is colorectal cancer. You can also have diverticulosis, hemorrhoids, NSAIDs, once again, aspirin, clopidogrel, anticoagulants. The patient's going to be complaining of hematoquesia, which is bright red blood in the rectum or in your stools, right? Because it's closer to the anal canal. That's why you have brighter red blood versus an upper GI bleed. It takes a while to come down. By the time it comes down there, it's going to be a darker um, color of blood. You can also have melina. And treatment with this is that it can stop spontaneously, but usually is supportive. You want to do a colonoscopy to make sure that there's not any polyps, or if you find any polyps, to make sure that you excise them. Uh, you can do injection, laser, cautery. And last resort is usually surgical resection of the involved area. So what labs are you going to order for any GI bleed, whether it's upper or lower? You're going to do a stool guayac for a cold blood. You're going to do a CBC, okay? You're going to do a coagulation panel, so you're going to look at their platelet count, their PT, their PTT, their INR, whether it's medications that are causing the bleeding. LFTs, you're going to do a renal function, look at their electrolytes, BUN, creatinine. And you can also do an anoscopy or proctosigmoidoscopy to make sure that it's not anything in the anal canal. You do a colonoscopy to see, once again, if it's any type of polyp that's probably bleeding. This is both diagnostic and therapeutic. You can do an arteriography, which locates the area or the blood vessel that's bleeding. You can do an explore, exploratory laparotomy. This is last resort. So say you've done all this and you don't know where the bleed is coming for, from, then you do a laparotomy. Treatment, it's going to be your ABCs, right? You're going to protect the airway. You're going to give them transfusions if they need, um, your breathing, etc. And you're going to treat the underlying condition. So whatever it is, whether it's an esophageal varus that just... Um, ruptured, then you're going to go in there and ligate it. Whether it's a peptic ulcer that just ruptured ulcer, you're going to go in there and fix it. So it just depends on the underlying condition. And also make sure you give them IV fluids and transfusions because they're losing blood. So you want to make sure that you keep them hemodynamically stable. So now we're going to go into anorexia. Okay, uh, I saw a lot of patients with anorexia and it's sad because these patients can have comorbid symptom, comorbid problems also and they can't go into surgery because of <clears throat> their anorexia. They have to make sure that they're at appropriate BMI and they're healthy or else the patient can pass away during surgery. So what is anorexia? Basically, the patient is preoccupied with their weight, their body image, and their being thin. Usually, anorexia is associated with OCD. There's two types. You have your restri restricting and your binge eating one. So make sure that you do not confuse anorexia, binge eating, or purging with bulimia nervosa. So with bulimia nervosa, the difference is that in bulimia nervosa, the patient will have a normal BMI versus in anorexia, the patient will have a decreased BMI, right? They'll have a BMI of uh, less than 18, less than 17, 16, 15. You differentiate between bulimia and anorexia, the binging or purging type. So with restricting, uh, weight loss is achieved through diet. So they don't eat, they fast, or they do a lot of exercise. Uh, Binging and purging is that they eat a lot and then they go and they vomit or they use laxatives or enemas or diuretics. So the signs and symptoms, of course, like I said, they're going to have a very low BMI, uh, persistent behaviors that prevent weight gain. They have a disturbed body image. They are in denial. So if you've seen my psychiatry video or if you've already completed your psychiatry rotation, this is going to be ego syntonic, right? So that means that they're happy with the way they are. They don't feel like there's anything wrong with them. 
or they don't think that there's anything wrong with their anorexia or the condition that they have. They can have amenorrhea, cold intolerance, hypothermia, hypotension. They'll be very thin on the physical exam. And on diagnosis, you'll see that they'll have restriction of energy intake. They'll have this intense fear of gaining weight and becoming fat. Labs. This is something really big that you'll see. Definitely, I saw this in my psychiatry and I saw some also in my surgery rotation. Is that their labs are going to be hyponatremic, hypochloremic, and hypokalemic, and they're going to be alkalotic, right? Because they're vomiting. So if it's the purging type, it's going to be a metabolic alkalosis. If they're losing laxatives, it's going to be metabolic acidosis. Okay, so make sure you differentiate between both of them. They also have arrhythmias, QT prolongation, right? Because they're hypokalemic. So hypokalemia can make you prone to having a lot of arrhythmias. They'll have reduced luteinizing hormone, follicular stimulating hormone. This is why they don't have periods. So they're, they're amenorrheic. They'll have low estrogen and testosterone. They'll be hypothyroidic. Um, they'll be hypoglycemic. They'll have osteopenia, so very brittle bones. And sometimes osteoporosis is sometimes not reversible with these patients. It's really sad. So what's your treatment? Treatment's going to be food. You want to feed them. But you also want to make sure that you're feeding them appropriately and not in a quick way where it can cause refeeding syndrome. So you can treat them out, as an outpatient okay? if they have... A low BMI, but not an extremely low BMI. So if it's less than like 18.5, 17, 16, that's fine. But if it's less than 15, then that's when you want to hospitalize them. So you're going to do hospitalized refeeding. Make sure that you're looking at their uh, labs because you want to make sure that you prevent refeeding syndrome. You can do cognitive behavioral therapy, family therapy, uh, supervised waking pro uh, programs. And if they have any depression, you can give them SSRIs. But usually the first line treatment is that food. You want to make sure that you're giving them IV fluids to replenish all those electrolyte imbalances, imbalances that they have. So now we're going to go on to bariatric surgery. So bariatric surgery is a weight loss surgery. Um, it's really big here in the valley where I was rotating at. And it's usually used if a BMI is greater than 40 and the patient has tried everything. So let's say that they tried lifestyle changes. They started on medications that help you lose weight um, they change their diet, they exercise, and it's still not working, then you can resort to weight loss surgery. And interestingly, a lot of insurances cover this because it's, um, it's a life-changing thing and it can help with your diabetes since most of these patients are diabetic. So what it does is that it limits the stomach's holding capacity. Uh, usually, for example, there's different types. You have your sleeve gastrectomy, which is the most common one. It's removal of the greater curvature, it gives you a smaller stomach, and your satiety is achieved quickly due to hormone release of gastric stretching. And then you have your gastric bypass. This is a gold standard one. This is a row and Y procedure. Make sure that you look that up and you're familiar with what that is. And basically, uh, the stomach has about a 30 milliliter holding capacity. So these surgeries, they decrease the, the amount of stomach and this causes the patient not to eat as much or not to be as hungry as much and causes them to lose weight. But the thing with bariatric surgery and what it's known for and what you need to know is that it can cause dumping syndrome. So this is usually unique to bariatric surgery. It's a post gastrectomy syndrome that is due to destruction or bypass of the pyloric sphincter and basically causes rapid emptying of chyme. So how is this patient going to present with a dumping syndrome? Basically, it'll be a patient that just had bariatric surgery. doesn't matter which one. They'll have nausea, vomiting, cramps. They'll have flushing, diarrhea, diaphoresis, palpitations. And this usually happens after eating meal high in fat carbs. So the stomach doesn't have time to digest all of this. And this is why they're having all these symptoms. The diagnosis is usually clinical. But if you need to, you can do an upper GI series like x-rays. You can do a CBC, a CMP, which show that they're hypoglycemics. And treatment versus diet modification, you have to make sure that you edit, educate these patients that had bariatric surgery on what they can and cannot eat and the portions of their meals. This is really important or things like dumping syndrome can occur. So you want to make sure that they're eating high fiber, protein, low fat carbs, small, frequent meals, not large meals. You can give them something like octreotide and if it's severe, then they have to go and become reoperated. So what are some of the post-surgical considerations? Um, is that you want to make sure that you're evaluating them uh, psychiatrically for stability to make sure that they don't have any eating disorders. 
uh, most common complication of bariatric surgery is dehydration. You want to make sure also that you're following up with them because most of these patients can develop vitamin uh, deficiencies and also anemias like a vitamin B12, uh, folate deficiency, iron, zinc, copper, vitamin D, calcium. And the diet, you have to make sure that you educate them on their diet. So usually most of these patients follow up with dietitians. On week one and week two, they start with a clear liquid diet. On week three and week four, it's going to be a pur pureed diet with protein supplements. On and <clears throat> on later on, then they're going to have a soft diet, and then lifelong, it's they're going to stabilize their diet. Okay, guys. So now we are done with GI. So now we're going to go into preoperative and postoperative care. Okay, uh, this is really important, especially for those of you who are going to do primary care. You want to make sure that the patient is well so they can go into surgery that they don't have any comorbidities and if they do to make sure that you get them under control so they can have surgery whether it's an elective surgery or whether it's a surgery that is required or it's needed uh, you have to make sure that your patient is healthy enough to have the surgery that they don't have any cardiac complications any problems breathing any problems with their blood clotting so you want to make sure that you have that all under control also with post operative care right? you want to follow up with these patients make sure that they don't have any complications from the surgery so let's go into my favorite. <laughs> uh, let's go into respiratory acidosis. So what is respiratory acidosis? Respiratory acidosis is when you have an inadequate alveolar ventilation leading to carbon dioxide retention. So you have high COT and low pH, so acidosis. The most common cause is hypoventilation, right? Because you're not letting that COT come out. So you're, you're not breathing as usual and you're keeping it all in. This can be due to apnea, abdominal distension, respiratory arrest, overdose of so patients that are overdosed on medications, right? They tend to have that respiratory depression where they're not breathing as normally as they should be. Airway obstructive, congestive heart failure, pneumonia, cardiac arrest. Some of the signs and symptoms is going to be uh, dyspnea, uh, tachypnea, slow, shallow respirations, confusion, tremors, dizziness, dizziness and tremors. Why? They're not getting air in as they should be, or air out as they should be. Convulsions, warm and flushed skin, altered uh, loss of consciousness, they can become cyanotic. And diagnosis is that you'll see a low pH, a high PCOT, and then a normal bicarb. That's, well, this is an uncompensated. Respiratory alkalosis. This is hyperventilation. This is leading to carbon dioxide deficiency, so hypocapnia, and they'll have low COT, levels and then they'll have a high pH causing alkalosis. The most common cause is going to be hyperventilation. So they'll have, uh, they're breathing too much, whether it's someone that's very, very anxious. That's why whenever a patient is very, very anxious, you have to make sure you tell them to control their breathing or else they're going to pass out. So it's uh, hyperventilation. They might be in severe pain. The patient might have uh, some central nervous system trauma or lesion. They may be pregnant, um, aspirin overdose even. And signs and symptoms is going to be tinnitus, vertigo, dry mouth, blurred vision, rapid, drip, respirations, lightheaded, paresthesias, like the tingling in their extremities, uh, syncope, so passing out, convulsions, coma. Diagnosis is going to be a high pH and a low PCO2, and then their bicarb is going to be normal. Metabolic acidosis. So metabolic acidosis is an excess accumulation of fixed acids in the metabolism or excessive loss of fixed bases. So they have an increased acids, loss of bases. Causes is usually non-ion gap. Um, if it's GI, it's usually due to diarrhea if they're losing a lot of bicarb. Renal tubular acidosis, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, so the medications, total parental nutrition or rehydration and chlorine gas exposure. Nanion, I'm sorry, anion gap, it's going to be due to methanol, uremia, DKA, peraldehyde, acinizide, lactic acidosis, alcohol, rhabdomyolysis, and salicylates, like aspirin. So make sure you know that. What are the causes of non-ion gap and then anion gap? Sun symptoms, it's going to be the Kuzma breathing. So make sure you know what Kuzma breathing is. They can be lethargic, drowsy, stupor, coma, headache flushed or dry skin, peripheral vasodilation, so fruity breath, nausea and vomiting, convulsions. So what does this sound like? Diabetes, right? So diabetes, 
a diabetic patient that's going into maybe DKA, metabolic acidosis, they can have metabolic acidosis, and then they'll have these symptoms of the Kuzma breathing. Kuzma breathing is very pathognomonic for DKA. They'll have that fruity breath, right? Diagnosis is going to be a low pH, a normal PCO2, and a low bicarb if it's uncompensated, and then a base excess uh, that is negative. So they'll lose all their bases. So next one, we're going to go into uh, what is an anion gap. So a normal range of an anion gap is between 9 to 16. If the anion gap is greater than 20, then this is metabolic acidosis. How do you calculate an anion gap? You're going to do the total amount of sodium minus the serum chloride plus the serum bicarb. Okay, And it has to be between 9 to 16, which is normal. If it's increased, like greater than 20, then that's when you have a metabolic acidosis. Or, um, yeah, metabolic acidosis. So now we're going to go into metabolic alkalosis. So this is an accumulation of fixed bases or excessive loss of fixed acids. So you're losing a lot of acid. You have a high pH and then a high bicarb. And etiology of this is vomiting. So remember, we've discussed this several times. Okay, metabolic acidosis is diarrhea. Metabolic alkalosis is vomiting. Uh, due to an NG tube sometimes, diuretics, hypokalemia, Cushing syndrome, hyperaldosteronism. Uh, this is due to increased renal secretion of uh, hydrogen, chloride, and potassium. Signs and symptoms, they'll have a decreased respiratory rate and depth. They'll be very dizzy, prestigious, the Trousseau sign, uh, nausea and vomiting, irritability, convulsions and coma, and dehydrated. So the diagnosis is going to be a high pH, normal CO2, a high bicarb if it's uncompensated, um, and they'll have a uh, base excess that is positive, so accumulation of bases. So now we're going to go into maintenance fluids, okay? So this is where you want to make sure that you provide water and electrolytes um, equal to those that are lost for being alive. And this includes water, glucose, sodium, potassium, and chloride. And 60% of body weight is water. So one third of it is uh, outside of the cells, so it's extracellular fluids. Two thirds is inside of the cells, so intracellular fluids. And then normal, it's going to be your extracellular fluid osmolarity, which is your intracellular fluid osmolar osmolarity, which is water that can move freely between spaces. So let's go into hypovolemia. Hypovolemia is basically isotonic fluid loss from extracellular space. It can progress to hypovolemic shock, right? Because you're losing all that fluid, whether it's through blood loss, whether you're dehydrated. So etiology, excessive fluid loss, like bleeding, said decreased fluid intake, so they're not drinking enough fluids, or they're losing it all. Signs and symptoms of hypovolemia is going to be mental status changes, thirst, tachycardia, delayed capillary refill, orthostatic hypotension, uh, low urine output, cool and pale extremities. Treatment is going to be with fluid replacement, albumin replacement, blood transfusions for hemorrhage, uh, dopamine to maintain blood pressure, and you want to assess their fluids. So basically, for hypovolemia, right, they're losing fluids, so what do you want to do? You want to give them fluids. They're losing blood, you want to give them blood transfusions for their hemorrhage. Hypervolemia is excess fluid in extracellular compartments due to fluid or sodium retention. So they're either, either taking too much, or this can also be due to renal failure. So this usually happens when compensatory mechanisms fail to restore fluid balance. This tends to lead to congestive heart failure, right? Sometimes they'll have that um, extremity, they'll have the edema in their legs. You can see them, they're big, and then you touch on them, and then they'll sunk in, sink in. Um, Signs of symptoms is going to be tachypnea, right? If they have so much fluid, it's compressing the lungs, they have trouble breathing. Dyspnea, crackles, rapid bounding pulse, hypertension, S3 gallop. Okay, what is S3 gallop? Uh, associated with usually associated with systolic dysfunction, right? Which is usually due to uh, dilated uh, cardiomyopathy, where the the heart cannot pump out enough blood to the rest of the body. So this can be also um, a cause of hypervolemia. Acute weight gain, edema. Treatment is just going to be with fluid and sodium restriction, diuretics to make sure you're getting rid of all that excessive fluid. You want to monitor their um, fluid, of course. And you want to monitor their breath sounds, you want to monitor their AVGs and their labs. So now we're going to go into hypernatremia and hypernatremia. So first we're going to go with sodium. So what is the normal range of sodium? It's going to be between 135 to 145. 
Hyponatremia is less than 135. Hypernatremia is greater than 145. And always make sure that you know that water follows sodium. So wherever sodium goes, water follows. Uh, there was a cool experiment that a YouTuber did. He basically put salt in a tube, he put in a water tube, he placed it in, in, in a bin full of water, and you could see how all the water literally went inside the tube and when he took it out, it was full of water. So this is an example, and this is how it works in the body, body is that water follows sodium. So let's start with hyponatremia. Hyponatremia is too little sodium. So once again, we said less than 135 is known to be hyponatremia. Basically, you're losing more sodium than water or vice versa, you're gaining more uh, water than sodium. It's based on the volume status. So you have different types. You have isotonic, hypertonic, and hypotonic. So let's go into isotonic. This is usually found in patients that have high triglycerides or protein in plasma. Hypertonic is an increased tonicity of extracellular fluid. So a total fluid concentration in extracellular fluid increases, but sodium is usually constant. So you want to uh, make sure you're correcting underlying problems. So you'll have a lot of fluids um, in hypertonic. Hypotonic, which is the most common cause of uh, hyponatremia, it's actually 90% cause of hyponatremia, is that you have different types. You have hypovolemic, hypervolemic, and euvolemic. Hypovolemic is where, where both water and sodium are lost, but there's a larger decrease in sodium as compared to water. So there's more sodium loss in water. Examples are diarrhea and vomiting, dehydration, diuretics, like hydrochlorothiazide. So make sure that you know that hydrochlorothiazide is associated with hypotonic hypovolemic hyponatremia. Um, burns, aldosterone deficiency, ACE inhibitors, cerebral wasting syndrome. So the treatment for this is that you want to replace normal saline slowly and you want to avoid overcorrection. So it's really important that for these you're going to know what are the causes or what are some examples of hypovolemic hyponatremia. So for this one, I saw hydrochlorothiazide that was associated with hyponatremia hypovolemia, right? Because it depletes all your sodium burns also. And let's go into hypervolemic hyponatremia. So this is an increase in sodium and water in the extracellular fluid. It causes sodium to move into the intracellular fluid. And large increases in water causes uh, this, and there's also small increases in sodium. Some of the examples of hypervolemia, hyponatremia, is cirrhosis, right? congestive heart failure, that makes sense. You're having a lot of volume, nephrotic syndrome, kidney disease, Basically, you're having that edema, that fluid overloading. Treatment is to prevent effects of um, aldosterone. Uh, you want to do fluid restriction, water restriction. You want to deplete that water, right? And then you have euvolemic, which is basically no change in sodium, but there's increase in water volume. So there's normal sodium, there's no edema. Examples of this is SA, SIADH. This is a huge one, so make sure that you are familiar with this. SIADH is associated with euvolemia hyponatremia. Uh, post-op, hypothyroidism, polydipsia, podomania, which is basically drinking too much beer, like exercise, cancers. Treatment is usually with water restriction. You want to differentiate with uh, urine concentration. And then you have pseudo-hyponatremia, which is normal sodium and water. This is seen in hypertriglyceridemia and multiple myeloma. So basically, it misses, messes up with the machine. So it gives you this false uh, low amount of hyponatremia. So once again, you make sure you know this, pseudo-hyponatremia, normal sodium and water, seen in hypertriglyceridemia. So signs and symptoms of overall of hyponatremia is that you're going to have your nausea and vomiting, you'll have your muscle cramps. If it's severe, less than 120, you can have cerebral edema. If it's less than 115, you can even have seizures. Um, but if it's less than 120, you can get headaches, increased intracranial pressure and confusion, um, coma, death. Treatment is that you want to do slow fluid replacement. You don't want to do it all at once and re replete it quickly because you can cause uh, cerebral edema. Okay? So for this, you can use a holiday uh, cigar formula, which is daily needed, which is a 150 and 20. So let's go into hypernatremia. So hypernatremia is what? It's going to be too much sodium, right? It's going to be greater than 145. You're losing more water than sodium, or you're gaining more sodium than water. 
Some of the causes, it's going to be water deficit, exercise, over-ingestion of sodium, whether it's through IV or through your diet, uh, central diabetes insipidus. Okay. And some of the signs and symptoms is that they'll be very thirsty. This is our main defense. And then the mnemonic salt is really good for hypernatremia. So their skin's going to be flushed for S. They're going to be agitated for A. L is going to be low-grade fever. L. T is going to be thirst. So they'll be very thirsty for hypernatremia, right? Because they have a lot of sodium, a lot of salt. They're going to be wanting to drink water. Neurosymptoms are going to have ultramental status, seizures, uh, coma, hypovolemia. Treatment for this is that you want to correct the underlying disorder. You want to do gradual fluid dis replacement, and you want to monitor for cerebral edema, monitor for sodium, and seizure precautions for the patient. So now we're going to go into calcium. So calcium, the normal levels of calcium is going to be 8.5 to 10.5. Calcium, as we know, it's found in bones. 99% of it is found in bones. 1% is found in soft tissues and in the serum. It comes from bones and teeth, responsible for muscle contraction, clotting, cell membrane permeability. So hypocalcemia is less than 8.5. Hypercalcemia is greater than 10.5. So I actually, I'm pretty good with these. I kind of memorize them and it helps you when you're taking the questions, because you don't have to go and take time to click on the labs. There's like usually a labs um, icon that you can click on and it'll show there. And then you have to go and scroll. And sometimes it'll be on the second or third page and you're looking for the calcium. If you memorize these numbers, it'll allow you to be quicker through the exam. Since on the exam, for most of you have taken them already, you get about a minute per exam. And you have 120 questions. And some of the questions, I mean, they're pretty straightforward, but then you have those really long like scenarios where you have to sit there and read it and you're like, oh my gosh, and you have to think. So it'll take you more than a minute. The faster you go through the exam, if you memorize these numbers, it'll help you. So make sure that you memorize uh, the amounts like uh, hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, calcium, potassium. That way you can go quicker through them. So now we're going to go into uh, hypocalcemia. This is too little calcium. Basically, your calcium level is going to be less than 8.5, right? Etiology is usually due to renal failure, uh, suppression of the parathyroid hormone, because the parathyroid hormone is responsible for um, calcium, right? Hypersecretion of calcitonin. What is calcitonin? It decreases or depletes your amount of calcium. Malabsorption, if they have some type of um, irritable bowel disease, celiac also, or this can cause also hypocalcemia. Intestinal acidity, if they have an infection, low magnesium, make sure you know this. I um, had this question so many times. So low magnesium is associated with hypocalcemia. So they might give you a question that you'll see and you're like, okay, this patient is hypocalcemic. And then they'll ask you what is also low. Make sure that you know it's magnesium. So magnesium and um, hypocalcemia are related. So it's going to be a low magnesium also. Uh, this can cause hypocalcemia. So signs and symptoms, the patient will have muscle cramping. They'll have spasms. Uh, make sure you know what the Trousseau sign and the Shavoskit sign is, okay? Go over them real quick. Uh, Trousseau sign is basically when they put the blood pressure cuff on, right, and the, the arm would just like go like this. And then you'll have the Shavoskit sign is where you, you press on the facial nerve right here and it'll go like this. If you see some videos, it's really cool. And then you'll have paresthesia, so like the tingling, right, and the numbness in the extremities. Increased deep, ten deep tendon reflex reflexes. So if you do the exams, like their ankle or their knee will like jerk, so it'll be increased. They also have a high, so they'll have more seizures, more prone to having seizures, they'll be confused, they'll have dementia. Diagnosis, you're going to do ionized calcium. You want to also measure their, cal their magnesium. You want to measure their albumin level, their LFT, their amylase and lipase, their bioin and creatinine, their EKG, they usually have a prolonged QT. And treatment, if it's severe, if it's an emergency, you want to give them IV calcium gluconate or calcium chloride. If it's mild, then you can give them just oral calcium and vitamin D since this increases uh, their diet. Calcium. So now we're going to go into hypercalcemia. Hypercalcemia is too much calcium. Basically, it's going to be greater than uh, 10.5. Some of the causes is going to be hyperparathyroidism, right? So if the parathyroid hormone is overreacting, uh, hypothyroidism renal disease, milk alkali syndrome, vitamin D excess, since vitamin D is associated with calcium. Also, uh, thiazides, lithium, cancer. Signs and symptoms, most symptoms, 
patients tend to be asymptomatic until the calcium is very, very high. So this is the one where you hear that they have stones, moans, groans, and psychiatric overtones. So that's how I memorized it. So stones, kidney stones, moans, they'll be usually uh, constipated, uh, or they'll have bone pain, groans, psychiatric overtones. Um, like I said, they might have um, uh, some mild uh, psychosis. And diagnosis is going to be ionized calcium, magnesium once again. You want to do albumins or LFTs, amylase, lipase, bione, and creatinine. Uh, you want to me measure their parathyroid hormone, and you want to do a bone scan also. So it's very similar to hypocalcemia. Treatment is going to be isotonic saline, so normal saline. You want to give them loop diuretics, right, because they deplete your calcium. Uh, manage underlying disease, so whether it is due to a tumor or some type of uh, lung cancer, you want to make sure that you ensure that you take care of that. Uh, diet restriction, calcitonin, biphosphonates, because these tend to deplete your calcium also. So let's move on to potassium. So once again, what are the normal levels of potassium? We have 3.5 to um, 5.5, although some people say 3.5 to 5, but just make sure it's within that range. If it's hypokalemia, it's less than 3.5. It's, it's hyperkalemia, it's greater than 5. Hypokalemia is too little potassium. Okay. Some of the causes are going to be diuretics because it can make you hypokalemic, renal tubular alkalosis. GI losses like vomiting, diarrhea, um, calcium, <clears throat> vomiting, diarrhea, uh, laxatives, signs and symptoms. So hypokalemia, any of the potassium uh, abnormalities is associated with arrhythmias. So and these arrhythmias are deadly. They can become deadly because they can turn into towards sides of points or other things. And so hypokalemia, signs and symptoms are ventricular arrhythmias, hypotension, cardiac arrest, malaise, skeletal muscle weakness, cramps, um, ileus and constipation, polyuria, nocturia, hyperglycemia. And with this one, you have to make sure that you're very familiar with the EKGs, okay? Uh, sometimes they'll give you an EKG and then you look at it and you make sure that the patient has, they're like, okay, they are hypokalemic, or they will describe the EKG. So the EKG will have flat T waves with a U wave. So it says high yield, make sure you notice flat T waves with a U wave. Treatment, if it's mild, you can just give them some oral potassium, okay? If it's severe, then you're gonna give them IV potassium. And it's usually not an emergency until, until they start having cardiac symptoms. Now we're gonna go into hyperkalemia, which is more than 5.0 or 5.5, depending on what resource you're using. Basically, they have too much potassium. It's uh, the potassium is shifting out of the cells or the kidney is just not working on getting rid of potassium. So usually in this question stem, you'll have a patient that is uh, has chronic kidney disease or is on dialysis. Uh, they'll be hyperkalemic. So make sure that you look that out when you're look for that when you're taking your exam. So etiology, hemolysis, thrombocytosis, renal failure, if they're on ACE inhibitors also, hypoaldosteronism, metabolic acidosis, rhabdomyolysis, and this can be, this is actually worse than hypokalemia. It's the most dangerous and can be very fatal. So out of both, I mean, hypokalemia and hyperkalemia are, can both cause arrhythmias, but out of both of them, hyperkalemia is the worst one. Signs and symptoms, fatigue, muscle weakness, paresthesias, flaccid paralysis, this one's big. Flaccid paralysis is associated with hyperkalemia. If you're reading a question and you see flaccid paralysis, hyperkalemia. Uh, dysrhythmias, cardiac arrest, EKG. So on EKG, this is going to be peaking of T waves, okay? Make sure that you know that. Like I said, they might describe to you the EKG, or you might have to read the EKG. Make sure that you know that it's peaking of T waves for hyperkalemia. Diagnosis, you'll see the serum potassium is less than, it's greater than uh, 5.0 or 5.4. 5. Viewing creatinine, you want to make sure that you're looking at the renal function uh, to see if they have chronic renal disease. And treatment is going to be calcium oxalate. That's the first line. I got that wrong on my ER, EOR, and I was so mad. Calcium oxalate is the first line. Uh, how I memorized it is C, big K, drop, okay, right? Because it's going to decrease the amount of uh, potassium. So C, big K, drop, calcium oxalate is the first line. You can also give beta agonists, insulin and glucose, K, exalate also, sodium bicarb or dialysis or diuretics. Cardiac disease. So now we're going to go into some of the diseases like pulmonary, metabolic disease, hematological disease, cardiac disease. Uh, usually a patient will have a history of an MI, angina, 
uh, valvular disease, hypertension, arrhythmias, congestive heart, heart failure. So we're still in this preoperative, right? So if you have a patient that has a cardiac disease, any of these <clears throat> signs and symptoms, it's going to be uh, crackles, JVD. This, they have crackles and JVD tend to indicate uh, congestive heart failure, lower extremity edema. They might have a carotid brewery, unilateral weakness, murmurs, uh, shortness of breath, chest pain. So for pre-op testing, you want to do an EKG, okay? To rule out any arrhythmias, you want to do a stress test to rule out any coronary artery disease. You want to do an ejection fraction to rule out congestive heart failure. Normal, if it's greater than 55%, if it's uh, less than 35%, then it's, uh, it's bad, it's really bad. So I would not take this patient to surgery. So you have the Goldman criteria for cardiac risk, which is basically JVD, age greater than 70, if they had a recent MI, if they had any type of uh, PVC, so premature ventricular contractions, aortic stenosis, or poor medical condition, then I wouldn't take these patients for surgery. This is a Goldman criteria. If they had a recent MI, 40% of these patients have a mortality rate of having another MI within three months if they have an operation. And if they do have some type of cardiac disease and you can give them a beta blocker, this will help them decrease the amount of myocardial oxygen demand. And then post-op, just make sure that you do some um, fluid maintenance. So pulmonary disease, if the patient has a history of asthma, COPD, um, most common cause of pulmonary risk is smoking. So this is something you have to know. I had a question on this. So the most common cause of pulmonary risk is smoking. Signs and symptoms, the patient will have a barrel chest, a wheezing, rails, ronchi, shortness of breath. Um, of course, we have the barrel chest, which is usually associated with COPD, whether it's emphysema or chronic bronchitis. For uh, pre-op testing, you want to do a spirometry, right? That's going to help you with to determine whether it's a restrictive lung disease or a obstructive lung disease, which we'll discuss later. Chest x-ray to see if it's anything um, related with maybe a pneumonia or anything like that. BUN and creatinine, albumin, pregnancy test for sure, because pregnancy, pregnancy can also decrease uh, your breathing, right, or increase your breathing. Uh, on post-op, deep breathing exercises with uh, spirometry, and then you want to make sure you give them early nutrition. So now we're going to go into metabolic disease. So what I'm trying to do is uh, go into what testings you would do for pre-op and then what testings you would do for post-op. So a patient that has a metabolic disease, whether they have diabetes or they have adrenal insufficiency, for pre-op you want to make sure that you do a CMP, a BUN and creatinine, an albumin, and of course a pregnancy test. Post-op you want to make sure that you're strictly controlling their glucose. This helps them heal faster okay? and it decreases their risk of infection, right? Because after surgery, you're more prone to getting infections sometimes, so ensuring that their glucose control is con their glucose is controlled will help them improve faster and decrease infection risk. So if they are in a diabetic coma, of course, this is an absolute contraindication to surgery. You want to make sure that you rehydrate them and um, <clears throat> you correct their acidosis before surgery, if it's needed. So hematological disorders. So if they have a history of clotting disorders like hemophilia, von Willebrand disease, thrombocytopenia, if they use anticoagulants like uh, heparin, low molecular weight heparin, warfarin, signs and symptoms is that they might have some ecchymosis, right? Um, some purpura, some lower extremity edema. So for pre-op testing for these patients, you want to do a CBC. Although, honestly, I was listening to some podcasts of some physicians saying that in clinic, this is debated for hematological diseases, but for your exam, just make sure that you do a CBC. You look at their platelet count, you look at their coagulation studies, so you look at their PT, PTT, INR to make sure that they are clotting and they're not at risk of bleeding out during surgery. Uh, BUN and creatinine, albumin, pregnancy tests. Uh, how do you treat bleeding? It's going to be direct pressure, whether they start bleeding and during the surgery, vessel, vessel ligation, you can do a tourniquet, which is a really great way of stopping bleeding, electrocautery, or even vasoconstrictors like epinephrine. Okay, so now we're going to go into uh, DVT. So DVT is a huge uh, complication of surgery, and it's a very common one sometimes. So make sure that you're very, very familiar with this. I had so many questions on DVT and pulmonary embolism. So DVT, make sure you're familiar with the virtuous triad, which is, I memorize it as she, my mnemonic, S-H-E which is going to be stasis, uh, hypercoagulability, and then 
basically an endothelial damage, so some type of trauma. So most of the clots tend to originate where? In the lower extremities, right? Specifically the calves. So you might have a question on that and where most of these clots originate. So endothelial damage, usually like a lower leg injury, stasis, whether the patient was on a long car ride or a long flight, um, whether they've been on bed rest for a while, they've been immobilized, hypercoagulability, whether it's a malignancy, oral contraceptives, is huge guys. Uh, women that are or on oral contraceptives are at higher risk of getting a DVT, whether they're pregnant also. Signs and symptoms, they'll have a unilateral edema to the leg. They'll have calf pain or tenderness. Homan sign, I know I got docked for this on my OSCE. I was so mad because I had never heard about Homan sign. I, didn't, I was never taught about it in PA school until I was docked on it on my OSCE. And so I went home and I researched it. Uh, Homan sign is, is unique to DVT. Basically, the patient will have calf pain with dorsiflexion. So you'll flex the knee, the, 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 the foot, and the patient will have some calf pain, and that's usually positive for DVT. Is it, I mean, is it very specific and sensitive for DVT? I mean, there's, there's a debate about it. But just for um, your exam, make sure that you're familiar with the home and sign. It, it's also going to be warm, so the calf is going to be warm. It's going to be, um, there'll be erythema, and then there'll sometimes be a palpable cord. Diagnosis. So make sure you know about the Wells criteria. I was pimped on this during my ER rotation. I didn't know what it was. So make sure you know that. And uh, basically, if, if you suspect that the patient may not have a DVT, then you can do a D-dimer. Okay. If you have a high probability that the patient may have a DVT, then you can do something like a spiral CT scan. And the gold standard, though, is going to be a venous angiogram. So if it asks you the question, what is a gold standard? Venous angiogram. What is the treatment? You're going to start with heparin. So low molecular weight heparin or low molecular weight heparin. Heparin acts quicker. Warfarin doesn't act as quick as low molecular weight heparin or just heparin. So this is why in the acute state, you're going to give them heparin. Okay. Warfarin, then you can bridge them on to warfarin later. And warfarin is usually given uh, about for three to six months. So if the question asks you what treatment do you want now, right now for the DVT, heparin. What is a maintenance treatment you're going to maintain them on later? Warfarin. You can also do surgery. You can do an IVC filter placement. Uh, some of the complications are like uh, pulmonary embolism. So this is why it's really important that you treat a DVT. I remember once I thought I had a DVT, and I probably talked about this in my previous uh, YouTube video. I had a, I thought I had a DVT because I was having that calf pain. And as a student, I didn't exercise as much as I should have. I spent most of the time sitting down like right now and studying. I didn't, I wasn't mobile as usually, and then I was on oral contraceptive, so I was really worried. I went to the doctor, and the doctor even did the home and sign, and I was like, oh, you're doing the home and sign. And he took out his, his um, MD calc, and he was asking me questions. Uh, he did the Wells criteria to see if I had a prior, if I had a family history of um, DVTs or hypercoagulability, or if I had any blood disorders or anything like that. And so he, I remember when he walked out, he even told his attending doctor, like, she's hard because he, he didn't know what to do with me since I had a negative home inside and everything else was negative. And so he ended up doing a ultrasound for me um, <clears throat> for the DVT and I ended up not having one. So that was good. Okay, guys. So for surgery, basically you'll do an IVC filter placement if needed. Okay. Like I said. Complication is going to be a pulmonary embolism, so this is why you're treating the DVTs. It's because that clot can go up and it can lodge in the pulmonary. Really bad pulmonary embolisms are the saddle pulmonary embolisms, right? Which is where basically there's a large pulmonary embolism that goes and straddles the bifurcation of the pulmonary trunk. So it's basically stopping uh, blood flow of the pulmonary arteries to, to the lungs. So this one is actually very deadly and you want to avoid these complications. So that's why you treat the DVTs. So pre-op prevention, um, you want to give heparin. It's easier to control than warfarin. And then post-op, you want to make sure that these patients are ambulating. So they're walking, okay? Because you want to make sure that they're not bedridden because they are more prone to getting a DVT. So risk assessment. Your goal is to identify and quantify any comorbidity that can have an impact in an operative outcome, right? So you want to make sure you get the patient's age, their sex, their BMI, their health status, uh, the reason why they're having surgery, is it something that is not needed? 
uh, whether they have low risk or high risk functional status, their expected improvement, um, post-op steroid use, since this tends to prolong healing, whether they are dependent on a ventilator, if they're smoking, if they require dialysis, if they have any comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes mellitus, congestive heart failure, any renal, hepatic diseases, cancers, etc. And so you also want to make sure that you are assessing their nutritional assessment because poor nutrition can also cause poor wound healing. And you want to also do some lab work. So you want to look at their CBC, uh, CMP, their electrolytes, and see how their kidneys are functioning, their EKG, look how their heart's functioning, the chest x-ray, the albumin levels, and management if they do have high risk. And you want to make sure that you consult specialists. So what my doctor would do is that before he did surgery on anyone, if a patient had some type of cardiac problem, he would refer them to cardio, so to a cardiac doctor, cardiologist. Um, if they have problems with their kidney, a nephrologist, a pulmonologist, a gastroenterologist, okay? And you want to make sure that you stabilize the patient and they're fine if the surgery is required. If it's an elective surgery and it's not required, then you can talk to the patient and tell them, you know what, I don't think you, ha you, can ha you should have the surgery because of X, Y, and Z. And you want to make sure that you obtain all labs that are needed in imaging for this patient to go for surgery. So now we're going to go into a substance use disorder. Okay. So this is basically um, any type of substance use, use disorder, whether it's smoking, whether it's cocaine use, or etc. It's most commonly found in males, and the most common ones are alcohol and nicotine abuse, opioids, um, cannabinoids. And it's associated with conditions like bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder, or anxiety disorders. Signs and symptoms of substance use disorders that have the cravings, tolerance, uh, withdrawal symptoms, self-harm, or harm of others for substance. So this is according to the DSM-5, which is for psychiatry. Diagnosis is that they'll have impaired control. They're using substance in larger amounts or for time, more time. They have failed attempts to cut down. They have cravings. They have social impairment, problems fulfilling work. Uh, school, family, or social obligations, problems with relationships, less social activities. So they're not functioning, right? They have risky use. So they use substance despite awareness of physical problems. And medications are usually indicated in a patient that has uh, developed dependence and withdrawal. And treatment for this is long-term psychotherapy. You can do group therapy, like for example, alcoholics, you have your alcohol anonymous, right? In addition, you can also add a medical supervision. You can also give them a treatment if needed, if they want to stop smoking, for example, or stop drinking, something like anti-abuse. Um, but you wanna make sure that with these patients, they are prone to having withdrawals, especially um, alcoholics and benzo patients that abuse benzodiazepines and barbiturates. So now we're going to go into uh, tobacco use dependence, which are cigars, cigarettes, chewing. This is a leading cause of preventable death worldwide. Basically, the patient causes inflammation uh, to their arteries, right? The endothelial cell damage. They have increased risk of myocardial infarction, coronary vascular disease, peripheral vascular disease. Uh, smoking contains carcinogens. It's the most common cause of pulmonary risk preoperative. Is smoking. So if it asks you what is the most common cause of pulmonary risk preoperative, it's going to be smoking. So signs and symptoms, uh, patients will tend to exhibit tolerance, so they need more to produce desired level. So similar to substance use disorder, right? Uh, these patients will have tachycardia, wakefulness, euphoria, weight loss, insomnia, mild hypertension. Withdrawal symptoms, they'll have severe cravings, irritability, anxious, anger, poor concentration, and restlessness, right? Because they're needing to use. In patients, increased appetite, weight gain, insomnia. And treatment for tobacco use dependence, you can uh, do bupropion or wolfbutrin. You can also do uh, ver verinicline, uh, electronic cigarettes, and you want to advise them to quit or cut back. Okay. Nicotine replacement therapy, also like gum, lozenges, transdermal patches, uh, nasal sprays, inhalers, mouth sprays, uh, sublingual products. Surgical considerations, uh, compromised ventilation, you want to evaluate with spirometry, high PCO2, they have usually a low FEV1, um, you want to do ABGs, and treatment is basically you have to tell the patient that they have to stop. If they really want the surgery, they have to stop smoking, okay? Or stop smoking for at least eight weeks. Um, 
and intensive respiratory therapy. So physical therapy, incentive spirometry, humidifier or air prior to them having surgery. So now we're gonna go into post-operative fever. I had several questions on this one so make sure that you are familiar with this. It's the most common occurrence in perioperative period. So that's why it's really important that you diagnose this early, okay? And um, the range of the fever tends to be between 101 to 103 degrees Fahrenheit. And the causes are the five W's. So you have your wind, which is pneumonia. You have your wound, walking, also known as DVT, water, UTIs, and wonder drugs, drug reactions. So if you have a patient that has a fever after surgery, these are some of the things that you want to be thinking about is these five W's. So atelectasis is the most common source of fever on the first day. So this is a question that I had also, guys. Make sure that you know the timelines, okay? So if the patient presents after surgery with fever on day one, you're thinking about atelectasis. So what is the treatment? You want to do incentive spirometry, bronchoscopy if needed. Now, it's been about three days after surgery. What are you thinking about? Pneumonia, and they have a fever. They have a persistent fever, and you want a diagnosis with a chest x-ray. You'll see infiltrates. You want to do sputum culture to see what type of pneumonia it is, which is just something that maybe they acquired in the hospital, and bronchoscopy if needed. And of course, you're going to treat it with um, antibiotics. UTI, this is going to be the next one. This is usually also on day three. Okay, For diagnosis, you want to do a urine analysis and culture and also treat with antibiotics. And then DVT on day five, you're gonna diagnose this with Doppler studies, right? You're gonna treat with uh, anticoagulation with heparin. And then wound infection, okay? This one is fever on day seven. So this is the last one. So if it's been already seven days and your patient is post-op and they have a fever, then you're gonna think about wound infection. Physical exam, you'll see erythema, warmth, tenderness, and treatment's gonna be antibiotics and incision and drainage. So make sure that you know the timelines, okay? So it's gonna be the five W's, right? Wind. Wound, walking, DVT, water, UTI, wonder drugs, or whether the patient had a reaction to the drug. And usually if it's a, a reaction to the drug, it'll be immediately. Okay, it won't take several days or a week for it to appear. So usually, and also some of the drug reactions, it's going to be usually to, for the drugs that the anesthesiologist is using. Um, so make sure that you also know that. Also, the patient can also get C. difficile. Okay, so they can present with fever and diarrhea after surgery. You're going to diagnose with CVC and stool cultures, and treatment is IV antibiotics, right? You're going to give your oral vancomycin or metronidazole. The patient can also have malignant hyperthermia, which is a temperature greater than 104 that develops shortly after the onset of an anesthetic. So like I said, it's usually due to uh, halothane or succinylcholine. So make sure you know this malignant Hyperthermia temperature greater than 103 versus postoperative fever, right, which is 101 to 103. If it's greater than 104, it's going to be malignant hyperthermia due to anesthetics like halothane or succinylcholine. Treatment is going to be IV dantrolene, 100% oxygen. You want to correct their metabolic acidosis, cooling blankets, and watch for myoglobinuria. And then bacteremia, which is usually 30, 45 minutes after an invasive procedure. They'll have a fever that's greater than 104 chills and you want a diagnosis of the bloated culture you want to do three of them and treatment is empiric uh, antibiotics yeah so now we're going to move on to wounds and infections uh, you'll definitely have some questions on this so make sure that you're familiar with these so wound enhances this is usually on the fifth day after an open laparotomy basically the patient will have an intact wound with large amounts of pink salmon colored fluid so this is pathognomonic for wound adhesions okay they'll have pink salmon colored Fluid. So if you read a question and it says pink salmon fluid and they just had surgery, think about wound adhesions and this happens on the fifth day after an open laparotomy. Soak dressings. Also, treatment is going to tape the wound securely, abdominal binder, and you're going to care with uh, coughing and mobilization. And then you also have evisceration, which is a catastrophic complication of wound adhesions. So this is severe. If wound adhesions are not treated, then you'll have evisceration. Basically, the skin opens up and all the abdominal contents rush out, okay? Patient with unknown wound adhesion tends to cough, strains, or gets out of bed, and this is what causes it. Treatment is that you want to keep the patient in bed. You want to cover the bowels with large sterile dressings soaked 
uh, with warm saline, and then an emergency abdominal closure is required for evisceration, right? That makes sense, right? Evisceration, everything comes out. Wound infections are usually due to a fever on day seven. Physical exam is that you'll see erythema, warmth, tenderness, and you're gonna treat this with antibiotics and incision drainage. Okay, so we're done with that now. We're gonna go into cardiovascular system now. So aortic aneurysm is an abdominal dilation in the aorta. And this is due usually to a weakness in the vessel wall, so you have an increased diameter. The most common areas is gonna be 60% of it is in the abdominal area, and 40% is gonna be in the thoracic uh, area. Some of the causes are arterio arteriosclerosis, chronic hypertension, make sure that you know that. Smoking is also a huge cause of aortic aneurysm. COPD, and it's more common in males, specifically males that are greater than 60, and also if they have genetics, so if they have a family member that also had an aortic aneurysm. Some of the symptoms for an abdominal aortic aneurysm is that it's going to be a pulsatile mass in the abdomen. So if you ever read a question that has pulsatile mass in the abdomen, it's going to be an aortic aneurysm. They'll have severe constant abdominal pain that radiates to the back. And then for a thoracic one, they'll usually have no symptoms. They might have some severe chest, back, or abdominal pain hoarseness because they're having the compression of the laryngeal nerve. And diagnosis, the first one is going to be with an ultrasound, okay? So if it asks you what is the next diagnostic test, you're going to do an ultrasound, but the definitive is going to be a CT. And usually if it asks you what is the screening for these patients for uh, an aortic aneurysm, so it's going to be a CT, sc CT scan in men over 65 who have ever smoked. This is really important. I had a lot of questions whether it was for family medicine, internal medicine, surgery, what is the screening for aortic aneurysm? And it's going to be in men over 65 who have ever smoked, okay? Treatment, if it's less than three centimeters, you really don't have to do anything. You just basically just make sure that you're watching it. If it's three to four centimeters and you can do an ultrasound every two to three years, okay, so you're observing it. If it's less than 4.5 centimeters, you're going to do an ultrasound every six months. If it's 4.5 to 5 centimeters, you're going to do an ultrasound every three to six months, but this is high yield. If it's more than 5.5 centimeters, you're going to do surgery, even if the patient is asymptomatic. So you might get a question and the patient is presenting with an aortic aneurysm, but they're basically kind of like asymptomatic. They're not in pain or anything like that, but it's greater than 5.5 centimeters. Regardless, you're going to do surgery. So aortic dissection is basically a rupture of the vessel wall. So if an aortic aneurysm is not treated, it can rupture and become an aortic dissection. Usually the most common wall vessel involved is going to be the tunica intima. Patient can actually bleed if there's no intervention, and this is an emergency. Like I said, it's usually found in an aortic aneurysm that is greater than 5 centimeters or 5.5 centimeters. Causes are going to be the same thing. After, uh, arteriosclerosis, chronic hypertension, smoking, COPD, most common in males, especially Caucasian if they're greater than 60. Signs and symptoms is going to be severe abdominal pain radiating to the back. They'll have flank pain, tachycardia, syncope. This one is pneumonic, pathognomonic for aortic dissection. They'll have ripping, tearing pain, okay? Ripping, tearing pain, you're going to think about aortic dissection. They'll have the triad of pain, hypotension, and a pulsatile mass. So there's two types. You have your Stanford type A, which is found in the ascending aorta, and then you have your Stanford type B in the descending aorta. If it's found in the ascending aorta, that's a surgical emergency. That is, you need to get it done. Diagnosis first is going to be an ultrasound. Definitive is a CT scan. What you'll find in the CT scan is usually a true lumen and false lumen with intimal lap flap. So make sure that you are familiar how they look because you'll get a CT scan and then you'll have to read it and make sure that you know that it's an aortic dissection. Treatment is hemodynamic support. You want to give them AV, IV beta blockers, nitroprusside, make sure you know that, pain control, but the definitive treatment is going to be with an emergent laparotomy. So you, this is going to be done by a vascular surgeon. So now we're going to go into arterial embolism or thrombosis. Arterial thrombosis is a, basically a blood clot in the vessel that reduces blood flow. Um, it causes a collateral circulation or it's stuck to the vessel and it decreases lumen size. The most common cause is atherosclerosis, vasculitis, trauma. Patient will usually have a history of claudication or rest pain, so this is key. 
And signs and symptoms is gonna be usually hours to days, they'll have claudication, diminished hair growth, and contralateral leg pulses. Diagnosis is that you're gonna do a Doppler and geography, and treatment's gonna be with the medical management, um, whether a bypass or stents. And this is gonna be for arterial thrombosis. Now, an acute arterial em embolism is in a, a complete ischemia, okay? Complete occlusion also of the blood vessel versus a thrombus is just minor occlusion. Arterial embolism is a complete one. It's most common found in the leg and the patient will complain of the P's, the paresthesias, the pain, the pallor, pulselessness, paralysis, poikilothermia, levitoreticularis, they might have some bruise also, and the onset is second, seconds to minutes, okay? In comparison to your arterial thrombosis, it's hours to days, this one's seconds to minutes. Diagnosis is usually clinical, and treatment is going to be with heparin or an embolectomy vascular surgery. Now we're going to go into peripheral arterial disease. It's an atherosclerotic disease of the lower extremities, and etiology is usually uh, claudication areas due to aortic uh, bifurcation, common iliac, femoral, popliteal, tibial, and peroneal arteries, smoking, um, hypertension also, diabetes mellitus, chronic kidney disease. And the patient will complain of intermittent claudication. So if you notice, if there's anything related with the arteries in the lower extremities, they're going to be complaining of intermittent claudication. What does that mean? It's that they have pain when they're walking, right? And it's relieved only by rest. So this is what differentiates peripheral artery disease from chronic venous insufficiency. I know I kept getting these confused when I was taking the exam. So make sure that you know that peripheral artery disease, it's going to be claudication, okay? They'll have pain whenever they're walking, and the pain is relieved by rest. If they have resting leg pain, this tends to signify that they have an advanced disease. They might have also gangrene. Diagnosis initial is going to be with an ABI, and usually the ABI is going to be less than 0 0.90, but gold standard is going to be an arterial uh, arteriography. So make sure that you know that. You can also do an ultrasound or Doppler, but your initial is going to be an ABI. If it's less than 0.90, okay, that indicates that they have a peripheral artery disease. <clears throat> Usually if it's grace less than 0.4, that, that means it's severe. So that's really bad. But the gold standard is going to be an arteriography. Treatment is going to be platelet inhibitors like salazazole, aspirin, and clopidogrel. You want to do reva revascularization whether it's by an endarterectomy, uh, bypass grafts. If it's gangrene, then of course you want to amputate it, right? You want to make sure that these patients are getting foot care, exercising, they're controlling their hypertension, their diabetes mellitus. And if it's an acute arterial occlusion, you want to do heparin for embolism or thrombolytics or an embolectomy. So next we're going to go with a chronic venous insufficiency. This is vascular incompetency of either deep or superficial veins. While the other ones had to do with arteries, this has to do with the veins of the lower extremities. So etiology is going to be the virtuous triad, right? The one we did, talked about in DVT, which was a chi, the mnemonic, which was stasis. H was hypercoagulability. <clears throat> and E is just basically endothelial damage, so some type of trauma that they had. Symptoms is going to be leg pain, burning, aching, throbbing, cramping, a heavy leg feeling, the have edema, pitting edema is key. Uh, brown hyperpigmentation, right? This isn't seen in peripheral artery disease, only in chronic venous insufficiency. They'll have stasis dermatitis, which is basically an eczematous, eczematous rash. Itching, scaling, erosions, it's like weeping. They'll also have ulcers, and these are found at the medial malleolus, okay? So that's how I memorize it. Venous, V-E, medial, M-E, venous malleolus versus um, uh, anything that's arterial is going to be lateral, right? Lateral ulcers. So with this one, you'll have uh, medial ulcers, ulcers found at the medial malleolus. Uh, also, the lower extremity can be atrophic, and it's worse with prolonged standing or sitting, okay? And it's better with walking and elevation versus peripheral artery disease is worse with walking, right? That's why they have the claudication. With chronic venous insufficiency, it's better with uh, leg elevation and walking. Diagnosis is going to be an ABI. Um, treatment, it's going to be compression stockings, and that's what my doctor always did. He had a vein clinic, 
She always made sure that the first line treatment for them was compression stockings or else the insurance will not cover it. If they want to come back and they want to do um, a surgery, if they want to have a venous valve transplant or anything like that, then they have to start with compression stockings. So make sure you also know that for your question, it'll ask you what is the best next treatment, compression stockings. After that, if that doesn't work, then you can do a venous valve transplant or they can go in there and remove the, the veins. For ulcer treatment, you want to make sure that you're doing the dressing, skin grafting, hyperbaric oxygen, and control edema. So now we're going to go into varicose veins. So varicose veins are dilated, tortuous, superficial veins. This is usually due to valve structure and function of the superficial veins. Uh, the most common vein that's involved is the superficial saphenous, usually due to estrogen use or contraceptives, increased stress on legs, prolonged standing, obesity. Sun symptoms, it's asymptomatic, it's usually due to a cosmetic issue. Uh, they might have like a dull ache or pressure sensation, worse with prolonged standing, which relieves with elevation. Diagnosis is usually a visual inspection. Treatment is with a leg elevation. You want to also do compression stockings. If you notice anything that's venous, right, you're going to do compression stockings. And you want to avoid prolonged standing. During my surgery rotation, I made sure and I got myself compression stockings because I started noticing I was getting some of these. And I was like, no, and they actually helped. So that's why I first line for these compression stockings. You can do sclerotherapy or laser ablation if needed. So arterial ulcers. This is usually due to peripheral artery disease. Usually you'll see the skin is very cold and dry. They'll have diminished pulses, shiny taut skin, hair loss that is worse with elevation. So hair loss, arterial ulcers. It'll usually be found in the ankles, toes, and heels. Diagnosis is going to be with an ABI ratio. Usually less than 0.8 is going to be diagnosed. Now, sometimes the ABI can be high sleep, uh, falsely high in diabetes mellitus. The patient will be complaining of cramping pain, claudication. Like I said, anything that's arterial is claudication. Treatment is that you want to refer them to a vascular surgeon. You want to tell them to stop smoking. Okay, because like we discussed, smoking damages your arteries a lot. So you want to make sure that they're stopping smoking. The diabetes is controlled. If they have hypertension, you want to put them on a statin. Tell them to lose weight, exercise and you can put them on an antiplatelet if needed. Venous ulcers, on the other hand, their skin is going to be warm, it's going to be, there's going to be erythema, edema, hyperpigmentation, and it's going to be found on the medial region of the lower, lower leg. Once again, what is the vein most commonly associated? The great saphenous vein. And diagnosis, you're going to do, you're going to feel for pulses, right? Uh, you're going to look at their capillary refill and their toes. Uh, check for any neuropathy, check out their, look at their deep tendon reflexes, you want to do an ABI, venous Doppler, and you want to make sure you measure the ulcer at every visit. Treatment is going to be elevation, moisturizing like a hydrocolloid. Uh, you can also do some topical corticosteroids if the patient has dermatitis. You want to do compression therapy also. Uh, you want to debride it, some oral antibiotics, and you want to make sure that you educate them to avoid topical antibiotics. You want to clean the ulcer with saline, and you want to avoid telling them to avoid manipulation, so picking at it. So, claudication was another, uh, I'm telling you, some of these topics are very broad on the blueprint. So this is claudication. The patient present with claudication, what are you going to do? They're having pain whenever they walk. First thing you're going to do is you're going to do a Doppler study, okay? And then after that, you can do maybe a CT angiography or an MRI angiography to see where the area is stenosed or the specific area is stenosed that is causing the claudication or which artery is stenosed. Treatments are usually going to be angioplasty, stentine. Um, if there's more extensive disease, then you can do bypass grafts or, or longer stents. So now we're going to go on to angina pectoris. So angina pectoris is chest pain with exertion. All angina is due to coronary artery disease. Okay, usually there's oxygen demand that is greater than supply. Uh, the causes are vaso occlusions due to atherosclerotic plaques. And usually there's different types of angina. You have your stable and unstable angina. So make sure that you know the difference between this. And then you also have your Prince Metals angina. So let's start with stable angina. So stable angina is Patient's going to be complaining of chest pain with exertion. So whenever they exert themselves or they exercise, they're going to have chest pain. But then they get better whenever they, they rest. So if they're sitting down, they feel a lot better. And unstable is going to be chest pain with exertion. And it's not really with rest, okay? And basically, the chest pain 
sometimes can be new or worse than previous episodes. It tends to last between 15 to 30 minutes for unstable. And this includes acute coronary syndromes like non-MI, STEMI, and non-STEMI. And then we have transmittal angina, which is chest pain that comes in cycles, it comes and goes. And this is due to the vasospasms, right, of the vessels, the coronary um, arteries. And it can occur during rest. And on the EKG, you'll see transient ST elevations. Also, it might be drug-induced also, like cocaine. Risk factors for this are modifiable, and then you have non-modifiable. So make sure that you know this. Modifiable, you have cholesterol, like your increased LDL, smoking, definitely, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, they have a sedentary lifestyle. So this is all modifiable. But then you have your non-modifiable risk factors, like they're older than 60, they're males, uh, genetics, uh, family history. Signs and symptoms overall of angina pectoris is that they'll have substernal chest pain, pressure tightness, so I have that crushing chest pain, heavy. It tends to happen uh, between minutes to hours, and the radiation is to the upper arm or shoulder or jaw. Okay? And the thing with um, signs and symptoms is that not all patients have these symptoms. So if the patient is obese, if the patient is a female, they may not present with the typical signs of chest pain. So you have to make sure that you are looking for this in your question system, or even the question system will ask you that the patient has angina and then it'll ask you how this, this, these symptoms can present differently in what patients. And it's gonna be a patient that's diabetic, a patient that's maybe obese, right? Because if they're diabetic, their nerves aren't working as well as they should be. So that's why they can present with a different form of chest pain. They might not even have chest pain whatsoever. A uh, woman also, for some reason, women also do not present the same way as men do or other individuals with chest pain. So also make sure that you also keep that, you're thinking about that when you're taking the question. Sometimes a woman with chest pain can present with abdominal pain, okay? So you have your unstable angina. How are you gonna diagnose it? So you're gonna always start with your EKGs and then you're gonna do your cardiac enzymes, right? So with unstable angina, your initial one is that you wanna do an EKG. You wanna you want see whether it's a ST or a elevation myocardial infarction, which are the bad ones, right? a heart attack, or if there's ST depression. But in unstable angina, you'll see ST depression. Your cardiac enzymes, you want to do a CKMB, a troponin. But the gold standard is going to be a coronary angiogram, a cath lab. So that way you're going to see which coronary artery is involved. For stable angina, you want to do a stress test, whether it's exercise-induced, if the patient can do that. If not, then you can just give them um, medication, so chemically-induced. You want to do a cholesterol panel, a fasting glucose, an A1C, and a CMP. And for treatment, of course, the first sign is always going to be lifestyle modifications. So you want to tell them to change their diet, to exercise, to stop smoking if they're smoking, weight loss if they're overweight, control their diabetes. And for unstable angina, medication-wise, you're going to give them aspirin and clopidogrel, IV or oral beta blockers, nitrates, heparin, or low molecular weight. Heparin, so of course you have the, your Mona Batch mnemonic, right? Stable angina, you're going to give them the classic re regimen, uh, regimen of uh, daily aspirin, sublingual nitroglycerin as needed, daily beta blockers, daily statins, and severe atherosclerosis, then you would do like a cabbage or an angioplasty with stunting. Prince metals angina, like I said, with these patients, you do not give them beta blockers, you avoid them, especially if it's cocaine induced. You're going to give them a calcium channel blocker, like something like verapamol. Post-op angina, uh, whether you also want to make sure that you're looking for these, whether it's a myocardial infarction. So syncope. So syncope is a sudden transient loss of consciousness along with the tone of their posture, right? So they just basically down and fall. This is due to several causes. It can be due to dysfunction of bilateral cerebral hemispheres, and there's different types. So it can be vasovagal, which is mediated by orthostatic or emotional stress. So someone that just got scared, for example, reflex mediated. So if you're stimulating like the carotid arteries, uh, if they're sneezing, exercise, postprandial, and then you have your dysrhythmias, which is basically there's something organic going on in the heart, which whether it's an AV block, like your type two, uh, <clears throat> second degree type two AV blocks, your third degree AV blocks, your Tacky Brady syndrome, uh, SVT, so supraventricular tachycardias, ventricular tachycardias, whether they have a pulmonary embolism, aortic dissection, 
pulmonary hypertension, cardiomyopathy, or valvular disease. So any of this that can cause some type of arrhythmia in the heart. Another cause of syncope can be orthostatic. So whether the patient was drinking, they're on some type of uh, visodilator, they're on diuretics, antidepressants, Parkinson's, Lewy body dementia, hemorrhage, um, diabetes mellitus, or whether they have diarrhea and vomiting. Signs and symptoms is going to be they have transient loss of consciousness and postural tone. They're confused, but they don't have a post-ictal state. So this was this is something that can differentiate it from being a type of seizure. Duration is usually seconds, but once they get up, they are they have rapid recovery. Uh, usually, if it's vasal vagal, they'll have a prodrome of nausea and vomiting, warmth, pallor, lightheadedness, uh, diaphoresis. And diagnosis is going to be clinical. You want to do an EKG to rule out any type of arrhythmia that the patient might have. And then you also want to do a normal EEG, like I said, to rule out any seizures also. Okay. And then treatment is usually supportive. So depending on the cause, if it's something that is cardiac related, you want to make sure that you get that under control. If it's vasovagal, supportive. So now we're going to go to endocrinology. So we have hyperthyroidism. So hyperthyroidism is due to an excessive amount of thyroid hormones, right? T3 and T4 are usually increased. It's more commonly found in females, uh, patients that smoke, patients that are stressed out, patients that had iodine exposure, or like for example, taking medications like amiodron. Amiodron is well known for causing thyroid issues. So what is the most common cause of hyperthyroidism? It's Graves' disease. So Graves' disease is an autoimmune disorder where antibodies stimulate the TSH receptor, causing overproduction of thyroid hormones. So make sure you know that Graves' disease is the most common cause of hyperthyroidism. It's autoimmune autoantibodies auto that are stimulating the thyroid stimulating receptor, causing an increased amount of thyroid hormones. The second most common cause is a toxic uh, multinodular goiter. So uh, you have expansion of cells due to mutation of a TSH receptor. You can also have a pituitary adenoma, um, iodine. Symptoms, the patient's going to have a goiter. They're going to be having heat intolerance. They'll be sweating. Everything's going really, really fast. Fatigue, weakness, they're very thirsty, dyspnea, palpitations, weight loss, amenorrhea, low libido, hair loss, hyperreflexia. And then gray symptoms are going to be a triad of exophthalmos, which is like, if you've seen those photos, it's the eyes are literally protruding out of the eye socket. They'll have a orbitopathy, which is limb lag, pre-tibial mixed edema. They'll have a diffuse goiter. So the best, best initial test for this is going to be a serum TSH. You want to do look at their T3, their T4 levels. Uh, you also want to see if there's any recent CT scans. Usually, if they have a low TSH and a high T4, then it's going to be primary hyperthyroidism. You can also do a radio iodine, active iodine uptake, uh, which basically, if there's a high uptake with diffuse homogeneous radioactive iodine distribution, then it's great. So make sure you know how these look on uh, a scan, because you will definitely be giving a scan. Usually, if it's diffuse, it's going to be graves. If there's high uptake with nodular... Uh, distribution and there's multiple patchy areas, then it's going to be a toxic multinodular goiter. So if it's diffuse on the thyroid scan, it's going to be prim uh, primary hyperthyroidism, something like Graves, specifically Graves. If it is uh, multiple patchy areas of the thymus, the thyroid scan, then it's going to be a toxic multinodular goiter. First line is going to be methyl methamazole, uh, PTU, and severe, it's going to be thyroidectomy. Okay, so we also know that usually methamazole is toxic in pregnancy, right? So that's why you would give PTU in pregnancy in the first trimester. And then later you can give methamazole if needed. But usually how I memorize it is that meth is toxic for pregnancy. But if the patient is not pregnant, if they give you the options of PTU and methamazole for hyperthyroidism, make sure that you give them methamazole, okay? Because methamazole has the least side effects and it's better than PTU. So then we have now hypothyroidism, which is the opposite of hyperthyroidism, right? This is due to the thyroid gland not producing sufficient thyroid hormones. So it's very common in patients that are older, specifically females, patients that had postpartum, Hashimoto's, is actually one of the most common ones of hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Patient may be living in an area that has iodine deficiency, 
They might have a history of an autoimmune disease or a family history of thyroid disease. Signs and symptoms, they tend to be subtle, they're not very specific. They might have some weight gain, fatigue, weakness, cold intolerance, constipation, delayed deep tendon reflexes, brittle hair and nails, dry skin, um, lateral eyebrow hair loss, that's interesting, right? Hair loss right here. Memory impairment, difficulty concentrating, menorrhagia, depression, myalgias, they might have the coarse facies, bradycardia, edema, goiter also, bradycardia. So the diagnosis, the best initial test is going to be similar to hypothyroidism, right? You're going to do a TSH. Uh, you're going to do a T3 and T4. If there's a high TSH but there's a low T4, it's going to be primary hypothyroidism. If it is a low TSH only, you want to consider maybe a hyperthyroid state. <clears throat> if it's high TSH and high T4, then you want to think about secondary hypothyroidism. And if there's a low or normal TSH or a low T4, then it's going to be secondary or tertiary or even sick youth thyroid. So make sure you know how these patients can present on labs. Treatment is usually lifelong therapy of levothyroxine. If they're pregnant, you want to make sure that you increase levothyroxine to nine doses a week, and you want to monitor their TSH in six weeks. It's really important that you get hypothyroidism treated in or under control in pregnancy because then the baby can be born with things like cretinism, and that's something that causes severe mental retardation. The patient baby will usually have like the protruding tongue, abnormalities in the face. So that's why you wanna make sure that you get this under control. Complications, uh, you can have mixed edema coma, which is bradycardia, hypothermia, hypotension, and an ultramentocytis. So this is why you wanna get this under control. So now we're gonna go into Thyroid nodules. So thyroid nodules are basically cellular growth of tissue of the thyroid. They cause an abnormal lump in the gland. Uh, prevalence tends to increase with age. Signs and symptoms that the patient will have pressure in the neck. They'll have uh, trouble swallowing and choking, right? That makes sense. Hoarseness if, they're, if those nodules are pressing against the laryngeal nerve. So with these, for diagnosis, they tend to be discovered incidentally on the physical exam. And usually a nodule that's less than one centimeter tends to be readily detected by palpation, but you still want to rule out cancer. So you're going to do a thyroid ultrasound. My doctor did a lot of these. And you're going to look at their TSH. And if it's a low TSH, you still want to do a radioactive iodine uptake uh, scan. You also want to do a fine needle aspiration okay, with biopsy. And... Usually a fine needle aspiration is not indicated if uh, it's just a simple cyst, but if you feel a cyst and then you see some um, lymphadenopathy, then I would do the fine needle aspiration to make sure you're ruling out thyroid cancer. Treatment is that you would refer them to an endocrine, um, if, especially if they have multiple nodules, if they're at increased risk, or if you see abnormalities in the fine needle aspiration. So let's go on to thyroid carcinomas, okay? So we have different types. We have papillary, follicular, medullary, and anaplastic. Make sure you know the difference between these. So what is the most common thyroid cancer? So the most common thyroid cancer is going to be papillary carcinoma. That is the most common cancer. It's about 60 to 70% of all thyroid cancer. Usually a patient with a papillary carcinoma will have a history of radi radiation exposure. It's more common in females and it has the best prognosis. It's very treatable for papillary. Next one's gonna be follicular carcinoma. This tends to spread hematogenously with distant metastasis to lung and bone. And then you have your medullary carcinoma. This is the only one that produces calcitonin. And it's associated with MEN2A and MEN2B. And then you have your anaplastic carcinoma. This is the worst one out of all of them. It's spread by direct extension and it's not very common. So overall, thyroid cancer is more common in women, especially women under age 20 or over the age of 65. They tend to have a history of neck radiation or a family history. On symptoms, the patient will be basically complaining of pressure in their neck. They have trouble swallowing, choking sensation, hoarseness. They might have a nodule on the part of their anterior neck or a hard fixed nodule. Usually anything that's fixed, guys, whether it's in the breast and it's not, and you're feeling it and it's not circular or the shape is just abnormal, you want to consider cancer, okay? And this is a case for thyroid cancer also. And these also grow really, really fast. So diagnosis, uh, they can be discovered incidentally. I have to tell you, uh, when I was doing my surgery, my, my surgery rotation, my doctor did a lot of uh, thyroid removals also. 
we would get a lot of patients that sometimes like their job had like a free screening and the screening involved like a thyroid scan and if they had some type of thyroid nodule even if it was really small they would refer them to the surgery to our surgeon so my surgeon would see them and this patient's like really upset like they're upset they're anxious because they told them that they might have thyroid cancer when it really wasn't it was probably just a, it was just a benign thyroid nodule but still it's important to really ensure to get them checked out so <clears throat> You want to make sure that you also, when you're doing this, you're doing a good thyroid exam. So initial for a thyroid cancer is you want to do an ultrasound and you want to confirm with a fine needle aspiration, okay? You also want to do some labs to make sure that the thyroid is functioning normally. The treatment's going to be an endocrine referral, especially if the patient has multiple nodules, if they're at increased risk for having a thyroid cancer, or if they have abnormal fine needle aspiration results. If it's hyperfunctioning, then you can do something like radio iodine ablation or surgical excision. So next one's going to be hyperparathyroidism. This is due to an excess or increased amount of parathyroid hormone production. Increased parathyroid hormone causes increased calcium, so it will cause hypercalcemia. The most common cause for primary is going to be a single parathyroid adenoma, even parathyroid hyperplasia, which is found in familiar uh, MEN1 and MEN2A. Eh? Parathyroid carcinoma also. Some of the risks, uh, if they had neck or head radiation, if they use lithium, cancer, family history of hypercalcemia or narrow endocrine tumors. Signs and symptoms, it's most commonly asymptomatic hypercalcemia. They might have kidney stones, osteoporosis, uh, pancreatitis, decreased uh, deep, tendon, deep tendon reflexes, increased amount of fractures. So this patient will be... Since it's hypercalcemia, right, we discussed, discussed it earlier, they're going to be presenting with the bones, groans, stones, and psychiatric overtones, right? So moans, they're not feeling well, groans, they might have abdominal pain or GERD, uh, stones, kidney stones, bones, bone pain, psychiatric overtones, depression, memory problems. So diagnosis is that you want to measure the calcium twice. If hypercalcemia is confirmed, then you want to check their parathyroid hormone, their phosphate level, the creatinine and their 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels to make sure that it's not anything related also with the kidneys. Primary has increased calcium, increased or normal parathyroid hormone, and decreased phosphate. So phosphate is going to tell you whether you differentiate between primary or secondary. Some of the causes of secondary is usually due to malignancy, Paget's disease. Treatment is going to be with IV saline fluids. You can also give loop diuretics, right? We talked about this late, earlier, is that loop diuretics will deplete your calcium. And you can also treat the underlying cause. So whether it's an adenoma, then you want to make sure that you get rid of it. So surgery, you can do a parathyroidectomy. And asymptomatic patients that are, surgical that are surgical candidates, if they have only one of the following. So if patient has a reduction in bone density, so if their T-score is less than negative 2.5 or if they're, le they're less than 50 years old, then you can do surgery for them. If they're not surgery, surgical candidate, then you can just manage it with medical medications like uh, biphosphonates or some of the calcium mimetics. So now we have hypothyroidism, which is low PTH, so you'll have hypocalcemia. So the primary causes are either idiopathic, post-surgical. So if the patient had their thyroid gland removed, right, then they'll have symptoms of hypoparathyroidism, autoimmune, and secondary, magnesium deficiency. Remember, we talked about how magnesium is usually associated with calcium. So if magnesium is low, you'll have low calcium. Vitamin D deficiency also, renal failure. Signs and symptoms are going to be very similar to hypocalcemia, guys. So they'll have the um, Trousseau sign, which is a blood, blood pressure cuff, and it causes a flexion of the hand, right? They'll have the, the Chavoskid sign, which is you... You put your finger or you just place on the on the facial nerve and they'll have that facial twitch. They can have paresthesias, increased deep tendon reflexes, muscle cramps, anxiety, tetany is a huge one, dry skin, brittle nails. Diagnosis, you're going to measure their calcium, their parathyroid hormone levels, their phosphate, their albumin, and their magnesium. Primary uh, causes, <clears throat> well, in primary causes, you'll find in labs hypocalcemia hyperphosphatemia. So remember I told you that you want to make sure you're checking at the levels of phosphate because it's going to tell you whether it's primary or secondary. You have low PTH and then if it's secondary you'll have high PTH. This is usually due to renal failure, right? Treatment is underlying cause. 
Um, you want to treat whatever is the underlying cause, whatever is causing it. Calcium carbonate supplementation plus vitamin D also, whether it's er ergocalciferol or calcitriol, these are names for vitamin D supplementation. So on a question, they might not say vitamin D, it'll say ergocalciferol or calcitriol, so make sure you know this. And a low phosphate diet. So now we're going to go into adrenal carcinoma. So adrenocortical carcinoma, it's very uncommon, it's rare, but it has a high aggressive malignancy. It's most common in the fourth and fifth decades of life, most common in women, and they develop very rapidly. So the patient will be asymptomatic, they'll have an abdominal pain, abdominal mass, um, functional tumors like Cushing, they might have symptoms like Cushing or hyperaldosteronism, like weight gain, weakness, insomnia. Diagnosis is you're gonna do an abdominal CT or MRI. Labs, you're gonna do the cortisol, you're gonna measure the cortisol levels, their ACTH, do a 24 hour cortisol level. Uh, testosterone in men, estradiol in women. You want to measure their metanephrines and catecholamines to rule out pheochromocytoma, right? Treatment is going to be complete surgical resection. You also want to treat Cushing's and hyperaldosteronism if needed. And the most common site of metastasis is the liver, lungs, lymph nodes, and the bone. So pheochromocytoma. This one was the favorite one of my one of my professors. He loved it. He always talked about pheochromocytoma. And you'll have a lot of questions on this. It's extremely rare, but for some reason, we have so many questions on it. So, pheochromocytoma is basically due to a catecholamine secreting tumor that arises from the adrenal medulla. Make sure you know that. And also what it causes. So, excess norepinephrine and epinephrine cause sympathetic overdrive. So, the sympathetic system is just going crazy. It's benign. Etiology, the rules of 10, so it's bilateral, it's familial, pediatric, malignant, extra adrenal, and it's associated with MEN2A and MEN2B. Make sure you know that also. MEN2A and MEN2B are associated with pheochromocytoma. The patient will usually be thin, and it'll be a female. Signs and symptoms, so have episodic headaches, palpitations, diaphoresis, tremors, anxiety, flushing. They'll have the five Ps, pressure like hypertension, pain, a headache perspiration, so they're swaying a lot, palpitations, and pallor. What is the best initial test? I had this question so many times, high yield. You're going to do a high urinary plasma fractionated metanephrines and catecholamines. The most accurate one is going to be a CT or MRI of the adrenal glands. But how do you treat this? You always want to make sure you give them an alpha blocker first then you can give them a beta blocker. So it's always propanolol after alpha blocker, you're always gonna give them an alpha blocker first, okay, to control their blood pressure. And usually the treatment is uh, surgical. So tremors, you have different types of tremors, right? So tremors is basically like a rhythmic movement, right, of the certain body parts, uh, whether it's your fingers, or it's your leg, it's a very common movement disorder. So it's either a rest tremor or an action tremor, there's different types, so rest tremor, is basically present at rest. Uh, basically, the patient is present, uh, resting, and you can see the tremor, and it's diminished with purposeful movement. Versus an action tremor, it's a voluntary muscle or contraction, and it gets worse with movement, okay? So action tremor gets worse with movement. Rest tremor gets better with purposeful treatment, uh, movement. You also have psychological tremors, of course, if you're scared, if you're cold, if you're anxious, if you're tired, uh, hyperthyroidism can also cause it, alcohol withdrawal. And then you have your essential tremors. These are very common. Uh, they progress with age. And it most commonly affects the hands, the head, right? They'll have the yes, 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 or the no, 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 no. You can see this in older people. Um, the jaw, their voice, it rarely affects your legs, and it usually has a genetic or family history. Make sure you know that. Essential tremors, I had so many questions on these, as a genetic or family history. Signs and symptoms, this one's usually bilateral. It's very common in the hands, and it's worth with, worse with induced activity. And you want to know this, it, it decreases with alcohol, and it's worse with caffeine, okay? Usually if you ask the patient to write, they can't even write or they scribble. Treatment, first line is going to be propanolol. So that's first line, it's gonna be a beta blocker, propanolol. If it's severe, then you can do surgical intervention. Okay guys, so now we're gonna go into dermatology. Let's go into cellulitis. So cellulitis is a common infection of the dermis due to bacterial breach in the skin barrier. It involves the deeper dermis, 
and the subcutaneous tissue. It's most common in the lower extremities and then most common in the upper extremities for IV drug users. That makes sense, right? Because that's usually where they inject. So the most common cause, you need to know this, is uh, group A strep and then staph aureus if it's an open wound. If it's an animal bite, then it's going to be pastorella uh, multi-okaida. And then if it's a human bite, which I had a question and I got so mad, make sure you know this, uh, echinella corridens. And then MRSA if it's a drug use. But overall, the most common cause is a, a group A strep. Risk factors are usually a local trauma, ulcers, diabetes mellitus, drug or alcohol abuse. Signs and symptoms, it's going to be a painful erythema, edema, or non-fluctuant plaque. You'll have streaks of lymphangitis, edema, warm, fever, and chills. And it's poorly demarcated. So this is how you can differentiate between cellulitis and erysipelas, is that erysipelas is usually has a good demarcation, and it's usually in the face or the upper extremities, versus cellulitis, it's in the lower extremities, and it's poorly demarcated. So the shape is like abnormal. Diagnosis is going to be clinical but you can culture the tissue to make sure to see what type of infection or bacteria is causing it so you can treat it appropriately. And then you wanna do a blood culture if it's purulent, okay? Treatment is you wanna make sure that you treat it early because it can lead to sepsis and death. So if it's non-purulent, then the most common cause, like we said, it was gonna be a group A strep, right? So you can give something like cephalexin. And usually the non-purulent ones are usually due to bug bites. If it's an IV drug user, you want to think about MRSA, so you want to give them clindamycin. If it's a purulent pussy abscess, then you're thinking about MRSA and strep, you want to give them clindamycin, okay? You want to make sure that you culture it. If it's fluctuant, then you want to do an incision and drainage, and you want to make sure you monitor that. You can do it with a Sharpie, and that, you, you, that way you can see how much it's increasing. So burns. Burns are acute wounds due to isolated, non-reoccurring insult and progressive, progress rapidly through orderly series of healing steps. The most common causes are chemical, electrical, radiation, thermal, seasonal, like fireworks. It can also be associated with abuse. Uh, in children, the most common cause is that they're scalded. Adults, it's usually due to a flame. So you have, set, you have several degrees and you have to make sure you know how to classify them. Your first degree is superficial, so the epidermis is only involved. The patient will have no blisters. It will be very painful. It will be dry, red, and blanchable, okay? No scarring. Usually sunburns are the most common cause of first degree superficial burns. Second degree are partial thickness, okay? You'll have the epidermis and the partial dermis that are involved. It's either superficial or deep. This will be also painful, blanchable, and this one will have blisters so the difference between first and second degree is that first has no blisters second degree is going to have blisters if it's superficial it tends to heal within 7 to 20 days if it's deep it takes more than 21 days to heal and then you have your third degree which is full thickness it's epidermis plus the dermis plus the subcutaneous tissue you'll see a burn ishar it'll be dead and usually it's intact it rarely heals and the patient will have no pain at all now, I've had some books that usually put second degree as partial and full thickness, so it just depends on which book, but this one has, that I mean, as third degree, as full thickness. And then we have a fourth degree, which is the worst one. It's deep, life-threatening, it extends into the fascia, muscle, or bone, and you have sensation to deep pressure only. It never heals and you have no pain, so these require hospitalization. So you want to make sure that you diagnose the patient um, regarding on how much area of their body is burned, okay? So minor burns is partial thickness is less than 10%, and full thickness is usually um, less than 2% total body surface area in patient without injuries. What is the treatment? Non-superficial burns, you want to do topical antibiotics. You want to refer them to a surgeon for debridement. You want to give them IV fluids, IV antibiotics, analgesics, tetanus, prophylaxis, thermal, you want to do cooling, not ice, gentle cleansing, dressing, you want to follow up and monitor for infection, scarring and contracture, analgesia, dressing, wound debridement, inhalation burns. Uh, you want to do make sure you're doing your ABC, so protecting the airway, okay, their circulation, their breathing with intubation. You want to do a bronchoscopy, which is the best test. 
And at the burn center, you wanna dress burns with dry gauze only. So now we're gonna go on to pressure ulcers. These are on bony prominences, prominences due to external compression of the skin. Causes obstruction of nutrient and oxygen delivery to tissues. Usually this is found in patients that are bedridden, like older patients. It can be also a sign of abuse, especially in older individuals who aren't turned constantly in bed. So this patient will usually have um, decreased sensation. Um, these patients tend to be, like I said, older, and the complication of this can be osteomyelitis. Diagnosis is clinical. Uh, you're gonna do a wound culture, a blood culture, skin biopsy, bone biopsy. You wanna, the treatment's gonna be repositioned, so make sure that you're turning that patient in the bed if they're immobile, especially if they're older, because you wanna prevent these pressure ulcers. You wanna inspect for breakdown, Interface air mattresses, you wanna avoid moisture. Uh, make sure you look at their nutritional status, whether they're <clears throat> vitamin C deficient, and wound care. If it's a stage one or two, you can do topical antibiotics, definitely not neomycin. Moist sterile gauze, hydrogels, hydrocolloid dressings. Stage three or four, you're gonna do surgical management, debridement, bony prominence, removal, flaps, skin grafts. So now we're going to go into the skin cancers. We're going to go into squamous cell carcinoma. So the origin, the cause of squamous cell carcinoma, the cell involved is going to be keratinocytes. Okay, make sure you know this. It's the second most common cause of cancer. It's found in white, fair-skinned males greater than 55 years old, in sun-exposed area like the head, the neck, the forearms, the hands. Patients that use tanning beds, they have a lot of exposure or radiation to UV light. Signs and symptoms is going to be asymptomatic, it's slow growing, it's sharply demarcated macular papule plaque nodule, pink red skin colored, hyperkeratotic, keratotic. it tends to grow outward so it's exophytic, it's indurated, indurated and it's usually uh, described as a cutaneous horn so make sure you know that. It's friable, so if you just basically pick it a little bit, it bleeds with minimal trauma. It's very itchy, and it's firm. So you diagnose it with a skin biopsy. And treatment is that you're gonna refer them. You're gonna do a surgical excision, a wide local excision. You're gonna make sure you get everything. So something like the Mohs uh, micrographic, and you can also do prior surgery if needed, or you can do something like a 5 fluorouracil cream, diclofenac, but usually surgery's, surgical excision is going to be the treatment. So basal cell carcinoma is the most common type of skin cancer, okay? It arises from the basal layer of the epidermis, and it involves basal cells. It's slow growing and it has rare metastasis. It's more common in males and more common also in the face, the head, the neck, and areas that are exposed to UV radiation. And usually risk factors for this are skin types one, two, fair skin that burns easily, sun damage. Signs and symptoms, they tend to be asymptomatic, but if they do have symptoms, it'll be typically erosion, okay? Bleeding with minimal trauma, open sore reddish patch, shiny bump or nodule. So if you see anything that says shiny bump or nodule, think about basal cell carcinoma. If it's nodular, which is the most common type, it's usually a translucent, pearly, pearly papule with telangiectasias. It's firm and it can be ulcerated. So diagnosis, you're gonna do a dermoscopy. So you're gonna go and look at it. Second is that you wanna do a biopsy. It's the best one to confirm, okay? It's the best to confirm that it is cancer before removal. So treatment, you're gonna do create an electrocautery, a cryosurgery, and wide local excision with standard margins. You want to make sure that there's also danger sites, like you have the face and the ears, because there's so many vessels running through that area. So in these cases, you would do most surgery. If it's non-surgical, it's going to be similar to squamous cell carcinoma. So you do a Micomod 5 fluorouracil cream. You can also do radiation. And you have to make sure the patient follows up every 6 to 12 months for 2 years. And they perform a skin exam at home and follow up. So now we're going to go with melanomas. This is the most malignant form of skin cancer. Uh, the origin of cell is melanocyte. So out of all the skin cancers, if they ask you which one's the worst one, it's going to be melanoma, and then it would be squamous cell carcinoma, and then basal cell carcinoma. So melanoma is more commonly found in women. It's ages 25 to 29. 
they're fair skinned, they have UVA and UVB uh, exposure, they've been using tanning beds. And signs and symptoms is that usually they'll have this pigmented papule, plaque, or nodule. So you want to make sure you do your ABCs, right? So you want to make sure that you are looking at how large it is, the diameter, whether it's elevated or not. These tend to bleed and erode. If it's superficial, it's usually a flat plaque brown to black plus red, blue, or white. It's enlarged, it ulcerates. If it's nodular, which is the second most common, so superficial is the most common in, they might have a blueberry rapid growth, more aggressive, immediate vertical growth. And then the diagnosis for this is gonna be a total excisional biopsy or an incisional slash punch biopsy. Okay. So a total excisional biopsy is not done on the face, of course, or areas that are cosmetically sensitive. And a red flag is gonna be blue. So if you see blue, that means that it's a deeper lesion. Treatment is going to be a wide surgical excision, and then you want to follow up with the patient for six months for two years. Okay. So next one is going to be exothematous drug reaction. I love these drug reactions. So this is usually a delayed reaction. It's the most common type of cutaneous drug eruption. Some of the causes are going to be penicillin, carbamazepine, allopurinol, sulfonamides, NSAIDs, isoniazide, barbiturates, benzodiazepines, tetracycline. It's usually limited to the skin, but it can also involve buccal mucosa. And it involves trunk to central fugally to extremities. It's symmetric, okay? And it mimics measles, so it's more biliform. Interestingly, just a pearl that I, I, I heard, guys, when I was listening to a podcast, is that anything that is inner is going to be bilateral. So anything that's, from, that's, causing, that's coming from the inside, whether it's a reaction or it's your own body, like histamine acting, it's going to be bilateral. Usually something that is due to like an infection or for example a fungus or a rash that you see on the outer and is unilateral, it's going to be due to an infection, like I said, a fungus, even a parasite, etc. So that's how you can differentiate between whether it's something that is happening inside or outside the body. So in this case, this one why this is the reason why this one is usually bilateral. So this patient will also have erythematous Macules and infiltrated papules, pruritus, so they're very itchy. They might have a mild fever, and it's diffuse. So treatment is that you want to discontinue the offending um, medication that's causing this. You can also do some topical steroids, some oral antihistamines, and you want to tell them to avoid the medication that caused this in the first place. Okay, now we're going to go into fixed drug eruption. So this is a delayed reaction, a formation of a solitary erythematous patch such plaque that reoccur at the same site with re-exposure. So some of the causes are like laxatives, uh, tetracyclines, metronidazole, sulfonamides. Sulfonamides tends to be a huge one causing a lot of these skin reactions. Even stuff like uh, Steven Johnson syndrome, which is like one of the really, really severe drug reactions, and 10. So we have sulfonamides, barbiturates, NSAIDs, salicylates, food coloring even, oral contraceptives, quinine, and these tend to recur at the same site. That's why it's called fixed drug eruption. So if the patient had a rash to like their arms, then it's gonna come back in the same area for arms. So it can occur anywhere in the body. Usually it is fixed, okay, and it's localized. Early lesions tend to be sharply demarcated erythematous macules. They're pruritic, painful, and burning. They're usually solitary and they become really large. And they can sometimes evolve to Ebola and then erode. So treatment is that they usually resolve days or weeks after discontinuing the medication that caused them in the first line. If it's widespread or generalized, then you can give them something like a prednisone, like a corticosteroid shot. If it's a non-eroded lesion, then you can give them a potent topical corticosteroid. But if it's eroded, then you would give them something like an antimicrobial ointment or dressing, right? So it seems like whenever you have some type of uh, issue with a drug eruption or allergic reaction, right? You give them um, antihistamines or corticosteroids, right? So post-op urticaria, this is a pruritic inflammation of superficial skins, hives. This is due to mast cell and basal field release of vasoactive substances. So it's a huge histamine response. The most common causes are usually due to medications that are used in, during anesthesia, like propofol, whether they gave them antibiotics, latex, and it can occur anywhere in the body. So 
on the exam you'll see localized edema and erythema. It'll they'll be really itchy, blanching. So when you press on it, raised palpable, palpable wheels. So whenever you see wheels, it's usually associated with some type of uh, allergic reaction, right? They'll be annular in shape, and then diagnosis is clinical. So treatment is that you want to make sure that you're evaluating airway compromise, making sure that the area is not inflamed. You want to give them epinephrine if they have anaphylaxis and antihistamines, second generation more than first generation because first generations tend to have more sedative effects, so they tend to make it more sleepy. So this is why we want second generations more than first generations. Okay, guys, so now we're going to go into subarach um, subarachnoid hemorrhage. So we're moving on to neurology. So subarachnoid hemorrhage, it has a high mortality rate. Um, it's usually due to things like trauma. Trauma is the most common cause. You can also have a ruptured berry aneurysm, AV malformation. And the most common non-traumatic causes are secular berry aneurysms, like I said. The most common location is the anterior communicating artery. Patient will basically present with a, like an acute onset of headache. It's like the worst headache I've had in my life. So if you read that in the question that the patient has an acute like onset of a headache, saying that's the worst headache of my life, then think about subarachnoid hemorrhage. Also, another thing that you always ask them is if they've ever had a headache like this in, in their life. If they say yes and you're like thinking maybe, hmm, this might be more due to migraines, just general headache. But if they say that they've never had one like this before, and they have several comorbidities, I would think about subarachnoid hemorrhage. So like I said, it's sudden, severe, it's very excruciating. They might have some focal neurological symptoms. They can have also syncope, vomiting, meningeal irritation signs. Diagnosis, you wanna do a non-contrast CT scan. So make sure you know it's non-contrast CT scan. If the CT is uh, negative, then you can do a lumbar puncture, okay? So gold standard is gonna be um, Xanthochromia, which is will usually show you like a yellow color of the cerebral spinal fluid. You can also do a cerebral angiogram. It'll tell you which artery is involved. Treatment's going to be surgical clipping. You also want to control the hypertension by uh, giving calcium channel blockers like a nemotipine. And um, tell them to, you can also give them some stool softeners to avoid any straining because usually this is due to a rupture of the vessels, right? So now we're gonna go on to epidural hematomas. This is bleeding above the dura. It's active bleeding that is due to damaged or torn vessels and collection of blood called a hematoma. You tend to have increased intracranial pressure. Uh, the most common causes are like head trauma. And usually the weakest point is uh, the middle meningeal artery. So make sure you know this, epidural hematomas are, are associated with middle meningeal arteries. So you might have a question with this one versus subdural hematoma, it's due to bridging veins, okay? So you have mid middle meningeal arteries, so that's why if they say you would punch you right here, they can burst that vessel right there. And signs and symptoms is that the patient will have a lucid interval, okay, before they start having symptoms of, before they start having severe symptoms. So usually the question will say, well, they were fine before, and then all of a sudden they just started having all these symptoms, that's a lucid interval. They might have loss of consciousness, consciousness after the head trauma, nausea and vomiting, headache, muscle weakness, focal deficits. Diagnosis is going to be with a CT scan. Uh, you'll see uh, more white and you'll see a biconvex shape. So you'll see like a lemon shape. Okay. It cannot cross suture lines or they even say like a lens shape. So if you see on a CT scan, you have a brain and then you see a like a lens on the brain then you're gonna think about an epidural hematoma. And what's the most common cause? It's gonna be a middle meningeal artery damage, right? Treatment is gonna be a craniotomy, so you're gonna remove the bone, you're gonna make sure that you evacuate and remove all that blood. Then you have your subdural hematoma. This is bleeding below the dura, okay? So epidural was above the dura, sub, right, dural is below the dura. This is usually a rupture of bridging, bridging veins, blood pools, hematoma forms, this is more commonly found in elderly people. So if they fall and then they, they can have these subdural hematomas. I know like uh, when I worked in the ER, we would have patients that were like perfectly fine, especially like elderly. They had just fallen like a few weeks ago and then they're presenting today uh, with symptoms of like headache. And then they get a CT scan and they have a subdural hematoma. So it's not as acute as onset as epidural hematoma. 
And so uh, some other causes can be alcohol abuse, head trauma, shaken baby syndrome, okay, uh, whiplash. Symptoms can be days to weeks, like I said. Uh, they tend to have loss of conscience after injury, headache, nausea and vomiting, muscle weakness, focal deficits. Uh, you're going to do a CT scan, and then on CT scan, you're going to see a crescent-shaped or like a banana-shaped, okay? And this one does cross suture lines. Versus an epidural hematoma, on a CT scan, you're going to see the lens, right? On a subdural, it's going to be the banana. So also, you make sure want to make sure that you look at the onset, okay, of symptoms. So days to weeks is subdural hematoma. Treatment is going to be, if it's a small you can do a catheter if it's large, it's craniotomy. Okay, guys, so next one is going to be cerebral vascular accident. Uh, this is basically also known as a stroke. It's an abrupt focal neurological deficit due to ischemia or hemorrhage. So the most common cause is ischemia, 85%. You'll have a sudden onset usually. So the causes, like I said, ischemia. For ischemia, it's going to be atherosclerosis, small vessel disease, cardioembolic cryptogenic, or if it's hemorrhage, it's going to be a subarachnoid or intracerebral blood bleed. Risk factors is going to be a male that's greater than 55 years old. If they have um, a family history of it, prior stroke or TIA, diabetes mellitus, smoking, hypertension is actually one of the highest causes of having a stroke. So you want to make sure you get their hypertension under control. I had a question on this actually yesterday. It asked us what was one of the most preventable causes or modifiable causes of cerebrovascular accidents, and it was hypertension. You can decrease their hypertension. AFib, endocarditis, oral contraceptives if they're obese. So signs and symptoms are going to have facial drooping and arm weakness and speech difficulties, okay? If you've seen that photo, right, when you have that male that's smiling, if they are smiling, right, and their forehead is... <clears throat> not spared, so it's wrinkling here, but all this right here is not moving, then you want to consider a stroke. Versus if the patient smiles and the entire side is um, <clears throat> numb or it's not moving and their forehead is also not wrinkling, then you would consider uh, maybe like a facial palsy, a cranial, a cranial nerve palsy. Okay, so now, the symptoms are going to present depending on which coronary artery is involved. So I know it's really hard to memorize these, but make sure that you know the coronary artery, artery, arteries and what symptoms are associated with them. So anterior cerebral artery, they're going to have contralateral hemiparesis, sudden lower extremity and trunk weakness and numbness. They'll have lug, leg and face, so they'll have um, frontal lobe dysfunction. And then you have your middle cerebral artery, which affects the face and the arm. So they have face and arm weakness, decreased sensation. They have bilateral vision abnormalities, aphasia, so trouble speaking. They're not making sense when they're speaking, neglect, inability to perform learned actions. For your posterior cerebral artery, they'll have contralateral visual, visual abnormalities, blindness, so troubles with their eyes. Lacunar, so this will be a focal motor or sensory uh, deficit, loss of coordination, difficulty speaking. Basler, they'll have a cranial, cranial neural abnormalities, full body weakness, decreased sensation, vertigo, loss of coordination, difficulty speaking, visual abnormalities, coma, they'll have the locked-in syndrome, which is basically plesia of the head, body muscles, only movement is eye blinking and vertical movement. And then vertebral, they'll have lower cranial nerve deficits and ataxia. So just know that with locked-in syndrome, the most common one is going to be basilar. That makes sense, right? Because basilar tends to split in all the rest of the arteries. So if you're blocking that area, it's blocking perfusion or blood to the rest of the areas that control the different parts of the brain. So this is why you would have locked-in syndrome with uh, basilar. So diagnosis, it's going to be a non-contrast CT scan. Uh, you can also do an MRI, a CT angiography, which will tell you which blood vessel is blocked. And treatment's going to be thrombolytics, okay? You want to give TPA within 4.5 hours of onset. You also want to give aspirin and surgery if needed. And you also want to make sure that you lower and stabilize the blood pressure. So this can be done by IV labetalol and IV nifedipine. And then later in the future for stroke rehabilitation, um, you want to make sure that the patient has, uh, if they have trouble swallowing, you want to assess that. So now we're going to go with TIA. TIA is a brain without blood supply for a brief period of time, less than 24 hours. 
but this has actually changed and there's controversy so this is like an old textbook now they say if the symptoms have um <clears throat> uh, resolved within an hour versus 24 hours but it depends on what textbook you're you're reading so basically blood flow is restored before permanent damage occurs so tia is basically there was an obstruction but it resolved by itself and with tia you want to make sure that these patients are observed because they can develop a stroke in the future or they're at a higher risk of developing a stroke. Common causes are atherosclerosis, uncontrolled hypertension, cocaine use, oral contraceptives, fibromuscular dysplasia, smoking. Interestingly, chiropractic manipulation also. That's really interesting. I remember my professor talking about this and we were laughing when he said that. Uh, thrombophilia, cardiac disease like AFib, MI, uh, diabetes mellitus, carotid stenosis. It's more common in males and if they're older than 55. So signs and symptoms is that they're going to have a upper lateral facial palsy, arm weakness, speech difficulty, transient monocular blindness. And best initial diagnostic test is you want to do a head CT without contrast. Okay. Usually, because uh, you want to make sure that you're ruling out stroke for these patients. Uh, usually you won't find any stroke on imaging. And most of these tend to resolve within 24 hours or an hour. You can do also an MRI or an MRA of the head or neck if needed. And treatment is basically you want to monitor because there's these patients, like I said, are, are so high at risk for getting a stroke. Uh, you want to make sure that you control their coronary artery disease by giving them aspirin or statins. If they need a carotid endarterectomy or angioplasty, then do so. You want to give them beta blockers, a valve replacement if needed. Long-term use for arrhythmias, so you want to give them heparin. And now we're going to go on to vascular disorders, so carotid disease. So vascular disorders, also known as cerebrovascular occlusive disease, which is an occlusion of a carotid artery or stenosis leading to decreased flow to the brain. The most common cause is, or the most common site, is going to be carotid bifurcation. Usually the patient will have a history of hypertension, atherosclerosis, diabetes mellitus, family history, history of smoking, elevated homocysteine level, Sun symptoms, they tend to be asymptomatic. They might feel like they're fainting. They might have some headaches, some positive bruise. Diagnosis usually with a CT angiography, head and neck. And treatment is usually lifestyle. You want to make sure that they, if they're obese, that they're, they lose weight, stop smoking. They control all their comorbidities. So if they're diabetic, make sure they have their diabetes in control. You can give them aspirin. Plavix or clopidogrel, and if they do require surgery, then you can do a carotid endarterectomy. So now we're going to go into renal. So we're going to go into um, renal or urology. So nephrolithiasis is also known as kidney stones. The most common location is going to be ureter vesicular junction. So make sure that you know that. Am I ask you where's the most common location of kidney stone? It's going to be the ureter vesicular junction. Causes, it's more commonly found in males, especially individuals that are dehydrated. They don't drink a lot of water. Uh, if they have hyperparathyroidism, right, that increases the amount of calcium, so they become hypercalcemic. Their diet, whatever they're eating, irritable bowel disease, if they have a history of having previous stones, family history, if they're obese, diabetes mellitus. And there's different types of stones. The most common one is going to be calcium oxalate. And <clears throat> then you also have a uh, struvite. This one is actually more commonly found in women, uh, specifically women that suffer from UTIs. They tend to be described as staghorn stones. They're coffin shaped. And then for the calcium oxalate, they're very uh, radio dense. Okay. Also for struvite, it, it, bacteria that produce ure urease, um, so protease, protease. And then uric acid also is another cause of one of the kidney stones, gout. Okay, Patients that suffer from gout have an increased amount of uh, uric acid, right? They have a hyperuricemia. Dehydration, labor-intensive or outdoor occupations for uric acid stones. They tend to be hexagonal shape and they're semi-translucent. And then you have cysteine. This one's very uncommon. Uh, they're usually hexagonal shape and they're semi-translucent. They're found in usually in cystinuria, which is an autosomal recessive disorder. It's very rare. So how is the patient going to present? They're going to have acute onset, usually flame pains on the sides, right? And they'll have colicky pains. 
Usually sometimes I'll even say that the pain goes is in the groin area or goes from the loin to the groin. They'll have CVA tenderness. So if you go and you palpate on the back and they literally like jump off the bed, then this is a red flag for a nephrolithiasis. The patient also have hematuria, so blood in their urine. Doesn't happen all the time, but you can find it. Uh, tachycardia, hypertension, they're vomiting, they're nausea. They're in a lot of distress. So diagnosis is that you want to make sure that you look at their electrolytes because these patients are vomiting a lot or they're dehydrated. You also want to make sure that you measure their uric acid, their parathyroid levels, uh, do a urine analysis, and then urine culture if you suspect that they have some type of infection. You also want to look for any crystals or casts. You can do a KUB. And basically, radiopack stones you'll see are going to be calcium oxalate and struvite. And radiolucent, so how I memorize it is radiolucent, U for radiolucent, uric acid. You can also do an ultrasound, but the gold standard for kidney stones, guys, is going to be a CT without contrast, okay? And how do you treat this? So the first step is that you want to manage their pain. So you can give them oral or IV NSAIDs, opioids. You want to make sure that you're hydrating them, whether it's also oral or IV. You want to give them some alpha blockers because this will decrease the, the spasms that the ureters are doing when the stone is coming down or the stone is moving. And then outpatient, if the stone is less than six millimeters and there's no signs of obstruction, then you can just treat them as an outpatient. Just give them a prednisone, you tell them to increase fluids and just have them follow up. But if the stone is greater than six millimeters and they're having signs of obstruction, like they're having hydronephrosis, or if they're pregnant, if they have an infection, if they're, they have fever, if they can't pass urine, like I said, um, or if they're unable to pass it after four weeks, then you want to make sure that you hospitalize them, okay? And you can actually get rid of the, the stone by using your ureteral stents, lithotripsy, which is basically they vibrate the patient and it moves the stone a little bit lower. You can also do ureteroscopy stone removal. So you go in there and you remove it. And basically, if it's less than five millimeters, it's likely to pass by itself. So you just tell the patient to make sure that they're drinking a lot of fluids and you gave them some medications so they can, pain medication so they can pass it by themselves. Um, usually some of the doctors would tell them to look <clears throat> and when they go to the restroom and look in the urine to see if they pass a stone, you can actually see it. If it's greater than eight millimeters, then it's likely not gonna pass. So with these patients, you wanna make sure that they get something like lithotripsy or surgery if needed. Okay guys, so let's go into chronic kidney disease. Chronic kidney disease is a subtle decrease in kidney function. So make sure you know the GFRs, okay? So a GFR greater than 90 is normal. And then you start going into your different stages. A GFR less than 60 is already known as chronic kidney disease, especially if they had it for more than three months. And sometimes these patients can be asymptomatic. We had a patient that came in once, they, were, uh, they ended up having pneumonia and then my provider just ended up like looking at their kidney levels and then they had a GFR less than 60. She was young and she had like, she was asymptomatic. She was in shock when we told her. So we just told her to follow up with her uh, doctor since she didn't want to stay at the hospital. Uh, usually with these patients, they have permanent loss of renal function and the most common cause of chronic kidney disease. Now this one tends to change guys. Um, I know some books were saying that it was diabetes, some other books were saying hypertension, but I'm going to go with comfort. hypertension. most common cause of chronic kidney disease is hypertension. This leads to scarring of glomerulus. That makes sense, right? Because you're having uh, all that pressure is scarring your kidneys. The second most common cause is diabetes. So if you think about diabetes is that you have increased amount of sugar in your blood. So that's making your blood very acidic. And can you imagine, it's like you have a vehicle and you have all this acidic gas going through the motor and through the entire vehicle. It's gonna damage the motor, it's gonna damage your vehicle. It's the same thing with your body. When you have diabetes and it's not controlled, then you have this acidic blood running through all your organs. So it's gonna affect them. It's gonna definitely affect your kidneys. And other causes also, you can have coronary artery disease, lupus, HIV, long-term use of NSAIDs. NSAIDs are so bad, guys. If you can deal with the pain, deal with it. But I mean, if you need to take an NSAID, then do it. But they cause, they have so many side effects. Smoking, if the patient is older, African-American, if they have a family history of renal disease. Signs and symptoms are gonna have nocturia. So they'll have a dry mouth, 
they'll have a poor skin trigger, right? That's signs of like uh, dehydration. So a skin trigger, you basically will put this up and it will stand by itself, okay? And usually that, that it shouldn't do that. So if you see I do this and it comes back down, if the patient is dehydrated, even in newborns who can do this, you put this up and it'll stay up, okay? Confusion, weak, uh, fluid overload, metabolic acidosis, increased urea, they have nausea, loss of appetite, um, encephalopathy, asterixis, okay? coma, uremic frost. Uh, they can have hyperkalemia, hypocalcemia, hypertension. Uh, they can become anemic because they have a less EPO, less red blood cell production. And diagnosis is, like I said, their GFR is usually going to be less than 90. If it's less than 60, then that's really bad. You want to do a baseline creatinine and BUN. Um, you want to also do a kidney biopsy to rule out things like glomerular sclerosis. You want to do an ultrasound. And then you want to do labs. So you want to look at, do a CBC. They'll have normocytic anemia. They might have secondary hyperparathyroidism. So like I said, secondary hyperparathyroidism is associated with renal disease. Hyperphosphatemia and hypocalcemia. You'll see waxy casts. So waxy casts, whenever you see waxy casts, think about renal. That's bad. Waxy casts are bad. Treatment is that you want to preserve the function. Okay, you want to give them sodium bicarb, phosphates, diuretics, iron, blood. Um, you want to tell them to have a high carb diet but low protein diet, dialysis, transplant, and you want to manage whatever's causing it. So whether it's hypertension, reduce the hypertension. Give them an ACE inhibitor, an ARB. Whether they are diabetic, give them an ACE inhibitor. Control their blood glucose, control their blood pressure. And then for dialysis, um, if they need dialysis, in the first line, it's going to be a fistula, an AV fistula. Okay. Hydronephrosis. So hydronephrosis is dilation of the renal cavity. It's due to a backup of urine due to an obstruction. So you can find this very commonly in patients that have, for example, benign prosthetic uh, hyperplasia, so pa older patients, males with BPH, also kidney stones, like we were, we were talking about that. Basically, you'll have the distended calluses and renal pelvis. Causes, um, the patient can also be pregnant, uh, but the most common cause is going to be kidney stones for hydronephrosis. The patient's going to be complaining of flank pain, groin pain, UTIs due to obstruction. They'll have post-renal azotemia due to long-term hydronephrosis. Diagnosis, you're going to uh, do a serum creatinine, which is going to be increased, but you're going to do an ultrasound. That's how you can see that the, that the kidney is going to be dilated. There'll be thinning, thinning of the renal medulla or cortex, and you can also do a CT scan, but you start with an ultrasound. Treatment, you want to relieve the obstruction, whether it's with a nephrostomy tube, a uretic stent, or a pyeloplasty, which is a surgical remake of the renal pelvis, and then urinary catheter for lower obstructions. So now we're going to go into renal cell carcinoma. This is the most common kidney cancer in adults, guys. It's more common in older men, ages 50 to 75. Risk factors, smoking, hypertension, dialysis. Usually they're a silent, it's a silent cancer because the patient is sometimes asymptomatic. But whenever you have a patient that has asymptomatic hematuria, so basically they are asymptomatic, they have blood in their urine and they have weight loss, then that should have a red flag for a differential diagnosis of renal cell carcinoma. So they'll have gross painless hematuria, they'll have a palpable mass in the abdomen, they'll have flank pain, fever, weight loss, hypertension, and hypercalcemia. Okay? They can also have a perineal plastic syndrome, which is basically they'll have polycythemia, They'll have hypertension, hypercalcemia, and Cushing's. So how are you going to diagnose this? First one is you're going to do a urine, uh, urine analysis. You're going to do a renal ultrasound, okay? And then a CT of the abdomen and pelvis to see if there's any staging. But you want to start with a urine analysis, and then you can start with a renal ultrasound to detect it. You can also do a chest x-ray for metastasis. And treatment is going to be a partial nephrectomy. And if it's localized, then it's going to be a radical nephrectomy, right? You want to refer these patients um, for surgery, and you want to make sure that you're surveilling them actively. So Wilms tumor. This one is the most common tumor in children. So the most common tumor, tumor kidney cancer in 
adults with renal cell carcinoma. For children, it's going to be the Wilms tumor. So this is an abnormal renal development. It's uh, basically due to proliferation of mesonephric blastemia. And it's associated with WT1 on chromosome 11. Uh, most tend to be a solitary uh, lesion, and they tend to be, some of them can be bilateral. Signs and symptoms, patient will be presenting with a flank or abdominal mass and swelling. So it's going to be a large palpable, like a large palpable unilateral swelling. And they'll have some abdominal pain, fever. They can have some hematuria or hypertension. This one's also silent. It's asymptomatic. You'll just see that flank and abdominal mass. How do you diagnose this? You're going to do an abdominal ultrasound. And then you can do a CT or MRI later for staging. And then a chest x-ray to see if it's metastasized anywhere. You want to make sure that for these patients, they get a biopsy um, and they get chemotherapy. But first line is initial primary nephrectomy is your first line treatment. So renal artery stenosis. This one is basically an occlusive disease due to decreased blood flow to the juxtoglomerular apparatus. It causes renal vascular hypertension and it can progress to total occlusion. Okay. So basically it's the renal arteries are stenosed. So some of the causes for this is atherosclerosis. Uh, it's found in older patients, patients that smoke, that have a hypertension, diabetes mellitus, coronary artery disease, or in younger females, the most common cause is fibromuscular dysplasia. Make sure you know this, guys. I had a question on this. Basically, you have a patient that will present with refractory hypertension. So this patient has hypertension that's been treated with medications, and it's not getting better. And the patient's usually going to be a young female patient. And then that's when you're like, okay, what is it? It's renal artery stenosis. Usually it's going to be refractory hypertension. The most common cause in older patients, it's going to be atherosclerosis, right? But in females, young individuals, it's going to be fibromuscular dysplasia. And fibromuscular dysplasia appears beaded. Okay, so make sure that you know that. You know the differences. So signs and symptoms, like I said, they're going to be refractory to hypertension. You give them an ACE inhibitor, they're not getting better. They might have an abdominal brewery. This is also key that you'll see in the question stem is that they'll have abdominal brewery. They'll also have a sudden hypertension onset without family history. And then usually diastolic hypertension in patients that are less than 35. Diagnosis is usually going to be with a BUN and creatinine. You can do a renal Doppler, which is a gold standard. So if it asks you what's a gold standard, a renal Doppler. Treatment, of course, for patients that have atherosclerosis is that you want to get the atherosclerosis under control, right? So you can give them statins, antihypertensives like ACEs or ARBs or calcium channel blockers. Aspirin, you want to make sure that you treat their blood pressure and have it at 130 over 80. You tell them to quit smoking if they're smoking and re revascularization. Now, one thing you have to know is that ACE inhibitors are contraindicated in bilateral stenosis. So if a patient has bilateral stenosis on the exam, on the Doppler that you do, then you are not going to give them an ACE inhibitor. Okay, contrary indicated in bilateral stenosis. So now we're going to move on to bladder cancer. The most common type is transitional cell carcinoma. Of course, there's several types like squamous cell adenocarcinoma, but you want to make sure that you know that the most common type of bladder cancer is transitional cell cancer. It's more common in men, especially if they're older, so the mean age is 73. Risk factors. A huge one for bladder cancer is smoking. Make sure you know this. You have a patient that presents with smoking with uh, bladder cancer, you want to make sure that you know that smoking is the most common cause. Also, they can have exposure to schistosoma hematobian, which is a, a parasite that's found in um, the Mediterranean areas. Also, prolonged catheter use, if they're using medications like a cyclophosphamide, external beam radiation. How are they going to present? So basically, the patient is going to present with a painless hematuria, irritative, irritative voiding, obstructive voiding, they'll have flank pain, and a mass detected on the bimanual exam. So once again, painless hematuria with this one. It's similar, right, with uh, the renal cell carcinoma. But with this one, they'll have lymphedema of the lower extremities, okay? They'll have flank pain, obstructive voided, voiding, irritated, irritative voiding. And diagnosis is that you're going to do your urinalysis and cytology. The gold standard is going to be a cystoscopy with biopsy because you want to see what type of cancer this is, okay? Even though we know transitional cell carcinoma is the most common type for bladder cancer, you still want to do cystoscopy with biopsy. And then a CT, as always, to make sure 
uh, to see if there's any metastasize, same with, uh, metastasis, same with the chest x-ray. Treatment is that you want to do chemo or immunotherapy. Uh, surgical treatment also. You can do radiation. Uh, <clears throat> and let's move on to the next one, so, testicular carcinoma. So testicular carcinoma has a high curative rate. Okay? Uh, some of the causes of testicular carcinoma is cryptocortism. So that's why you want to make sure that you get this fixed in newborns or younger children, because if not, then they have a higher chance of getting testicular carcinoma. The most common type is germ cell tumors, so it's 95%, with seminoma being the most common one. So you, another thing that you want to know is that non-germ cell tumors, like Leydig tumors, the Tully cell tumors, these are more radio resistant and they're more often to spread via bloodstream. Okay? So you have your germ cell tumors, like I stated, with seminoma, seminoma being the most common, and then your non-germ cell tumors that are like latex uh, cell tumors or Tully cell tumors, and these are more, they're more bad, they're more often to uh, spread. So signs and symptoms, you're gonna have painless enlargement, uh, testicular discomfort, swelling, heaviness, testicular pain. The patient will also be complaining of back pain. They might have some gynecomastia because some of these tumors cause uh, increased uh, ACG, which will cause that gynecomastia, which is breast, abnormal breast sizes in men. They'll have discrete testicular masses, secondary hydrocele's, and they also may have some um, supraclavicular lymph nodes, enlarged lymph nodes. And this usually tells you that the disease has metastasized. They also can have an abdominal mass, but with these patients, usually they'll have a, a painless enlargement on the testicle. So diagnosis, you want to do a testicular ultrasound, uh, you want to do some serum, mark serum markers, like you want to look at their beta HCG, alpha fetoprotein, lactate dehydrogenase. This will kind of help you also to see what type of cancer it is or give you a better hint. You can also do a CBC, LFT. What is the treatment? You want to do an orchiectomy, okay? So basically you want to remove the testicles. After surgery, you want to do a chest x-ray or a CT scan if needed to see if there's any lymph node metastasis and then chemotherapy or radiation therapy. So staging, stage one, the lesion is confined to the testes. Stage two, lymph node involvement in retroperitoneum. Stage three, there's distant metastasis. And then post-op, uh, you want to do surveillance every two to six months for the first two years, and then after that, every four to six months in the, in the third year. Okay? And then also, guys, make sure that you also educate patients on how to do a proper testicular exam, and to also do it monthly, okay? Just as females do their uh, breast exams, men have to do the same thing with their testicles. Make sure that they're not feeling any abnormal lumps or that weren't there. Orthostatic hypotension is the next one. So this is a drop in blood. So basically, you'll have a change of 20 <clears throat> in your systolic blood pressure and then a change in 10 on your diastolic blood pressure. So some of the causes of this is a patient that's usually older, if they have chronic kidney disease, uh, certain medications that they're on, like beta blockers, um, whether they have diabetes mellitus, whether hypovolemic because they're taking uh, diuretics, if they're hyperglycemic, if they're vomiting, if they're dehydrated. Signs and symptoms, the patient is usually going to be dizzy, lightheaded on changing their posture, okay? Nausea and vomiting, headaches, syncope. You diagnose this with the orthostatic vitals. And treatment is usually IV fluids, it's supportive, or you tell them, you educate them if they're taking certain medications, like some of the alpha receptor blockers, like the cerazosin and all those, tell them to stand up carefully, or to whenever they're moving postures, to do it carefully and not abrupt, because that can cause them to have orthostatic hypotension. If it's a certain medication that they're taking that they don't want to take anymore, then you can remove it. Tell them to eat small meals, standing, cross their legs, compression stockings, and to remain hydrated. So now we're going to go into hematology. I love hematology. So iron deficiency is the most common type of anemia. Like I said earlier, in older patients, if a patient presents with iron deficiency anemia, you want to make sure that you do a workup for colon cancer. So iron deficiency anemia is a type of microcytic anemia. So remember, we have our MCVs, right, levels. Uh, usually, if it's less... <clears throat> then 80, it's abnormal, it's usually microcytic. If it's greater than 100, it's macrocytic, okay? 80 to 100 tends to be normal. So for 
the causes, the most common causes of iron deficiency are, is that it's usually found in children, sometimes because they just don't have good diets in children, if the patient is pregnant, if they're menstruating right, if they're losing a lot of blood, if they're vegan, okay, if they have an eating disorder, they have celiac dis diseases, bariatric surgery, like we discussed earlier, and then of course colorectal cancer. Some of the signs and symptoms, the patient's going to present with fatigue, pallor, tachycardia, palpitations, dyspnea. They'll have gl glossitis on their tongue, brittle spooning of the nails, so basically they'll be like really large. Um, and pica. So pica is basically the patient's going to have desire of eating like dirt. Um, I had a child that came in once and she had pica and I looked at her, her MCV and it was like 78, 76 and I'm like, eh. And the doctor came in and he got mad at me. He's like, she has pica. That's an iron deficiency anemia. The patient on labs, so they're going to be microcytic, uh, less than 80 for the MCV. Uh, they'll have low hemoglobin, hemoglobin, low serum iron, low reticulocytes, low ferritin, but they're going to have high total iron binding capacity, right? Because that iron binding capacity is there. It's waiting to bind with someone, but you have such low iron that it's not able to bind with anyone. So everything's going to be low except for the, the total iron binding capacity, or TIBC, it's going to be increased, okay? So treatment for this is going to be ferrous sulfate, sulfate, so you're going to give them iron. Oral is best than IV, okay? I had questions where I asked you, and you're like, this patient has iron deficiency, and then they had oral and IV, and I always went through for IV. No, oral is way better than IV iron, okay? And then you want to educate the patient on increasing their dietary iron. Okay, guys, so we have the thalassemias. We have the alpha and the beta thalassemia. So usually with the thalassemias, these are also microcytic. It's going to be extremely microcytic. So it'll be their, their MCV is going to be really, really low. Sometimes in the 60s, 50s, 70s, they're going to be really, really low, okay? And there's different types. So you have your alpha and beta. Basically, if it's alpha, it means that it's missing the alpha chains. If it's beta, it means it's missing the beta chains. So you have four alpha chains and you have two beta chains. So on alpha, you have excess beta chains, right? And then on beta, you have excess alpha chains. Beta, alpha uh, thalassemia is more commonly an Asian, so that's how I memorized it, A for Asians. And then beta thalassemia is more common in Mediterranean individuals. So the patient's going to present with dyspnea, jaundice, pallor, uh, they'll have microcytic anemia, so like I said, less than 80. Teardrop cell, okay? And treatment for this is going to be folic acid, blood transfusions for type A, bone marrow transplant, and then for type B, iron transfusion, splenectomy, or genetic counseling. Okay, guys, so next one's going to be aplastic anemia. This is a very rare disease. Um, <clears throat> how I memorize these, guys, is that basically anything that's microcytic and macrocytic it's due to production. So they're having trouble producing versus anything that's normocytic is destruction, okay? So that's how I got them because um, I always was very confused with normocytic anemia, which is usually your MCV is normal, right? But normocytic anemia is due to destruction. Micro and macro is due to production. So they're having trouble producing red blood cells. Usually it's because of um, a genetic cause or whether it's because they're deficient in some type of nutrient, like for example, macrocytic, you have your folate, your vitamin B12, and then micro, you have your iron deficiency anemia. And for aplastic anemia, basically for this will be a normocytic anemia. So this is a problem with destruction, right? Like I said, basically it's due to damaged bone marrow and stem cells, and it's pancytopenia. So this is something you have to know with aplastic anemia, it's pancytopenia. So you have decreased everything. You have a deficiency in red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, everything. That's why it's called pancytopenia. Decreased reticulocytes, everything. So the cause, it's the inability of stem cells to generate mature blood. Some other causes can be parvovirus B19, Epstein-Barr virus, hepatitis, HIV, radiation, some medication that the patient's going to be taking. And so on a CBC, you'll see pancytopenia. You'll see decreased reticulocytes and you'll see an increased EPO, okay? Because the, the body's trying to compensate by creating more red blood cells because they're getting destroyed. And the diagnostic is that you can also do a bone marrow biopsy, and what you'll see is that you'll see an empty fatty marrow or dry tap. 
the treatment, the definitive treatment is a hematopoietic uh, cell, tra cell transplantation. So then we have hemolytic anemia. So hemolytic anemia, once again, is also similar to aphasic anemia. It's due to destruction of red blood cells by autoantibodies or red blood cell surfaces. So it's autoimmune. You have both warm or cold. Warm is usually idiopathic and cold is due to infections. The onset is usually insidious or acute. The patient will have pallor, fatigue, activity intolerance, jaundice. They'll have severe cardiac symptoms like tachycardia, bounding pulses. Diagnosis, you'll see an increased lactate dehydrogenase, increased indirect bilirubin, right? Because all those blood cells are being destroyed. They're releasing their bilirubin. For warm, though, you're going to see a positive IgG. And then for cold, you're going to see a positive IgM. So this is how you differentiate both of them when it comes down to diagnosis. And then on peripheral smear, you're going to see spherocytes, okay? Treatment is corticosteroids, right? Because this is something that's uh, associated with your immune system that's attacking itself. You, go, you can also do something like monoclonal antibodies, like rituximab, immunosuppressants. And then the definitive treatment is going to be splenectomy. So say that you've tried corticosteroids and all these treatments and this patient is still becoming anemic, then you would do a splenectomy. So now we're going to go into sickle cell anemia. This is a genetic point mutation of beta globin gene HBS. Okay? Basically, the cell is not shaped normally. It's abnormal or sickle shaped. And it has a decreased red blood lifespan because it, it becomes hemolyzed. It's most commonly found in African Americans. Okay? It's not very common here in the US, but if you have immigrants that come from um, South Africa, then, you, then in these patients it's very common more common in males, and these patients tend to have an increased risk of infection. And the reason why is because most of these patients, when they present with you, uh, they don't have a spleen. They basically have had autosplenectomy. Basically, that means is that these cells have sickled, and they've gotten stuck, and they've caused decreased blood flow to the spleen, causing the spleen to die. So that's why it's called autosplenectomy, is that basically their spleen autoinfarcts because of they're sickle cells. This uh, disease tends to be autosomal recessive, and that's why, like I said, these patients are more at increased risk of infection because the spleen is responsible for fighting infections off, right? If you don't have a spleen, then how are you going to fight off infections? So this is why for these patients that have sickle cell anemia, it requires a lot of treatment and following up and making sure that they have their vaccinations, like their normal cockle vaccinations, um, their flu vaccinations because these patients are more prone to getting infections. Some of the signs and symptoms, it's going to be fatigue, they'll have delayed growth, activity intolerance, uh, joint pain, fever, jaundice, um, splenomegaly, if they have spleen still, hepatomegaly. Diagnosis, you're going to do a peripheral smear, okay, and that's where you'll see the sickled cells, target cells. The patient can also be hypoxemic, acidotic, They'll have decreased red blood cells, reticulocytosis, but the definitive diagnosis is going to be electrophoresis. Treatment's going to be with oxygen, fluids, pain control. You want to give them folic acid, right, because they're losing a lot of blood cells. Iron, antibiotics, penicillin for infection. Sometimes on these patients, they are on antibiotic prophylaxis. Uh, red blood cell transfusions if it's severe. And like I said, also immunizations. And with these patients, they have... I mean, I can make an entire YouTube video on sickle cell anemia because they have so many things that happen to them, acute chest syndrome. Basically, with those cells, they're so malformed that they don't fit when they're going through the, the vessels. So it's easier for them to clot, and that's why some of these patients have all these symptoms. Next one's going to be G6PD anemia. It's X-linked. Um, Basically, there's a lack of protection for the red blood cells, and red blood cell damage occurs. It's more commonly found in African-American males. Basically, on diagnosis, you'll see bite cells, Heinz bodies. They'll have a high reticular count, high bilirubin. So, once again, bite cells, guys, okay? This is high yields. You'll see Heinz bodies, high reticulocytes. Signs and symptoms, they tend to be asymptomatic. They might have some abdominal pain, dark urine, jaundice splenomegaly. Treatment is usually with iron supplements. Vitamin B12 deficiency. This is a, a macrocytic anemia, right? So this is going to be, their MCV is going to be greater than 100, 100. Very commonly found in patients that are vegans or also patients that have pernicious anemia, which is something that's autoimmune. 
How is the patient going to present? So typical symptoms of anemia, they'll have pallor, colitis, anorexia, diarrhea, prestigias, ataxia, weakness, neurological symptoms. This is what differentiates it from folic acid deficiency is that in vitamin B12 deficiency, they have neurological symptoms. And I actually had vitamin B12 deficiency. Um, I started having a lot of paresthesias, like tingling and numb uh, numbness in my extremities. I also had trouble walking, and I ended up having vitamin B12 deficiency. You're going to diagnose this. Um, you'll see their low B12 levels. Like I said, this is megaloblastic anemia. For pernicious anemia, this is autoimmune. So anything that's autoimmune, you tend to do a chilling test also. Treatment is going to be intramuscular vitamin B12 monthly, or you can do also oral uh, cyanocobalamin or hydroxy, uh, hydroxycobalamin. And then we have folic acid deficiency anemia. This is, once again, also macrocytic anemia. Very common in alcoholics, patients that are pregnant. This will not have any neurosymptoms, okay? Treatment is going to be with folic acid. And then we have the hemophilia. So hemophilia A, hemophilia B. Uh, also known as that they love to bleed, okay? This is, these are usually uh, platelet disorders, so they have a deficiency in coagulation factor 8. This is hemophilia A. Hemophilia B has a deficiency in coagulation factor 9. It's also known as Christmas disease. So hemophilia A and B are both X-linked, and they're both most commonly found in men. Uh, some of other causes are liver failure, right, because the liver is responsible for creating those uh, platelets. Um, vitamin K deficiency also, if they have DIC, so disseminated intravascular coagulation. Some of the signs and symptoms for the hemophilia is that they'll have easy bruising, ecchymosis, hematomas, that's huge, hemarthrosis, that's usually unique for hemophilia. If you have a patient that has recurrent he uh, hemarthrosis, think about hemophilia. Hematuria, GI bleeding, prolonged bleeding. Diagnosis is that you're going to do a platelet count for the hemophilias. Their platelet count tends to be normal. And then their PT, which is the extrinsic and common pathway, is also normal. But the PTT, their intrinsic and common pathways are prolonged. So they're abnormal, right? Because factor eight and nine are responsible, which are part of the intrinsic pathway. How I memorize this guy is that, guys, is that PT, I memorize is playing tennis outside. So it's extrinsic versus PTT, playing table tennis inside is intrinsic. So you're going to confirm this, for example, for hemophilia A, you're going to test for the specific factor. So hemophilia A, factor 8 is involved, so you're going to test for factor 8. Treatment for hemophilia A is going to be by supplementing the factor that's missing, right? So you can give a cryoprecipitate or desmopressin for hemophilia A. You want to tell the patient to avoid contact sports and give them medication or Avoid any medications that promote bleeding, like aspirin. And then for hemophilia B, you want to confirm for the, your diagnosis. You want to test for the specific uh, factor 9. And treatment is going to be supplemental injection of the missing factor, so factor 9. And same thing, you want to tell the patient to avoid contact sports or medications like aspirin that um, increase bleeding. So now we're gonna go with a von Willebaum disease. This is actually one of the most common platelet disorders, guys, to make sure you know this. This is usually a deficiency of von Willebaum factor eight, uh, von, Will von, von Willebaum factor or factor eight. Some of the causes is liver failure, vitamin K deficiency, um, DIC. It's the most common congenital bleeding disorder, like I said, and this one has also a very high um, family. So if usually you'll get, you'll get a question, it'll say you have a patient that is coming in and they're bleeding and they, their mother had this. So uh, you would think about von Willebrand disease. Signs and symptoms, it's gonna be mucocutaneous bleeding, uh, epistaxis, which is like bleeding from the nose, gingival bleeding, cutaneous bruising and ecchymosis, menorrhagia, hemorthrosis. Um, health maintenance is basically the same thing as hemophilia, you wanna tell them to avoid aspirin. Diagnosis, you're gonna do a platelet count, a PT and a PTT. You wanna do a von Willebrand fracture antigen. And treatment's going to be with desmopressin or von Willebrand factor concentrate, right? Because what factor is also involved? Factor 8. So basically, um, this is why you would give them also desmopressin. DIC. So disseminated intravascular coagulation is basically a widespread clotting that depletes all your clotting factors. So the patient bleeds out. This is an emergency. Some of the um, signs and symptoms is shocking. 
They have shock, sudden occurrence of bleeding, petechiae, ecchymosis, peripheral gangrene, thrombosis. On diagnosis, you're going to see decreased platelets, right, because they've depleted all their platelets. And fibrinogen, prolonged PT and PTT, and they're going to have an increased uh, D-dimer because the body's trying to compensate for all that bleeding. This is an emergency. So the first treatment, line treatment, is that you want to treat whatever is causing the DIC. You want to support the organs, um, and you also want to make sure you're giving transfusions. So now we're going to go into pulmonology, in this, and we're going to talk about bronchogenic lung carcinoma. So you have two types. You have small cell lung cancer. You have non-small lung cancer. The risk factors, the most common cause for lung disease is going to be smoking. Some other causes are secondhand smoke, asbestos, COPD. Signs and symptoms, the patients may be complaining of anorexia, weight loss, night sweats, generalized weakness, cough, dyspnea, hemoptysis, chest pain, and recurrent pneumonia. <coughs> so diagnostic tools, chest x-ray is the most important one for diagnosis. Usually you'll see a coin lesion. Uh, also CT with contracts, this is used for staging. So first off, you want to start with a chest x-ray, it's non-invasive. You can also do a sputum culture, fiber optic, bronchoscope, uh, PET scan. But um, the best one for diagnosis, it's going to be a needle biopsy, right? So going into the different types, we have small cell cancer. It's not as common as non-small cell cancer. So sm small cell cancer, this one's really bad. It's, uh, it spreads fast, and it's not really cured with resection. Uh, it's very aggressive and it has a median survival, if untreated, of 16 to, 6 to 18 weeks. And it's centrally located. So when you see an x-ray and you see a nodule that's centrally located, think about small cell carcinoma. How I memorize it is, as, I mean, small cell central, they sound S-C, as small central, that's how I memorize it. So small cell, it's most common in females with a long history of smoking. Uh, staging is limited since it tends to be confined to the chest and then extensive outside of the chest. And treatment, if it's limited, chemo and radiation. If it's extensive, chemo initially, and then you want to do prophylactic radiation. And then surgery, um, if it's limited. Now let's go into non-small cancer. So this one's the most common one. It's 85% of the lung cancers. These spread very slowly. They can be cured with resection. And diagnosis is usually done by CT scan. So squamous cell carcinoma, anything that started with an S, it's going to be central, centrally located. So squamous cell carcinoma is centrally located. It's found in smokers, and it produces keratin. Adenocarcinoma, that's the most common one, actually, is peripherally located. So adenocarcinoma doesn't start with an Oh, it doesn't sound like an S. So it's going to be peripherally located. And... These have actually a low association with smoking. So if you're a patient that doesn't smoke and you think about maybe that might be cancer, think about endocarcinoma since it's the most common cancer just in overall. And then you have large cell, which is usually peripheral lesion, but it can present also in the proximal tissue, but it's not very common. So diagnosis, uh, you want to stage it. You want to stage it via the TNM, which is a tumor size, lymph node, involvement, metastasis system. And then treatment is surgery. It's the best option. Um, metastasis, usually patients are candidates if it's metastasis. And if it's advanced, um, chemo radiation. So let's go on to pleural effusion. So it's increased fluid, fluid drainage in the pleural space. So you have increased production of fluid by cells in space or decreased drainage of fluid. The most common cause is congestive heart failure for pleural effusions. Um, also, you have bacterial pneumonia, malignancies, but the most common cause is congestive heart failure. So you have two types. You have transudative and exudative. Make sure you know the differences between them, okay, because you have a, definitely have a question on this. If it's not on this exam, you have it on a future EOR. So for transudative, the most common causes are congestive heart failure, cirrhosis, pulmonary embolism, nephrotic syndrome, peritoneal dialysis, hypoalbuminemia, and atelectasis. But in general, just know that congestive heart failure is the most common one for transudative. For exudative, it's usually something that's uh, associated with an infection or a malignancy, okay? Versus transudative, it's not. So exudative, you'll have bacterial pneumonia, tuberculosis, a malignancy, a viral infection, 
pulmonary embolism, or even collagen vascular diseases. Signs and symptoms, they tend to be uh, asymptomatic, but if they do present with symptoms, they can have dyspnea on exertion, peripheral edema or thopnea, dullness to percussion, decreased breath sounds, decreased tactile fremitus. Make sure you know this. This is how you can differentiate it from something else. Diagnosis, you want to do a chest x-ray. Uh, lateral decubitus films are the best ones. You can also do a CT scan. Also, you want to do a thoracentesis. This is diagnostic, diagnostic as well as therapeutic. So it not only diagnoses and tells you what type of effusion they have, but it also treats it patient. And you also want to know about LIGHTS criteria. So LIGHTS criteria is really important, okay? So transudative, the fluid's usually going to be clear or straw-colored fluid, and this does not meet the LIGHTS criteria. Versus exudative, it's going to be cloudy fluid, more yucky, they have immune cells, they have a lot of uh, protein, and it needs one um, <clears throat> of the LIGHTS criteria. These patients also tend to have a high protein, high lactate dehydrogenase. And treatment for transudative is diuretics and sodium restriction, uh, therapeutic thoracentesis, and for exudative, it's thoracentesis, and you want to treat the underlying disease. So if it's a pneumonia, you want to treat the pneumonia. If it's the cancer, you want to make sure you treat the cancer. So now we're going to go on to pneumothorax, okay? So pneumothorax is basically air in an normally airless pleural space that is basically pushing against the lungs. So normal thorax, the most common cause is spontaneous rupture of blebs. So you have your primary causes, um, which is idiopathic. Normal thorax is uh, spontaneous normal thorax is tend to be found in like tall, lean, young males. So you have a, a patient that's going to be skinny and they're tall and they're, they're a male and they're complaining of trouble have breathing and just like acute onset of chest pain. Some of the secondary causes are like lung diseases like COPD, asthma, cystic fibrosis, tuberculosis, and this can actually be life-threatening. So signs and symptoms are going to have ipsilateral, so one-sided chest pain. Uh, it's going to be sudden onset, like I said, they'll have trouble breathing, cough, decreased breath sounds on one side. They'll have hyper resonance, right, because you have increased fluid in that area where, I'm sorry, increased air in that area where you're not supposed to have air. And then they'll have a decreased or absent tactile from it is, right? Diagnosis is going to be a chest x-ray. You'll see my mediastinal shift towards uh, the side of the pneumothorax. And treatment's going to be asymptomatic. If they're asymptomatic, it's just uh, observation. You can do also chest tube. Um, if they're symptomatic, you can give them oxygen and needle aspiration and a chest tube if needed. So tension pneumothorax. So this is a cu accumulation of air in the lungs. Basically, it allows air in but not out, so the lung is trapped. So you have increased pressure. This is going to cause the lung to collapse, and the mediastinum shifts. So on the x-ray, in order for you to differentiate between spontaneous and tension pneumothorax, is that you look at the trachea. If it's towards the affected side, then it's going to be uh, spontaneous. If it's away from the affected side, then it's going to be uh, tension pneumothorax. So some of the causes for tension pneumothorax is like a gunshot wound, trauma, CPR, mechanical ventilation. This is a medical emergency, so you have to act quick with this one. Signs and symptoms, hypotension, JVD, like I said, shift of trachea away from the affected lung. They'll have decreased breath sounds and hyperresonance on the area. Uh, Diagnosis is done by clinical findings. You do not get a chest x-ray if a tension pneumothorax is suspected. What you do first is basically decompress the pleural space before uh, using a large, <clears throat> uh, before doing a chest tube placement. So you're gonna decompress the pleural space with a large bore needle. Where would you put it? In the second intercostal space, right? And then you can do the chest tube placement. So now we're gonna go with uh, bacterial pneumonia. Uh, bacterial pneumonia. So you have your typical typical community acquired pneumonia, which is usually an infection of the lung due to microbes. It brings water into the lungs and it makes it difficult to breathe. The most common causes and the most common cause of pneumonia is in typical, it's going to be strep pneumonia and staph aureus. Okay, but strep pneumonia, pneumonia is the most common cause of uh, typical community acquired pneumonia. For neonates, it's going to be group B strep, and then for elderly, elderly, you want to think about Legionella. Klebsiella, it's going to be that current jelly sputum, right? It's going to be found in alcoholics, 
um, <clears throat> Legionella patients that had an organ transplant, AC exposure, or even individuals that are like the hot water tubs. Mycoplasma, this one is uh, atypical. It's usually found in college students and teens. Risk factors for bacterial pneumonia is smoking, fluid in the lungs, splenectomy, immune status if the patient is older than 60 and if they drink alcohol, right? Signs and symptoms is going to be dyspnea, so they have trouble breathing, shortness of breath, chest pain, a productive cough. They'll feel tired, they'll have fever, chills, tachycardia, tachypnea, dullness to percussion, they'll have increased tactile affirmatives, late inspiratory breast sounds, rails and ronchi, bronchial breast sounds. And then for diagnosis on the chest x-ray, that's what you're going to do, you're going to do chest x-ray first, you'll see patchy areas throughout or fluid localized to a single lobe, depending on which type of pneumonia it is. So if it's strep pneumonia, then you'll see consolidation. You also see leukocytosis. Um, so you also want to do a sputum culture to see what type of pneumonia it is. So just a little pearls here. For mycoplasma, you'll see cold a gluten assay, and you treat this with a macrolide. For Legionella, you do a urine antigen, and you treat with a doxycycline or macrolide. And then treatment tends to depend on how severe the patient is, whether they are hospitalized or not, and also on the type of pneumonia that they have. But generally, you're going to give them antibiotics, right, because it's a bacterial infection. If you suspect that the patient is having trouble breathing, they're having respiratory compromise, or they're becoming septic, you do also the CURB-65, then you're going to admit them, right? So CURB-65, which is a confusion, or uremia, right, the R is a respiratory, um, their respiratory, and blood pressure, and if they're older than 65, and if they have usually, I think it's more than two than these, then you would admit the patient. Emergency, usually you'll give them oxygen and fluid resuscitation. And outpatient therapy is usually a macrolide, like I said, azithromycin or clarithromycin or fluoroquinolone, moxifloxacin or levofloxacin. Inpatient therapy is usually with a ceftrioxane because sometimes you want to make sure that you want to rule out MRSA as a cause for it, right? Uh, and macrolides like azithromycin or fluoroquinolones. And then if it's a pseudomonal coverage, then you want to give them piperacillin or tazobactam. Next one, guys, is going to be tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is a bacterial disease that affects the lungs. The most common pathogen is mycobacterium tuberculosis, and it's transmitted by respiratory droplets. It's an infectious disease. Usually you'll find this in immigrants, patients that are IV drug users, or patients that were in contact with tuberculosis patients, patients that are in prison, alcoholics, homeless shelters. Signs and symptoms, it's going to be a chronic productive cough hemoptysis, so blood whenever they're coughing, fever, fatigue, night sweats, and weight loss. Okay? So your diagnosis, you want to start with a PPEDE. If it's positive, then you want to send for a chest x-ray and see if there's any cavitation. Usually it's going to be apical. And then you want to do a sputum culture. So all patients that are positive will get a chest x-ray and then a sputum stain. And then also make sure that you know on how to read a PPD. So if it's greater than five millimeters, who is it going to be positive? It's going to be positive for patients that have HIV, that were in recent contact with somebody with tuberculosis, organ transplant, or if they're immunosuppressed. Now, if it is greater than 10 millimeters, this is going to be for immigrants, IV drug users, people that work in healthcare, and children under four. And this is considered positive. It's greater than 10 millimeters in these, in these individuals. And then greater than 50 millimeters is just any individual that has no, no risk factors. Treatment's going to be your Rife therapy, right? So it's going to be your Fempin, your Asinizide, um, your Pyrazinamide, and then your Ethambutyl. And this is usually going to be for six months, and you want to supplement also with uh, vitamin B6 because some of these medications cause adverse effects, so they can decrease that. And you want to make sure that you report it to local and state agencies and you repeat chest x-ray and speed them to test to confirm the treatment. So now we're done with that. Our last one's going to be OBGYN, my favorite. So let's start with fibrocystic disease. So fibrocystic disease is a benign lesion of the breast, okay? It's basically a uh, patient will be complaining of cyclical breast pain, and it affects a lot of women. It's very common. Causes are due to hormonal imbalances, proliferation of normal breast tissue with estrogen, stimulating ductal elements, and progesterone stimulating stroma. Lesions are associated with benign changes in the breast epithelium. 
Signs and symptoms, patient will be complaining of breast tenderness, pain, swelling. Uh, they might have some nipple discharge, but it's non-bloody. They also have discomfort that is usually increased, so they have breast pain that is increased before they get their period. And they might have uh, fluctuations in size and appearance and disappearance of the mass. Um, bilateral breast findings will show multiple mobile masses. That's how you differentiate this between a breast fibroadenoma is a fibrocystic disease is that you have multiple little masses. Treatment basically is just usually supportive. You tell them to avoid uh, caffeine, uh, low fat diet, um, support garments, uh, compresses. Um, symptoms usually tend to go after away after menopause, which makes sense, right? Because this is usually due to hormonal imbalances and surgery is not needed. But for diagnosis, you can do an ultrasound, and you do an ultrasound if it's a woman less than 30 years old, okay? If they're older than 30, then you do a mammogram, okay? And why do you do that? It's because in women that are older than uh, 30, they have more breast tissue, so that's why you do a mammogram. And then you want to confirm that these lumps are benign, then you can do a fine needle aspiration biopsy, but usually these are benign. So you can start with an ultrasound if you believe, so, if you think you um, it is something severe. But usually treatment, no surgery is usually needed. I mean, if you needed to treat it, you can start with oral contraceptives and this will help regulate their um, hormones, which is the number one cause for fibrocystic disease. You can also give them something like bromocryptine, uh, danazole, GN GNRH agonist. If they have mild mastalgia, then you can do NSAIDs. If they have severe mastalgia, then you can do tamoxifen. I know I had a patient that she was young and she wanted she demanded a bilateral mastectomy, so she wanted both of her breasts removed because she suffered from this and it was extremely painful for her and she had recurrent bouts of this and it was just so painful. So we ended up doing a bilateral mastectomy on her. Next one's gonna be a breast fibroadenoma. It's a benign breast tumor. It's slow growing and it's related also to hormones. So the size, is, the size of this tends to be one to five centimeters smaller and it's usually a single one versus fibrocystic disease it's multiple ones it's common in younger women so ages 15 to 35 it can increase in size during pregnancy or with estrogen so risk factors for this are oral contraceptive use or pregnancy usually on exam you'll find a solitary round smooth firm rubbery mobile well circumscribed right because anything that's abnormal is considered cancer non-tender mass Usually unilateral, but sometimes can be bilateral. Diagnosis is you're going to do an ultrasound uh, if they're less than 30. Once again, mammogram if they're greater than 30. And then fine needle aspiration if you think you need to do so. Definitive is going to be a core needle biopsy or excision if the patient's older than 30 and they have a strong family history of breast cancer. But treatment is usually observation. You want to repeat ultrasound with uh, every three to six months just to make sure it's not anything malignant. Breast cancer. So breast cancer is the second most common related death in women behind lung cancer. Okay. It's usually due to an uncontrolled growth of epithelial cells in breast. And um, it's based on hormone receptors. So the type can either be sometimes ER positive, or ER negative, HER2 positive, HER2 negative. Depending on what it is, is how you treat it. So we have different types. We have ductal carcinoma in situ. Uh, these are tumor cells from wall of duct into lumen. They cause uh, microcalcifications that are common on your mammograms that you'll see. You also have Paget's disease, which is Paget's disease, which is extension of of ductal carcel carcinoma in situ. You'll have some eczematous patches on the nipple, so you'll see patches around the nipple, and it'll be positive for Paget cells when you, whenever you do a histology. And then you have lobular carcinoma in situ, which is tumor cells that grow within lobules. It does not invade surrounding tissues, and it's often bilateral. And then you have the worst one, which is the invasive infiltrating ductal carcinoma. I mean, the, the name already tells you it's really bad, right? Invasive infiltrating ductal carcinoma. It's the worst, and it's the most invasive one. So risk factors for, bra uh, for breast cancer, you got BRCA1 and 2, if they have a family history, specifically if it's someone close to them, like their mother, that had breast cancer, if they're older than 70, if they've never breastfed, okay? if they are on oral contraceptive use, if they are any type of hormonal replacement therapy, if they have radiation, if they have chronic disease like hypertension, diabetes mellitus, stress, smoking, 
increased estrogen exposure like obesity, uh, nulliparity, early menarche, a late menopause, or if they had a late first pregnancy. What are some of the protective factors? Make sure you know this because it's going to ask you for both the risk factors and the protective factors. Some of the protective factors are breastfeeding, if they've had multiple children, exercise, postmenopausal BMI is less than 23, oophorectomy at less than 35, and then aspirin. Signs and symptoms is they're going to have a firm, immobile, painless breast lump or thickening. They'll have nipple discharge, bleeding, change in color or appearance of the areola, redness, pure the orange, which is basically, it's French, but if you look at a, uh, for example, oh, actually I'm over here. If you look at an orange, well, this is actually a Mandarin, you see how there's like dimpling, if you can see it. So that's what it means by pure the orange is that on the breast you'll see a dimpling and that's usually abnormal. Um, other things that you can see is um, axillary lymphadenopathy, right? Because you have the tail of Spence right here which is close to your lymph nodes. You can also see retraction of the nipple. That's a very common sign, usually if it's unilateral. So anything that's unilateral, it, it, can, it means cancer. Um, you can also have, a, but most of the cancer is most commonly located in the upper quadrant. So diagnosis, you're gonna do a breast exam, you're gonna do a mammogram. Um, and this is for, for following up with these patients. You wanna make sure that mammograms, you start at age 40. Um, 35 if they're at high risk, if they had a family member that was close to them that had breast cancer. All, you're, you can also do an ultrasound or an MRI, and you confirm with a fine needle aspiration or biopsy of the mass. Labs, you want to do serum calcium, alkaline phosphatase, estrogen and progesterone receptors, and treatment, um, partial mastectomy. So you want to make sure that you conserve, conserve the most that you can of the breast, right? Because as a woman, you know, um, one gets really upset whenever they get the breast removed. So you wanna make sure that you try to save the breast as much as you can. So if you can do a partial mastectomy, do a partial mastectomy. If you can't, then do a radical mastectomy. Other treatments include radiation, chemotherapy, if it's metastasized, hormonal therapy, if some of these um, cancers are responsive to hormonal therapy, because some of them aren't. So you can do something like tamoxifen. And that's it guys, I know it's a lot. Um, I went over like 20 pages and I still didn't go into more detail because I felt like I would have gone over. It's been already a while and if you can tell I'm already losing my voice for speaking too much. So hopefully this video was helpful for you guys. Um, and like I said, listen to this if you can, like if you're cooking, um, if you're working out. Sometimes when I was driving or I had long drives, I would just leave it and leave it on play so I can just hear and listen to it. And hopefully it helps you guys out with your EOR. Um, if I had any mistakes, feel free to comment below and correct me on them. Also, if you have any cool like mnemonics that you know that you can teach us that helped you memorize or learn certain things, make sure you comment below so you can share it with most of us. All right, guys, thanks for watching my videos, and I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.